Mark Jensen, 2002 CF 314. The appearances are the same from yesterday. The, all the jurors are not here because I told them to come back at 8.30 and I wanted to discuss this issue of the excited utterance before they got here. Unfortunately, they can't bring the defendant over until all the jury's here. So do you want to discuss this issue without the defendant here or do you want to wait for Mr. Jensen to be here? to wait for him all right then we Thank will you. wait so I should have told the jury to be here at 8 15 and then <laughs> well I know place else to be anyway so I'm okay with being here
On the record, um, Mark Jensen, 2002 CF 314. Let's have the appearances, please. Um, Good morning, Your Honor. The State of Wisconsin appears by Special Prosecutor Robert Jamboys, Deputy District Attorney Carly McNeil, and Public Service Special Prosecutor Beverly Jamboys. Attorneys Bridget Krause, Jeremy Perry, and Mackenzie Renner appear on behalf of Mr. Mark Jensen, who appears in person. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. All right. The uh, record to reflect the jury is not in the courtroom. We had an issue uh, come up yesterday as to uh, testimony, and for the record, that is witness 65 on the state's exhibit witness list, that is uh, Eric Shore. It is an issue of uh, excited utterance. Uh, it came up also during the testimony of Teresa DeFazio, and I, I, I reviewed my notes, and the problem I had with Ruling on the excited utterance, I know it's not a mechanical um, requirement where we, the, um, the state has to show all three of the uh, elements or the factors, but the problem I had, I, I, I've got my notes, and um, after I had a ruling that I wasn't going to allow it, the, the witness said that David was a little upset and was a little worried. So that's why I kind of backtracked. I didn't think that's what she was going to say. Now, we have another witness. Uh, again, that's Eric Shore. And before we left yesterday, Mr. Jamboys had indicated that uh, this is the, uh, the friend of David, and you had mentioned um, something about a, uh, a statement of, of um, Julie Jensen not being able to breathe, and you actually did some sort of coughing or something. Yes. Now, if that's an offer of proof, that kind of changes my decision here, because that's a total different description of the health of Julie Jensen, and that might fit an excited utterance. Now, the other thing I'm going to mention, obviously, Mr. Fazio testified about it, and the jury heard it, but I, you know, I, I, I said, no, now we're going to strike that answer. So, um, and then for the record, I did read both of the cases that the uh, parties presented to me. Um, first of all, from the state, State versus Mercado, 395, Wisconsin 2nd, 296. That is a Supreme Court decision. It's rather recent. Uh, the defense had given me uh, State versus Gerald L.C. in 1994, Wisconsin 2nd, 548. That's a court of appeals decision. It talks about excited utterances. It talks about what I have to look at for an excited utterance. And it also talks about the residual hearsay exception. But the only question I have this morning, um, and, and I'll ask the defense first, if... I allow it in, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that it's happened, but once I hear the testimony and I allow it in under excited utterance, um, I don't have to worry about the residual hearsay uh, portion, correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's one or the other. Are you telling me I have to do both analysis? No, I said I think it's one or the other. Yeah, think, that's yeah. what I figured. Is that correct understanding from the state? Well, there are alternative uh, alternative theories, Your Honor. So right. if, if it comes in as an excited utterance, you can disregard the uh, the residual hearsay exception. If it doesn't come in under excited utterance, then you consider the residual hearsay exception. Okay. So I'm going to see what the witness says. Judge, my concern about allowing a residual hearsay exception um, is, I mean, I understand that the court is going to wait to see if the witness is able to lay the groundwork for an excited utterance. Get that. Um, the residual hearsay exception is not a firmly rooted hearsay exception, so the there's a confrontation issue there. We have the right to confront the, uh, the, the declarant of that statement. The reality is that although David Jensen may have been eight at the time of the statement, just like the young man who's going to testify was eight at the time of the statement, he was not an adult. He was not a police officer. Um, this was not a recorded 
witness interview by a forensic interviewer. This is another eight-year-old. So when we're talking about whether we're going to allow a residual hearsay exception, we have to talk about confrontation. The reality is, is that the prosecution has David Jensen on their witness list. He could very easily be called, and if he doesn't agree that he said that, Eric Shore could be called as a prior inconsistent statement. So that's my concern, is that we're putting in hearsay when the declarant of that hearsay is actually on their list and should be called. He's an adult. He's not an eight-year-old child any longer. Well, like, when I, when, just, just one quick thing for the record, and then I'll let you talk, Mr. Jim. Based on what I was told yesterday by the state, and we're all, you know, I didn't ask for an offer of proof, but what Mr. Jamboy indicated on the record, it sounds like an excited utterance. And I might not have to deal with the residual hearsay. No, go ahead, Mr. Chief. Sir, Your Honor, I will say this. Part of the problem, you know, we're having these extempore extemporaneous discussions about evidence, uh, evidentiary issues. This is something that could have been raised in a pretrial motion. This testimony was admitted at the last trial as an excited utterance by Judge Schrader. And it was my understanding that if the defense is going to be challenging any of the previous evidentiary rulings by Judge Schrader, they're going to bring a pretrial motion on the issue. And we could have had then briefing on this subject. So let me just respond to defense counsel's argument about the confrontation clause. Let me be very clear. The confrontation clause has not one single thing to do with a conversation between two eight-year-old children. Um, the, a confrontation clause only applies to testimonial statements. There's no court that has ever ruled that a statement, that conversations between two eight-year-old children is ever going to constitute a testimonial statement. If you look at the, if you trace the history of the Confrontation Clause, Your Honor, as articulated by Justice Scalia in the Crawford decision, going back to Sir Walter Raleigh and going forward, it had nothing to do with conversations between children. What was, year was that Sir Walter Raleigh? Uh, well, I don't know, but it was based on the Marian Statutes, which were, dis, were, which were established in 1503 and 1508 during the, Queen, uh, during the reign of Queen Mary. And I believe Sir Walter Raleigh's trial was in the 16th century. And um, Lord Cobham's letter was used against Sir Walter Raleigh at his trial. And so this conversation between David Jensen and um, Eric Schuer on December 3rd, 1998, bears no resemblance whatsoever to Lord Cobham's letter in the trial of Sir Walter Raleigh. And uh, it bears no resemblance whatsoever to anything that's been deemed a testimonial statement by the, Wisconsin, by the United States or Wisconsin Supreme Court. Now, in terms of the issue of excited utterance, I could offer a further offer of proof, and that is the prior testimony from the last trial where um, at and is in, let me get you the page numbers, page six of the uh, transcript. Let me get you the transcript date. Um, this is January, uh, the January 28th, 2008 transcript, page six. Let me get to the right line here. Question, line 16, question, and what was David's demeanor as he talked to you about his mother's health? Answer, well, he was extremely concerned, and I could tell he was worried, and he was actually, he was usually a pretty happy kind of person, and was kind of a sudden shift in his attitude. And then the next question is, can you tell us what David told you about his mother's health? And then there was the objection on hearsay grounds. And there was extensive discussion, and again, the confrontation clause was raised at that point. But the Confrontation Clause has nothing whatsoever to do with a conversation between two eight-year-old children. And um, then we proceed to the point where Judge Schrader renders his decision, and he rules this excited utterance. Now, I can tell you that the way Eric Schur is going to describe this conversation is that, yes, David was very concerned about his mother. And he said um, that his mom was really sick. and and that her, his dad wouldn't take her to the hospital. And he indicated that she was breathing like this, and then the breathing was like this. <sighs> there was a deep, rasping breath that he, um, that he said this, how David demonstrated that his mother was breathing. So this is an excited utterance, Your Honor, and it is different 
I will say that the statement that was made to Therese Tafazio, um, that, da that Eric, uh, I'm sorry, that David um, Jensen made to Th Therese Tafazio, she also indicated that he was somewhat worried. But it's, it's a different thing because that conversation between Therese Tafazio and David, uh, David Jensen occurred at the instance of T Therese Tafazio. She asked, she asked David, where's your mother? And he said, well, here's a note. And oh, I forgot to give you this note. And then he said that she was, she, that she was sick. Um, so there's a different, there's a different, uh, there, there's a different set of circumstances there. But the circumstances that surround the conversation between Eric Schur and David Jensen clearly reflect that it's an excited utterance. And it's a conversation between two eight-year-old children. It's not a testimonial statement. It has nothing to do with the Confrontation Clause. You know, I, I don't want to keep uh, arguing the issue, but I, I'm still confused by the defense saying I have to worry about the Confrontation Clause and a residual hearsay exception. I don't see that anywhere in both of the cases. Judge, it's not Unless a it's printed in here. Show me the page. Well, I can't tell you what you're looking at specifically, I'm Judge. Looking at the case that we were going to all read last night Baby instead Mercado. of watching Gunsmoke. I don't watch Gunsmoke. Um, I don't think I have that station. Um, but <coughs> State v. Mercado deals with a video recording of a child t by a forensic interviewer. And in that case, it actually talks about how the prosecution has to make that witness available for cross-examination. It's dealing with a sexual assault case, and it relates to hearsay as it relates to children in sexual assault cases. That's not this case. This is not a statement to an adult on a video recording. Um, so well, that's the Supreme what, Court case would trump that case. I was talking about State v. Mercado. That's the Supreme Court case. Yeah, but it doesn't say anything about confrontation. And I'm not talking The word about is not in the decision. But that, that case has nothing to do with what we're talking about here, Judge. That's, that has to do with the video recording of children and that statute which requires the prosecution then to make that child available for cross-examination. What that statute allows is the prosecution to play the video on direct without calling the child, but then they have to have the child available for cross-examination. It also talks about the standards that you have to have in order to do that, like the child has to notate that they know the difference between right and wrong. They have to notate that there's a, if, if you don't tell right from wrong, that there could be a, a consequence of that. There's a number of things that you have to actually go through to determine that a video can be played on direct. So that's what that case is. When we're talking about this particular case, I understand the court's ruling that if the prosecution sets the foundation that it's a hearsay statement, then we don't have to worry about confrontation. But we still have to worry about confrontation on non-testimonial statements that are not based upon a firmly rooted hearsay exception. Excited utterance is a firmly rooted hearsay exception. So that's not what I'm talking about. And even Judge Schrader, in his opinion, acknowledged that the the residual hearsay is not a firmly rooted hearsay exception. And what they talked about at the last trial is that David Jensen was available to testify, and if the prosecution wanted to make him available for cross-examination, they would notify the defense, and then he would be available. He never testified. So, in fact, the jury never actually got to hear from the declarant. And that's what I'm worried about here, Judge. All I'm right. worried that we're using a residual hearsay exception to bypass calling a witness to allow the juror to hear from the declarant. Your, uh, your statement is in the record. Again, um, we're going to deal with the excited utterance first. And obviously, attorneys know for the record we've got to have a, a startling event. The statement must be made by the declarant under some sort of stress or excitement caused by the event. And the statement relates to the event. And some of the cases that I also read last night, uh, the issue of came up. Uh, how close to the event was the statement made? But this one, I think it's within an, a couple hours or it's the same day or whatever. So that's not an issue for this one. So we'll bring the jury out and we'll see what this witness says. And um, if it's an excited utterance, it's going to remain. Okay, are we ready then? Do we have the witness available? Oh, yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, Let's bring in the jury.
jury? All right, we're going to go back on the record on uh, Mark Jensen, 2002 CF 314. Let's have the appearances, please. Good morning, Your Honor. The State of Wisconsin appears by Special Prosecutor Robert Jamboys, Deputy District Attorney Carly McNeil, and Public Service Special Prosecutor Beverly Jamboys. Attorneys Bridget Krause, Jeremy Perry, and Mackenzie Runner appear on behalf of Mr. Mark Jensen, who appears in person. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming on time again. Uh, we just had a few things to clear up before we could let you come out here. <clears throat> I know it's been a really warm January, and hopefully it doesn't get as hot as it did yesterday, but if it does, maybe we can again try to accommodate you with the warm weather here. All right, with that, the state is obviously still in their case in chief. Who is the next witness, Mr. Jamboy? Let's we'll call Eric Shore, Your Honor. All right, let's have him brought in. Just remain standing, Mr. Schur, and I'll swear you in. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony is meant to be the truth, whole truth, not but the truth. So help you God. Yes, I do. Get as close as you can to the microphone. Spell your first and last name for the reporter. Go ahead. First name Eric, E R I C. Last name Shore, S C H O O R. All right, can you just talk a little bit louder with that? Who's going to be the questioner? I'm going to do the question. Go ahead, Mr. Jambor. And, Your Honor, I'd ask the court reporter to move a little bit that way and so I can see the witness. Let me know when you're ready, ma'am. Okay, that's, no, that's fine. Thank you so much. Okay, so, Mr. Shore, can you tell the jury a little bit about yourself? Where do you live right now and what are you doing these days? Sure. I live in North Carolina. I recently moved there from Charleston, South Carolina. I've been a professional musician for the last 15 years and uh, have a family and um, enjoying life. So you're a professional musician. Do you sing, you write, you... Uh... I play the saxophone and teach. Oh, okay. Um, and where do you teach? I teach music. Where, where do you teach music? Um, currently, since we just left, I'm not teaching at this point, but I do teach some online lessons out of my home. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now. Directing your attention back to uh, September through December 1998, um, where were you back then and what were you doing from September to December of 1998? I was a third grade student at Southport Elementary School. And who was your third grade teacher? Mrs. DeFazio. And who was your best friend in the third grade? David Jensen. And um, tell me about your relationship with David Jensen. Um, we, um, we'd been friends, um, at least for that school year, and we would see each other every day in school and outside of school on the weekends at each other's homes. Um, we did what I would consider to be normal um, third grade activities, playing uh, video games. Um, we had the occasional sleepovers at each other's house. Um, we would play outside. Um, did you have an arrangement for Wednesdays? I did, yes. What I, was the arrangement that your parent, that your mothers had worked out for you two on Wednesdays? I would go to the Jensen home on after school on Wednesdays, and the following Wednesday, David would come to our home, and we would alternate every other Wednesday in that fashion. So you knew David pretty well? I did. You considered him a close friend? I did. Now. Did there come a time, and tell me, what kind of a child was David Jensen? David was a very 
a positive and energetic kid. He was um, funny. He liked, he was, um, I'm not sure how else to describe him. He was funny and positive and um, physically active and um, a pleasure to be around. Rather happy child? I would say so. Now, do you remember um, a time in early December when you'd notice a change in David's demeanor? Yes, I do. Tell us about that day. There was a day at school that David um, informed me about uh, his mother's health. And well, well, tell me what his demeanor was like when he was talking to you about this. He was, um, instead of his normal upbeat, positive self, he was very grave and concerned. And um, what did he say to you about his mother's health at that point? He told me that his mother is sick and that his dad will not take her to the hospital. Did he did he sh mimic or show you any of her symptoms when he was talking to you? He did. He just he demonstrated her breathing at the time to me. Can you demonstrate what he did? I can. He demonstrated a breathing that was. <sighs> I'd request the record show that the witness is uh, demonstrating a deep, raspy breathing. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, do you remember what? Um, do you remember what? Did you remember hearing about the death of Julie Jensen? I do remember hearing about her death. Yes. In this conversation that you had with David, or when he was telling you about his mother like that, do you remember? Um, how much time elapsed between the point where David was telling you that and the point where you heard that David's mother had died? Uh, it was he, the conversation took place somewhere between one to two days before I was informed of Julie's death. Now, um, do you recall anything that had happened on the Wednesday preceding Julie's death? Specifically on Wednesday. Um, I, well, I, sorry, go ahead. On, on the Wednesday preceding Julie's death, were you scheduled to go to their house or was David scheduled to go to your house? I was scheduled to go to David's house. And what happened on the morning on December on the morning of December second? David called our home asking if he could come to our house instead of me going to their house as the schedule would have been normal for me to go there that Wednesday. And when he, did he ask you that or did he ask your mother that or did he ask you and you turn it over to your mother? I'm not clear. I'm sorry. Okay. But in any event, the agreement was that then David would come to your house on, De on December 2nd. That's correct. You remember playing with David on December 2nd? You remember anything about December 2nd when David came to your house? I, rem I remember, um, no, I can't recall details of what we did that day. Now, after Julie's death, did this alternating Wednesday arrangement continue to occur? I don't believe so, no. After Julie's death, did you ever go to David's house again? I did. Do you remember how long after Julie's death that you went to David's house again? I don't remember how long it was after her death. Sorry. Was it more than a month or less than a month? It would have been inside a month, but I don't know if it was that next weekend or two weekends. I'm not sure. And um, when you went to David's house, the next time that you went there, did you see anybody there besides David? I'm not sure if it was the next time that I saw anybody besides David, but um, eventually there was someone else there. And who was the other person that was there? Um, her name was Kelly. And how do you know her name was Kelly? Mark introduced me to her. And how did he introduce her to you? He introduced her as Kelly, a friend from work. And that time that he introduced you as Kelly, a friend from work, did you see Kelly and Mark together that at that time? Yes, they were together that day. And did you see them at any time in the bedroom? Yes, I had seen them in the bedroom one time. So tell us about the time you saw them in the bedroom together. I was walking past um, the bedroom door and saw Kelly laying on their bed. Um, and as I continued past the door, I saw Mr. Jensen standing away from the bed with his shirt off. 
And how much time had elapsed between the point of Julie's death and the point where you saw uh, Mark Jensen and Kelly um, in the bedroom in that fashion? I'm not sure if it was um, about a month. Could be a little more, a little less. I'm not sure. I'm just not sure. So when you would go to visit David at the Jensen's, can you tell us how Julie was um, when she was there with you? I remember Julie being um, very positive and um, engaging with us as kids. She was not an um, absent style parent. She was not an absent style parent that just left us to our own. She cook food for us or um, took us somewhere else to play if we were going to go to a park or, for example. Um, so you would say that she was more of an involved parent than a hands-off parent? Yes. Would you just, how else would you describe her? Just think of some of the adjectives that apply to her as a mother and as a person that was watching you and David. Positive upbeat, kind, sensitive. Um, did you ever play with Douglas when you were over there with David? Occasionally, sure. Did David seem very close to his mother? Yes. And his mother seemed very close to him? Yes. Did you, do you know whether the, Je the Jensen family home, whether there was a computer in the Jensen family home? Yes, there was. And where was it? Do you remember? It was in um, what David told me was the office. It was a small room that had the computer in it. And um, did you ever see Julie on that computer? No, I did not. Did you ever see Mark Jensen on that computer? Once or twice. So the only person you ever, do you ever see anybody else on the computer besides Mark Jensen? No. Thank you, Mr. Shore. I don't have any further questions. Cross-examination. Mr. Shore, I want to talk to you a little bit about that time you saw Kelly Labonte at the Jensen home. Okay. You told this jury today that you saw Kelly Labonte laying on the bed. Yes, ma'am. You also testified about this case in January 28th of 2008. Yes, ma'am. That would have been about 10 years after Julie Jensen's death. Yes, ma'am. Be fair to say it's been a longer period of time since Julie Jensen's death from today. We're That's talking 20, over 20 years. Yes. And when you testified um, in 2008, you raised your right hand? Yes, ma'am. Swore to tell the truth? Yes, ma'am. Just like you did today? Yes, ma'am. And you told the truth? Yes, ma'am. On January 28th of 2008, you were asked by Attorney Jamboys about what you saw in the Jensen home with Kelly Labonte. Yes, ma'am. And I'm going to refer counsel to page 141. Line 5 and 6. What's the date of that hearing? January. January 28th, 2008. Go ahead. And Mr. Schur, you were asked, and what were they doing? And your response was, from what I can remember, they were standing there. Okay. You also were asked questions about anything else you had seen on that day. Okay. And you said you had maybe seen them in the bedroom for one to two seconds. Okay. You were also asked if you observed them embracing. Okay. And you advised that you had not seen them embracing. Okay. Sir, I also want to talk to you about the times you saw the Jensen's in their home. Okay. 
You said that you were friends with David Jensen? Yes, ma'am. You were also a neighbor? Relatively. In the same kind of area? Within a 10-minute drive, yes. You weren't across the street? Correct. So your parents had set up, or your mothers had set up, this Wednesday schedule? Yes. That's not the only time you were at the Jensen home? Correct. You also went on the weekends? Correct. And would it be fair to say that on the weekends is when you mostly saw Mark Jensen? In relation to? Wednesdays during the week. I can't be sure. I'm sorry. That's fair. And when you were at the Jensen house, I think you said you did things that normal kids would do. Video games, right? Yes. Playing outside. Yes. Being in the pool. We were in the pool on occasion, yes. And when you were on, in the pool on occasions, Ms. Jensen was not in the pool with you? As far as I can remember, no, she was not. She would kind of watch from the outside? I can't recall where she was at the time that we were in the pool. So you don't always remember seeing her? You're asking if I remember seeing her while I was in the pool? Correct. I cannot always remember seeing her while I was in the pool. You did see, though, Mark Jensen in the pool? Yes. He would be in the pool with you and David? On occasion, yes. Not every time. Correct. But if he was home and available, he would also be in the pool? On occasion. I want to talk to you a little bit about this conversation you had with David Jensen. Okay. Okay. The first time you talked to anyone about this case would have been a few years after Julie Jensen's death. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, talk to anybody about anything that had happened? That was a bad question. The first time you talked to any law enforcement or the prosecution in this case would have been a couple of two to three years after Julie Jensen's death. As far as I can remember, it was years after that I talked to law enforcement, yes. You never talked to Detective Ratzberg um, in December of 1998? As far as I can remember, I did not. And the first person you actually spoke to in this case was Attorney Jamboys. I can't remember if that was the first person I spoke to or not. Do you remember going and speaking to Attorney Jamboys with your mother sometime in 2003? I don't remember if it was 2000, 2003, but I remember having the conversation, yes. Um, and no law enforcement was present at that time? I can't be sure if, sure if there was or was not. Um, at that time in 2003, you would have been, what, 13 years old? Yes. You didn't write out a statement? I did not. You didn't write the things that you would remember being told? I did not write anything like that. You didn't write how you observed David Jensen to be breathing um, mimicking his mom's symptoms? I did not write that, no. Since the time that you met with Attorney Jamboys and your mother, you've spoken to other people about this case. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? You've spoken to other people about this case. At some point, yes. And you've heard other people talk about this case? Yes including people that you went to school with? It's hard to, hard to recall uh, if anybody I went to school with talked about this case. I don't have a memory of anybody talking about it. I mean, did you overhear parents talking about the case? Also hard to say. I don't recall. You never wrote down any notes when you were eight years old as to what David Jensen told you. That's correct. I did not. You never wrote down any notes when you were eight years old as to what day he told you this? That's correct, I did not. You told your mom about what you had heard? From David? Correct. Yes. And a police detective spoke to your mom? I can't be sure of that, I don't know. You weren't home when they spoke to your mom? I don't know. That was back in 1998? I don't know. No, I'm just saying that the incident happened in 1998. Is that why you don't know or don't remember? I don't know when detectives spoke to my mom. And when the detective, you don't know when, but you do know your mom did speak to a detective? I am not sure. I don't know if she did or did not. Did you talk to your mom about this case? Have I ever? Yes. Yes. 
And since the incident in 1998 and since your conversation with Attorney Jamboy sometime in 2003, 2004, you've never written a statement as to what you heard. That's correct. Or what you saw. That's correct. You were asked about this office, the computer room. Is that right? Yes. And you had testified that you had seen Mr. Jensen on the computer one or two times. Yes. Did you go into the computer room? No. You have no idea what he was doing in there? That's correct. You don't know if he was working? That's correct. And you testified that you never saw Julie Jensen in the computer room? That's correct. But it'd be fair to say that you weren't watching where Julie Jensen was while you and David Jensen were playing? In general, no, I was not watching to see what she was doing. Or while you were playing video games? Correct. Thank you, sir. I have nothing further. Can you redirect, Mr. Chamberlain? Well, you know, um, there was a, a question I wanted to go back into. Defense counsel had posed to you a question. You didn't write anything that you write down anything that you'd been told. Isn't that true? And that's, and you said that is true. You didn't write anything down. But actually, that question kind of assumes the existence of a fact, not an evidence to it that you've been told anything. Had anybody ever told you what to say about this case? No. So in your conversations, whether it was with me or with anybody else or with your mother, has anybody ever told you what you're supposed to say? No. Other than you're supposed to tell the truth, right? Correct. So when you're talking about the conversation that you had with David when you were eight years old, um, you're telling us about the conversation that you had with David when you were eight years old, correct? That's correct. Now, here on the planet Earth, how many eight-year-old children do you know that, takes, that write down notes about conversations that they have with other eight-year-old children? I don't know any. Never heard of any, have you? Uh, no. In any culture, in any part of the United States or the world at large, You've never heard of an eight-year-old child that makes it a point to sit down and write out notes about a conversation that he or she's had with their eight-year-old child, correct? Correct. So it would stand to reason that you would not have notes of a conversation that you had with David when he was eight years old. Correct. But as you're sitting here today, that conversation kind of stands out, doesn't it? Yes. You've never had a conversation like that with any other eight-year-old child at the time, did you? That's correct, I did not. And David's demeanor was quite a bit different when he talked to you about this, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It was something very serious and grave to David, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Did he appear to you to be frightened and concerned? Objection, Judge. I think he's leading. Why don't you rephrase it, Mr. Chamber? What was his demeanor when he was talking to you? Objection asked and answered. Well, you went into it on cross. And he trying just to asked question. That Can I question? finish? Sorry, Judge. I mean, a poor court reporter. I feel sorry for her sometimes. You went into this area. He has the right to go back into it. So go ahead, Mr. Jambos. I'd ask that the last question be read back. Once again, putting pressure on your poor court reporter. David's demeanor was grave, concerned, nervous, worried. And now those are those are among the reasons that you still remember that conversation today. Yes. No further questions. Redirect. Mr. Shar, when David talked to you, he wasn't crying. No. And you had this conversation when you were eight years old. Yes. And you don't know what day you had this conversation. I can pinpoint it to within. 48 hours of December 3rd, but I can't be sure if it was one day before or two days before. So you don't know what day you had that conversation? Correct. You don't know what time you had that conversation? The exact time? Correct. Correct. You don't know where you were when you had that conversation? I do know where I was. Where were you? I was at school on the playground. Um, so you were at school on a playground with David Jensen when you had this conversation with him? Yes. And I understand that you wouldn't have taken notes in 2000 or 1998, sir, but at no point have you written down what you remember from that day? 
Correct. I have nothing further. Thank you, right. sir. You're excused. Thank you. Go to the stand. What number is that for me? My uh, co-counsel tells me it's 66, Your Honor. Thank you. She's got the list. Remain standing, raise your right hand, okay? You solemnly swear the testimony in this matter be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth. Help you, God. You can do this close as you can to the microphone. And if you could just spell your first and last name for the reporter. Spell Laura Shore, L A U R A. The other microphone, ma'am. S C H O O R. Thank you. Go ahead. I know the I, normally people go to the biggest microphone. It's the smallest <laughs> microphone that we're concerned about here. Um, so, um, Mrs. Shore, um, you're, uh, do you know Eric Shore? I do. And how is it that you know Eric Shore? He's my son. So you've known him his whole life. Absolutely. Um, directing your attention back to uh, his, the school year, September through December of, 2000, of 1998, uh, do you remember where Eric was going to school? Southport Elementary. And he, what grade was he in? Third grade. And who was his teacher? Mrs. DeFazio. And who was his best friend in third grade? David Jensen. And um, did you meet David Jensen? I did. And did you meet his mother, Julie Jensen? I did. Tell us what your recollection, your um, what your memory was of Julie Jensen. I met the met her approximately when Eric and David were in uh, kindergarten. She was very kind, smiling, positive. And um, then you continue to know her through yes. third grade? Yes. So tell us, um, did you and... Oh, <coughs> I said yes. Okay. Yes, it's important to speak into these little microphones here, especially you because the court reporters are back turned to you, and so she, can't, she can read my lips, although she can usually hear me just fine. But um, so... Tell us about uh, any arrangement that you and Mrs. Jensen had with respect to your children playing together. We would exchange homes on Wednesdays. So tell us what that means. That would mean that Eric would go to David's after school on Wednesdays, and then the next week David would come to our house after school. And then when the children were done playing, like when David would come to your house uh, after school on Wednesday, um, would somebody pick David up or would you deliver David back to his parents' house? Uh, Julie would pick him up. Okay. And when they were playing at her house, you would pick Eric up? Correct. So um, how often did you see Julie Jensen between September and December of, of 1998? at least every other week or once a week. And did you notice any change in her behavior, her demeanor during that period of time? No. Now, do you remember hearing about um, Julie Jensen's death? Yes. Now, I want to talk to you about the days preceding Julie Jensen's death. Okay. And... Um, do you, do you know what day it was that Julie Jensen died? I do. What day was it? December 3rd. And what day was it that you heard that Julie Jensen had died? December 4th. And was it early in the morning or later in the day that you heard that Julie had died? Uh, it was approximately, let's see, probably 9 o'clock in the morning. By that time, Eric had gone to school already? Yes. Um, so... 
switching gears to December 2nd, do you remember anything unusual that happened on December 2nd, which was a Wednesday, correct? Yes. Okay, so the Wednesday oh, preceding okay. December 3rd, December 2nd, can you tell us what happened on December 2nd? David called our house in the morning before school and asked, and Eric answered the phone and act, talked to Eric directly and asked if he could come to our house after school instead of Eric going to their house after school, as that was the original plan. And do you know why David was asking this? He said his mom was sick. And did you agree that David could come to your house on yes. December 2nd? And do you recall him coming to your house on December 2nd? Yes, yes. Did you notice anything unusual about David on December 2nd? No, they played in Eric's room. I didn't know. Oh. And then um, the next day, David and Eric went to school, December 3rd? Yes. And did the, now any time before you heard about the death of Julie Jensen, had you had a conversation with Eric about um, a conversation that he had with David? I, yes, on December 4th, the morning before school, Eric came to me and said, Mom, David told me his mom is sick and she's breathing. And he did a deep <laughs> kind of thing, and his dad won't take him to the hospital. So that you're sure that conversation between you and Eric occurred on the morning of December 4th? Yes. And later that Actually, later within the hour or so, you heard that Julie had within died. a couple hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mrs. Schur. I don't have any further questions That's of you. Examination. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Schur, you said that you saw David on December second. On that Wednesday? Yes. And that was at your home? Yes. And David didn't say anything to you no. about his mom? No. In fact, you saw the boys playing? They played, yeah. David mm -hmm. wasn't crying? No. Didn't seem to be under any distress? Not that I saw. What you knew on that Wednesday was that David had contacted your son because his mom was sick. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Thank you. On December 3rd, you didn't have any conversation with your son about anything David Jensen told him? No. And then you said on December 4th is when your son had this conversation with you? In the morning, early morning. Mm -hmm. On December 9th, you spoke to Detective Ratzberg. Okay. It was, it was probably a week after Julie Jensen's death. Do you remember okay. speaking to a detective? Yes. And he came to your home? Yes. And he wanted to talk to you about Julie Jensen's death? Yes. He also wanted to talk to you about what you knew about Julie Jensen? I guess so. And you knew Julie Jensen because your boys were friends? Right. Were you a member of this book club? No. So it was really because the boys were friends that you two talked to each other? Yes. So you didn't know a lot about Julie Jensen? Mm. I mean, I knew her for four years. Right. I mean, did you guys vacation together? No, no. Go out to lunches together? Maybe once. And what you told Detective, one of the things you talked to Detective Ratzberg about was Julie Jensen discussed getting a job with you. Okay. Do you remember that? Not, not particularly. Um, one of the things you talked to Detective Ratzberg about was that Julie Jensen said she was supposed to start a job at Bradford High School. Okay. Do you remember that? Very vague. Do you remember telling Detective Ratzberg that she told you she was going to start on December 7th? No, I don't remember that specifically. That's fine. But you do remember talking to Detective Ratzberg? Yes. And him asking you questions? Yes, but I don't remember the conversation. You don't remember the questions, but you remember him Correct. asking you questions. Correct. And he was taking notes on what you said. I, I guess so. Were you answering his questions truthfully, if Objection. you remember? Of course, yeah. This is all irrelevant. Unless, is there some prior inconsistent statement? It's. I don't have to just cross her on inconsistent statements. No. 
But he's, she's got a cross on something relevant. How is it relevant that she spoke to Detective Ratzberg at some point? Well, maybe she's trying to see what was said to the detective at that time. Thank you, well, Judge. And, Your Honor, what was said to Detective Ratzberg was hearsay. So if she wants to ask her about the topic of conversation, if she, she can ask her to Julie Well, Jensen. maybe there's a statement. I don't know. So we'll I'm, see where we're going. I'm asking the declarant what she said to Detective Ratzberg. Thank Which you, Which is Judge. hearsay. And so what she should ask the declarant is, did Julie ever talk to you about getting a job? <coughs> she, can, she can ask her that. She doesn't need to ask her about hearsay statements. Just ask her. And if she doesn't remember, then she can refresh her recollection. I'm not going to refresh her recollection, but I will ask that way question that way. Mr. Jamba, uh, you can't be both. You can't be the defense attorney and a prosecutor for questioning. So let, let, let her do her job, and we will get through this case. Thank you. Ms. Thank Short, you. do you remember Julie Jensen talking to you about getting a job at Bradford High School? Right now, I can't remember. Do you remember Julie Jensen telling you that she was going to start a job at Bradford High School on December 7th? I don't remember. You do remember talking to a detective? Yes. And you remember answering his questions truthfully? Yes. One of the things that you testified before this jury today was that Eric said, David said, his mom was sick. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And Eric said, David said, my dad won't take her to the hospital. Yes. When you talked to Detective Ratzberg, you didn't tell him that Eric said, David said, Mark Jensen wouldn't take her to the hospital. Okay. Is that true? Can I don't you, remember. Counsel, can you direct me to the document you're referring to? Police reports. Okay, what page? Page 17 of the And for the record, what document are you talking about that you were just flashing over to the other side? I show, I'm crossing her on statements she made to Detective Ratzberg. So the document I'm looking at is Detective Ratzberg's report. I'm not going to show it to her because I don't think that would help. All right. Did you talk to Julie Jensen about her concerns about Douglas going into daycare? Uh, vaguely remember. And the reason you talked to her about that is she didn't want him to go into daycare, which is why she was trying to get a job in the school system. Right. There was preschool he was in, but not. she didn't want him to go to daycare all day long. And again, you had a chance to see David Jensen on December 2nd. Yes. And he'd been coming over to your house every other Wednesday for months. Yes. And he never mentioned anything to you? No. Thank you, ma'am. I have nothing further. Any uh, redirect from the state? Uh, yes, I want to, could I, I, I can't find the document here, so I just want to find it's the police report. Yeah, but I, I want to know which page it's on. Uh, So you don't remember the conversation that you'd had with Julie at some point about starting a job at Bradford High School? As I sit here right now, I can't recall it. Okay, just I'll, I'll try to read this part and see if that refreshes your recollection. Okay. Judge, I think he first, she first has to ask if Detective Ratzberg's report is going to refresh her recollection because it's not her report. 
I think she's right. It's not her statement. It's a statement by somebody else. So, so you don't remember talking to Detective Ratzberg? I mean, you do remember talking to Detective, Ra Detective Ratzberg, but you don't remember any conversation about Julie starting a job at Bradford High School? I can't remember as I sit here now. Okay. I just. But um, you do recall telling Detective Ratzberg about the statement that Eric had made? I don't remember anything that I said to him as I sit here now. Okay. I'm going to. Um, When you spoke to Detective Ratzberg, do you remember that how you described the conversation that you'd had with Eric about what David had told him? I, I just can't remember talking to what I said to him. Okay. I just. Well, um, tell us if you can, I want you to think back to the morning of December 4th, 1998, and think about the conversation that you had with Eric, what Eric had told you about his conversation with David. Can you think back to that for a moment? Yeah, I remember Eric telling me. And what exactly did Eric tell you? He said, my mom is sick and she's breathing like <laughs> a deep breathing and my dad won't, and his dad won't take her to the hospital. Did um, Eric tell you that David had told him that his mom was almost dead? No. You don't remember that? I don't remember that, no. No further questions. Anything on that from the defense? Just briefly, Judge. Um, Ms. Shore, since this case, Ms. Jensen's passing, um, you've spoken to your son about this case? Yes. Nothing further. Thank you. All right. You're excused. Thank you. Okay. What number's next? Judge, the state is calling Angela Martinelli, and that is number 48. Thank you. Remain standing, raise your right hand. I solemnly swear the testimony it is matter be the truth, hold truth, nothing but the truth shall help you, God. She said, yes, I do. You want to get as close as you can to that smaller microphone, okay? All right, can you uh, also then spell your first and last name for the court reporter? Angela, A-N-G-E-L-A, -E Martinelli, M-A-R-T-I-N-E-L-L-I. -L -L -I. Right. Try to speak a little louder with that. Go ahead, Ms. Is it Ms. McNeil? You're going to yes, do the question. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so we're just using the smaller one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Ms. Martinelli, um, where did you live in 1998? Um, I lived in Pleasant Prairie on 2nd Avenue. Is that the Carroll Beach yes. neighborhood? Yes. It is? Okay. And... When you lived in that neighborhood, did you meet a Julie Jensen? Um, I met her when I lived on Lakeshore Drive. Um, we moved in 97 to Second Avenue, which was still kind of in the neighborhood, but a little farther. So what year did you meet Julie Jensen? I met her, I would say 1991. And how did you meet her? Uh, she was a neighbor, and then we also formed a book club, and we were part of book club together. So uh, is this the book club that met once a month? Yes. So at the least, you would typically see Julie Jensen once a month? At the very least, yes. And did you, um, at certain times when you knew her, did you see Julie Jensen more often? Yes. 
And what were those circumstances where you would see her more often? Um, just outside in the neighborhood, and then our um, boys went to preschool together. So I would see her, I think it was three days a week that we took the boys to preschool. Are you talking about her younger son? Yes. And so your child and Julie Jensen's younger son went to the same preschool? Correct. Now, um, can you tell us when those two children were going to that preschool, what the days and hours were? I believe it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 8.30 to about 11 or 11.30. And um, would you sometimes see Julie Jensen picking up your child and she would be there too? Yes. And did you make any observations about Julie Jensen as a mother? I thought she was an excellent mother. Um, so she seemed to be attentive to her child? Very, very caring. And is there any point in time where you thought Ms. Jensen's personality changed in any way from what you observed? No. Um, so now I'd like you to think to the last time you would have seen Julie Jensen alive. Do you know when that would have been? Um, that would have been November 20th. We had lunch together with okay. the kids. And is this a lunch where you went out to a restaurant? Yes. After okay. we picked up the boys from preschool, we went out to lunch. So pickup time, is that around 11.30? 11 or 11.30, yeah. And then you went to eat lunch somewhere? Yes. Do you happen to remember where? Stars and Stripes restaurant. All right, and how did you end up going to lunch with Julie Jensen? Do you recall how it got set up? She invited me. She called and invited me. And when you were eating lunch, do you recall any topics of conversation or anything? Um, I remember we were talking about Thanksgiving that was coming up and that she was baking pies for Thanksgiving. And uh, did Julie Jensen eat lunch with you? Yes. So she wasn't refusing to eat or anything no, like that? No, no. Now, did you end up having a, a child in early December of that year? Yes, December 1st of 98. And um, did you think Julie Jensen would be interested in hearing that? Yes, I was going to call all my friends. And when I called um, Carrie Ashley, who was a mutual friend, she said she would call in and let Julie know that I had my baby. Um, and so just going back to the last time you saw Julie Jensen, did you have any concerns about her demeanor? I did not. And how would you describe her demeanor? Um, she was always a very soft-spoken, calm, um, just a very caring, kind person. And the children were actually at the lunch, um, her um, youngest child? The youngest, yeah, her youngest was, yes. And one of your children? And one of mine, mm-hmm. And so no difference in her demeanor in terms of how she treated her child? No. Um, I have no further questions. Cross-examination. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Martinelli, you said you were neighbors with the Jensens until sometime in 1997? Yes. And you continued to remain friends when you saw each other picking up your children? Yes. We still lived in the same neighborhood, just a little farther away. <clears throat> And although you knew Julie Jensen and did this book club with her, your families didn't like vacation together. No, we did go over to their house for dinner. So you knew Mark Jensen also? Yes. Now you said you've known Julie Jensen since 1991 when you were in the same neighborhood. Yes. And the last time you spoke to her was this lunch on November 20th of 1998. Correct. And you both had three-year-olds at the time? Yes. It'd be fair to say that when you have a three-year-old and you're eating lunch, you're also helping your three-year-old eat lunch. Yes. Make sure they're eating their food. Yes. Make sure they're sitting still. Yes. Not running around the neighborhood. Correct. Or around the restaurant. And that's something you and Julie Jensen also did. Yes. Now, she said that she was making pies for Thanksgiving. Yes. 
She never mentioned any concerns about eating or drinking when she was talking to you? No. In fact, Julie Jensen's the one that did most of the cooking in that Jensen household. I don't know. Um, and for Thanksgiving, she talked about how she was going to make the pies. Correct. When you talked to Julie Jensen, you didn't have conversations about problems in marriages? No. And Julie Jensen never complained to you about any problem in her marriage? No. She never talked about any affairs? No. She never said on November 20th of 1998 that she was afraid of her husband? No. She also never talked to you about depression? No. Or her own depression? No. You were at the November Book Club? I was not. You were not at the November Book Club. Were you at the October Book Club? Yes. And were you at, did you miss other book clubs? If you remember. Rarely. It's fair to say that the people in the book club sometimes missed book clubs. Yes. They might have had family issues. Correct. Um, work obligations? Yes. Did you keep track of who came or didn't come no. to a book club? No, not really. Had you been at book clubs at the Jensen's house before? Yes. You never saw any unusual behavior at the Jensen home? No. Never saw Mr. Jensen um, angry with his wife? No. Yell at his wife? No. Demean his wife? No. And Mrs. Jensen never talked to you about any of those things? No. Never expressed any concern? No. And that includes on November 20th? That's right. Thank you, ma'am. I have nothing further. Thank you. Anything else from the state? No, Your Honor. All right. You're excused. Thank you. Thank you. Our next number. That would be the state is calling Joseph Manji, number 46. Thank you. If you could remain standing, sir, I'll swear you in. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony in this man to be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you, God. Thank you. Thank you. You can have a seat. Get as close as you can to the smaller microphone. And if you could spell your first and last name for the court reporter. It's Joseph Mangi, J-O-S-C-P-H-M-A-N-G-I. Thank you. Who's doing the questioning? Judge. Go ahead, Ms. McNeil. <clears throat> Mr. Manji, um, during your career, did you work in the Kenosha Unified School System? Yes, I did. Can you tell us um, about your uh, career in Kenosha Unified? Um, my wife and I came to Kenosha in 1970, and I taught uh, reading and study skills at Washington Junior High for one year and then was appointed the Dean of Students at Lincoln Junior High the following year. And two years later was appointed the Assistant Principal at Bullen Junior High. I was there for three years and then I was appointed Principal at McKinley Junior High. And then that was seven years and then at Lance junior high for two years and then Bradford High School for 18 years from 1987 to 2005. 
Um, and after that, did you retire, or what happened after 2005? I tried to retire. Um, the following year, I was principal at uh, Ipsola for a year, and then the following year, I was appointed superintendent from 2007 to 2010, and then retired again, and then came back to be superintendent in 2014. Are you now retired? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then to be clear, in 1998, you would have been the principal at Bradford High School? Yes, I was. Um, now, sometime in the late fall of 1998, was Bradford High School hiring for a secretary in the office? Yes, we needed a part-time secretary. And did a person by the name of Julie Jensen apply for that job? Yes, she did. Were you part of the interview process? Were you one of the interviewers? Yes, I was the main interviewer. And did Ms. Julie Jensen get an interview? Yes. Um, so I'm going to show you an exhibit. <clears throat> So I've put in front of you what has been marked as State's Exhibit Number 8. Um, is that the resume Julie Jensen would have submitted for this job? Yes. And um, what kind of skills were you looking for for this part-time legal secretary or part-time secretary? Well, we're a high school, so my philosophy was to look for someone who loved kids, loved working with kids, and loved education. Um, it would have been someone with good relationship skills with office efficiency, typewriting skills. We did not have computers at the time, so it would have been typewriting skills. Um, efficient, professional, kind, um, being able to carry on good relationships primarily with students, parents, um, other, the teachers, office personnel. Um, and so uh, did you end up interviewing Ms. Jensen the morning of November 20th of 1998? I believe so. <clears throat> what was your impression of Ms. Jensen during that interview? Objection relevance. If she appeared to be actively seeking and wanting this job, fitting the criteria? Well, I'll let you go on a little bit in that area. Go Thank ahead. You. So you may answer the question of your impressions of Ms. Jensen. She appeared to be very professional, um, kind, um, easy to talk to, um, uh, upbeat, um, efficient, all of those things. Um, so did you think, based on that interview, she was a good fit for the job? Yes, I did. Um, now, looking at State's Exhibit 8, um, this resume, did Julie Jensen express in this resume that she had computer skills? No, it wouldn't have come up because we didn't have computers at the time, so that's we weren't looking for that, and so she would not have discussed it because they weren't available. I mean, the only computer that I can remember was to track student attendance, and that wasn't the position she was applying for. All of the secretaries had typewriters at the time. Now, um, as part of your um, trying to figure out wh whether Ms. Jensen was a, a good fit for this job, did you learn about her volunteering at Southport Elementary School? Yes, it's always um, part of the process that you talk to someone and get a reference. So I did call the Southport principal, and he was very positive about her work at the school as a volunteer. Um, and now, 
In terms of uh, this particular uh, job, is there a, was there a minimum number of people you had to interview? Yes, there were three. Um, the minimum number of candidates, the policy is you must interview three candidates for any position. And so she was the second of the three candidates. Um, and so once you were done with the interview process and you had interviewed the number of candidates you needed to, um, who did you decide to hire for the job? Julie Jensen. Um, and in order to hire her, um, how did you try to contact her? I called the home. Um, and so I want you to think <clears throat> to that time period when you would have called the home. Um, would that have been sometime the week of November 30th? Yes. And so after Thanksgiving? Yes. Um, we interviewed Julie Jensen November 20th. That was Thanksgiving week, I believe. And so um, the following Monday, I may have interviewed the third candidate. And so I would have called the home to inform Mrs. Jensen that she had the position, and it would have been either Tuesday or Wednesday, the middle of the week. I don't recall exactly which day, but probably the Tuesday or Wednesday of that week. Okay. And so November turning into December, Tuesday is December 1st, and Wednesday is December 2nd? Is that yes. accurate? Mm. So you think one of those two days? Yes. Um, now, when you called the Jensen home, did Julie Jensen answer? No, she did not. Okay. Who answered the phone? I believe it was Mr. Jensen. Okay, so it was a, a male who answered the phone. Yes, it was. And sounded like an adult. Yes. You knew she had a husband. Yes. Um, and uh, do you recall whether he identified himself or not? I am identified myself. Uh, hello, this is Joe Mangie, principal of Bradford High School. And I'd like to speak to Julie Jensen. Um, we'd like to offer her the position of the part-time secretary. And so your belief was you were telling this to her husband? Yes. And what was his response? His response was, she's asleep. She's going to be asleep for a long time. And he laughed. Um, how would you describe the laugh? Well, it wasn't a loud guffaw. It was, you know, making light of the situation. I mean, I wasn't anticipating a laugh, so it was disconcerting, but it definitely was a laugh, you know, like you would make light of a, of a situation or whatever. Now, you would have called during normal daytime hours, correct? That's correct. Um, so you weren't calling very late at night? No, no, no. It would have been during the school day. Um, so did you ever end up actually speaking to Julie Jensen to offer her the job? No, I did not. Um, so what's the next thing that you learned about Julie Jensen? It was a day or two later that I learned that she had died. Um, and um, so... And do you have... Um, a recollection of how you learned that? Um, it's hard to remember. I, b I believe it might have been I live in the neighborhood, and um, when I could, I would uh, take walks after school hours. Um, many times I'd come home at 4, 4.30 because there was always an evening event at Bradford, Tuesday nights were girls basketball, Thursday nights were wrestling, Wednesday nights were swimming, and so I would go back to the school because the kids needed to see their principal supporting them. At least that's how I felt. So it may have been a neighbor in the neighborhood. It may have been the nurse, Mrs. Labanowski, um, who also was a neighbor um, and was our school nurse at Bradford. So do you think it was still during the school week and not a weekend that you learned she had died? Yes. Now, 
after learning that, did that cause you additional concern about that conversation you had had? Yes, it did. And so what did you do, um, given that you had this additional concern? Well, I spoke with Mrs. Labanowski, the nurse, because she seemed to have known Mrs. Jensen. And then I spoke to the police liaison officer at Bradford. I believe it was, it may have been Detective Rick Bentz. I remember speaking to him. And he said, well, it's, it's Pleasant Prairie. You know, we don't have jurisdiction there. You need to call the Pleasant Prairie Police Department and share your concern. So that's what I did. <clears throat> All right, and so what were your concerns in that moment that caused you to call the Pleasant Prairie Police Department? Well, it, you know, it's unsettling, it's disconcerting, it just didn't fit somehow. So I thought, well, if it's pertinent to anything, it's my civic duty to inform somebody, um, let the police sort it out. Um, I mean, I wasn't settled. It bothered me. Um, something wasn't right. Um, so now, just one more time, take a look at State's Exhibit number eight. Mm -hmm. um, based on Ms. Jensen's resume, um, was she a homemaker um, working from her home from May of 1991 until the time that you were about to offer her this job? Yes, that's what it looks like. Um, so I would move State's Exhibit 8 into evidence. Any objection? No. All right, it's received. Are we done with the direct? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, pardon me, that motion. Thank you, Judge. Is it Manji? Manji, yes. Manji. Um, Mr. Manji, I want to direct you to that Exhibit 8 sitting in front of you. That's mm -hmm. the resume you received from Julie Johnson. Yes. And at the bottom of that resume that you received from Julie Jensen, it does talk about general office skills. Yes. And one of the general office skills you see listed um, is typing. Yes. Another one is filing. Yes. And the last one on there says online security order entry. Okay. Is that what it says, sir? That's what it says. You didn't actually talk to her about all of the general office skills she had. Well, typing would have been one of them. Um, filing would have been one of them, record keeping. Mostly it was interaction with students, teachers, and parents. I mean, we were a large school, 1,800 students. So um, I was looking for somebody that would good relationship skills with kids, with people. So, Mr. Mangi, you didn't actually talk to her about all of the general office skills she had. Well, we wouldn't have talked about, yes, we did. We talked about office skills in general that were pertinent to the job. So the office skills listed on Ms. Jensen's resume, did you talk to her about every single general office skill she had when you were interviewing her? Everything but online security order entry because at the time we didn't have computers, so we wouldn't have talked about that at all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and the, just like you just said, you didn't talk to her because computer use was not something you needed for this job. That's correct. She did tell you she could type. Yes. She didn't mention any concerns with <clears throat> how fast she could type. No. When you were speaking to Ms. Jensen during this interview, she never told you that Mr. Jensen didn't want her to get a job. No, that never came up. And at the end of the interview, you didn't offer her the job. I couldn't because she was the second of three candidates. I had to wait for the third candidate to be interviewed. So at the end of the interview, you didn't offer her the job. No, I wasn't able to. You didn't pick a start date? No. You told her you'd get back to her? Yes. Now, you testified that the week of November 30th is when you called the Jensen home. Yes. And just to clarify, November 20th of 1998 was a Friday. I believe so, yes. And then you were going to complete the rest of the interviews the next week, Thanksgiving week? 
Yes. And it was the week after that that you contacted the Jensen home. Yes, because the third candidate needed to be interviewed. I don't remember. It was Thanksgiving week. It was hard to, you know, to interview people I, I Thanksgiving week. So it may have been that week, the third candidate. It may have been the following Monday. But then it would have been Tuesday or Wednesday, I believe, as best I can recollect, the middle of the week. So you don't remember when you interviewed the third candidate? I do not. It would have been in the files of the part-time secretary applications at Bradford, but those files were thrown out when I retired by the succeeding principal. Okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about the timing of the phone call. Mm. You testified on direct you thought it was sometime during the school day. Yes. And the school day was what hours? 7.30 until 2.55? That was the school day for students, yes. Your school day was longer. Yes, I was there at 6.30 in the morning because we had uh, before school breakfast for a lot of students and I would have been there after school. You know, I tried to be a visible principal, so that's when you got your paperwork done from 5, 5.30. So when you said on direct that it would have been sometime during the school day, you're talking about your school day. It would have been during the school day, most likely. Uh, things are with a big school like that are pretty hectic in the morning um, and then through the lunch hours. But then things calm down after 1.30, between 1.30 and 3. And so it was probably in that time zone when things were calmer and I had time to think. Um, it could have been after the students had left the school when you were sitting there doing paperwork. It could have been. Most likely it was the early afternoon. It could have been 3.30 or so, but probably no later than that. Do you remember testifying in this case on January 28th of 2008? Yes. And you were asked about what time you made this particular call? Yes. And I'm going to refer counsel to page 170. Lines 4 to 11. <clears throat> Mr. Mangie, you were asked, do you recall during which time you would have made this particular call? Mm -hmm. And you responded, I don't, I do not. You were then asked, okay, could it have been after school hours? And your response was, it could have been. That's true. Thank you, sir. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about this conversation you had when you called the Jensen home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You identified yourself. Yes. And you said, I want to offer Ms. Jensen this job. Yes. And the individual on the phone advised you that Ms. Jensen was asleep. Yes. And I think your testimony was asleep for a long time. Yes. And then that person laughed. Yes. And you said it wasn't a loud laugh. No. Like a guffaw, I think you said. That's correct. It wasn't that. And it wasn't a long laugh. Well, I mean, it was a laugh. I mean, it wasn't forever, but when you're not expecting something, um, it was like making light of the situation kind of laugh. So it was in light of, it was like making light of a situation. Yes. That's what you got from the lab. That's what I recollect, yes. That's what I you, got from it. Thank you. Um, you had never met Mr. Jensen. No, no, never. You'd never spoken to him on the phone? No. Didn't know his voice? Nope. Didn't know his demeanor? No. Didn't know if he had a nervous laugh? No. I have nothing further. Thank you, sir. Any uh, redirect? Just to clarify, did it sound like someone just doing a nervous laugh? You know, it didn't, to me, it didn't appear to be a nervous laugh. Um, 
And when you're not expecting something, you know, it's hard to determine. I remember it wasn't a loud guffaw. I don't know what a, a nervous laugh can be. I'm not an expert in, you know, how people laugh, especially when you're not anticipating something. It wasn't, do you know what I mean? If, um, it was a phone call. It was a laugh. It was making light of the situation. It's kind of how I interpreted it. It was unsettling to me. I didn't expect that, so I don't know what else I can say. It's hard to describe, you know, a laugh from 25 years ago. Um, it's the best I can recollect. Um, I have no further questions. Anything on that one question? No. All right, you're excused. Thank you for coming in. <clears throat> All right, there's been a request uh, by the jury for a break, and I'm going to honor it. Um, so let's go back and uh, take a little break. Don't talk about the case, okay? All right, let's try to be back uh, quarter after 10.
All right, we are back on the record again on Mr. Jensen's case. The appearances are the same. The jury's back in the courtroom. Uh, Ms. McNeil, who is the next witness? Kimberly Noble, Your Honor. Formerly known as Kimberly Shaw. Have you stand and raise your right hand? You solemnly swear the testimony is meant to be the truth, whole truth, not for the truth's help you got. Try to get as close as you can to that smaller microphone. Okay. And then spell your first and last name for the reporter. Kim Noble, K-I-M-N-O-B-L-E. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Mr. Jamboy. Thank you. And Ms. Noble, did you know a person by the name of Julie Jensen? I did. Uh, tell us, tell the jury how you came to know Julie Jensen. I lived in the same neighborhood as Julie, and we were in a book club together, and she babysat for my daughter for the first two years of her existence. So um, what year was it that you first met Julie Jensen, if you can recall? We moved into the neighborhood in 92. And how was it that you first came to meet or know Julie Jensen? Introduced by neighbors, so when we would go outside, we would talk, and then we joined a book club together. So uh, between the time of 1992 and the time of Julie's death in 1998, about how often would you see Julie Jensen? We moved down the street a little bit in 1996. So at that point in time, it became more for just book club, which was once a month. But prior to that, when we lived very close, we would see each other outside. And when she was babysitting for Clarice, then more frequently because I would drop off or pick up Clarice once so, a day. So between 1992 and 1996, when you were living closer to them, where, where exactly did you live in relation to the Jensen residence? There were two houses in between our houses, and I was south, so. Okay, so you lived uh, the third house to the south of their house. Correct. And uh, so during the summer months, could you tell us what your typical interaction would be, if any, with Julie Jensen between 1992 and 1996? A lot of people would walk. So in the earlier years, people would walk and be around with kids in strollers, and we'd stop and talk. Julie would work in the yard, and so we'd stop and talk. And also, when I would drop off Clarice, either in the morning or pick her up in the afternoon, um, we would just talk about general things, what's going on. So uh, what was Clarice's date of birth? June 6, 1994. And um, so how long were you at home with Clarice before you had to go back to work? I had eight weeks leave, so approximately beginning of September, end of August. You went back to work? Yes. And so what did you do with Clarice when you went back to work? Julie babysat for Clarice. So that must have been hard to be with your baby for two months and then have to leave her and to go to work? It was, it was, but I so, chose to be a working mom. Yes, and um, so you wouldn't leave your two-month-old baby with just anybody? No. 
you were you were very concerned about making sure that you had a good place to put Clarice? Correct. And you decided on Julie? Yes. And what were the qualities about Julie that would cause you to trust her enough to leave your two-month-old baby daughter in her care? She was very kind, very compassionate. Uh, I never really heard her yell or raise her voice. She was just an all-around nice person. Had you seen her as a mother with her children? Yes. And what kind of a mother did you perceive her to be with her children? Kind, um, compassionate, helpful, you know, trying to learn things, involved in what the kids were doing, and, you know, just all around what I would say is a good mom. So during the time that um, Mrs. Jensen, Julie Jensen, was watching Clarice, you would drop Clarice off with her? Either drop her off or pick her up, depending on work schedules. My husband and I would alternate. I see. And um, whenever you picked up Clarice, did she appear to be in good shape? Yes. Did uh, Julie and Clarice appear to have developed a bond, could you perceive? I, it seemed to me that she was doing a very good job taking care of Clarice, and Clarice was very happy to be there. Clarice never threw a fit about going to see, of going to No, the no. And that was from about August of 92. To, I'm sorry, August of 94? Yes, to about September of 96. And why was it that you uh, then had Clarice go somewhere else, if you can recall? Judge, I was... I would object. This is irrelevant. I don't... Tell me where we're going, Mr. Jim. Well, Your Honor, if you'll recall the opening statement that was made by defense. I did recall counsel. it. And the defense, correct? Yes, by the defense. And the issue was brought up, mental health, yes. suicide, correct? Yes, in the, in the years preceding this incident. So we will continue with this line of questioning. Thank you, Your Honor. That means you can answer the question. So um, I, and I forgot, I, I'd ask the reporter to read back the last question. So in late August, early September of 96, we put Clarice in a daycare. I was expecting our second child, and we just felt it was good timing to move Clarice when school started, because I could tell her she was going to school. And that way, with the second one on the way, we could put them both in the same daycare. So that was not because of any problems or complaints you had about Mrs. Jensen? No, Julie not Jensen. at all. And did you remain friends with Julie Jensen um, from 1996 up until the point of her death? Yes. Um, did you see any change in her, and you saw her at book club on a regular basis? Correct. Did you ever see any deterioration or change in Julie during the time that you knew her? I did not. And what was your impression of Julie Jensen during that entire time from 1992 through 1998? What was your impression of Julie Jensen as a person and as a mother? As a person, she seemed happy with her hobbies of gardening and cooking and crafting. And as a mother, she was involved in school activities with the boys, and she seemed to be a very good mother. Thank you, Ms. Noble. I have no further questions. All right, Cross from the defense. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Noble, you said that you went to book club in November of 1998. That is correct. That's the only time you spoke to Julie Jensen in November of 1998? It is the only time I recall speaking to her. And then you would have been at book club in October of 1998? 
Correct. Do you specifically remember Julie Jensen being at that book club? I don't specifically remember her being there. You were there. I was there. Do you remember any other dates that you might have had a conversation with Julie Jensen in October of 1998? I do not remember any other dates. Most of the contact that you had with Julie Jensen when she was watching your daughter? Most of the extended contact. After that, it switched to the book clubs, so that was more like one time a month. So between 1994 to 1996, it was maybe a daily contact at some points. That's fair to say, yes. And then after 1996, you both moved from the neighborhood and moved your child out of her care. Yeah, we moved just down the street. We actually moved from the neighborhood in fall <coughs> of 94. And after you took your child out of her care, you started to see her more on a monthly basis. Correct, for book club. If she was at the book club. She was a regular attendee. So if she was at the book club as a regular attendee, you would have seen her. Correct. Um, if you were at the book club. Correct. And there were times that people didn't make the book club. There were times. People have other things going on in their lives. Correct. Vacations. Correct. Birthdays. Correct. School events. True. Many reasons. True. One of the things that you did know about Julie Jensen is that she had gone to school for nursing. Correct. And that's one of the things when you talked about having your child with her that you knew about her. Correct. You also met Mr. Jensen during this time in the neighborhood. Yes. You saw him with his boys. I did, but not nearly as frequently. And you knew that he worked full time? Correct. You knew that Julie was, Jensen was a stay-at-home mom? Correct. And as a stay-at-home mom, she also watched children? Correct. Including your child? Yes. And she would feed your child? Yes. Make lunch for your child? Yes. Did you pack your child a lunch? Sometimes, not always. And when you didn't, she would make sure your child was fed? Correct. At the book club, Besides reading about the book, there were also treats. Yes. Was it mostly like brownies or were there other types of food there? It varied. And at the November book club, there were treats at that book club. Correct. Julie Jensen prepared those treats. Correct. Julie Jensen didn't express any concerns about her husband at that November book club. The only concern I remember was brief. About a tree that had been blown over by the wind. Cur the cover from the spa blew up because of the wind um, and hit the tree. And she was worried about explaining that to Mark. Correct. You had never seen Mark Jensen yell at his wife. I had not seen Mark Jensen yell at his wife. And when she... Um, kind of explained her concerns about this tree, she never said she thought her husband was going to do something to her. No. She Killed just, her. She seemed worried, but it was more in a how will I explain what's going to happen kind of situation, not fearing for her life situation. Not fearing for her safety. Correct. Nothing further. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, redirect? Nothing, Your Honor. You're excused. Thank you. So, Your Honor, um, let me get the next number. So, for purposes of timing, this is a video witness, and it's quite lengthy, so I think if the court uh, approves, we could stop the video for the lunch hour. When it gets right, let's, let's start it and see where we go. 
Okay, and so this would be witness number 75, um, Tadus or Ted Voigt. Read to the jury again the uh, agreement the parties have uh, regarded recorded testimony. You will be hearing and seeing previously recorded testimony of witnesses who are no longer available to testify in person. You are instructed to ignore the logo which may appear on these videos because it has no relevance to this case. You are further instructed that this re recorded testimony is evidence and should be evaluated the same way as witnesses who testify in person. So anytime you're ready, Ms. McNeil. And then for the record, this is State's Exhibit 9. Number 9? Correct. All right. State your full name and spell your first and last name. Uh, Ted Voigt, D E D E V S C W O J T. And um, Mr. Voigt, did you know? Do you know? Uh, did you know Mark and Julie Jensen? Yes. How is it that you came to know uh, Mark and Julie Jensen? Uh, they were my next door neighbors. Where did you live at the time that you were the neighbors of the Jensen's? Uh, it was a 9024 Lakeshore Drive, First Avenue at the time. And when did you first move to 9024 uh, First Avenue? It was around 1992. And when you moved into that residence, uh, who were you living with at that time? Yes. Who, who were you living with at that uh, time? My wife. And what's your wife's name? I'm Margaret. And do you and Margaret have any children? Yes. We do. How many children do you have? Sir? Two. Um, and how old are they? Uh, 20... 20 and 21, sir? Right now. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what do you do for a living, Mr. White? Well, I'm in the construction and the, and the design of uh, arts, usable arts for uh, housing and the personal usage and everything. Tell us what you mean by usable arts for housing. Well, I design uh, for uh, like restaurants, special bars, jazz clubs, stages, uh, furniture, uh, desks, any type of uh, piece that you can use for your personal use. I will work with a client and design some very unusual you know, creative uh, piece of furniture or just artwork. Okay. Can you describe some of the types of artwork that you've created in the past, say, two years or so? Oh, yeah, I I just finished one of the projects downtown Chicago, uh, Pops for Champagne, and I designed Pops for Champagne. I designed for them uh, their uh, bars, are uh, stone, glass, uh, stainless steel. Their uh, custom uh, tables very unusual. That's what the client asked me to uh, design something for them that uh, never been done before, they have never seen before. So that's why I do. I create. I use my imagination and I. You know, I build it in my head, and it goes on the paper, and go to my shop, and then I do it. And um, how long, well, as of December 3rd, 1998, how long had you been living at 9024 First Avenue? I think so. It's got to be 12 years. Now... Um, tell if you can tell the jury if you can remember how, how was it that you first met Julie Jensen? Well, actually, uh, about two years before we moved, we built our house, we moved to our house. Uh, I bought the lot across the street from Julie Jensen. And what year was it you bought the lot across the street from Julie Jensen, if you can remember? What year was it? Or? Yes, do you remember? Uh, probably 1990. Okay. And um, so what was it about buying that lot across the street I from Julie? The lot first to build a house on it because actually it had existing uh, foundation. 
And uh, since we started building, then uh, across the street that lot, there was, uh, at the moment, new construction going on, which was Julie's and Mark's house. And then on a daily basis, us coming into the construction site and leaving the construction site, we saw Julie. And actually one of the uh, occasions, Julie actually came out to our construction site and uh, introduced herself. She helped us a few times. She will check on us uh, if we stay there a little bit longer, like 9 or 10 o'clock. She was like asking, are you having a problem or some other stuff? You know, we were just working a long time, a long hours. So just check on you and being a good neighbor and seeing yeah. how you were doing. Yep. No, no reason just to walk out and, you know. So did you come to um, view Julie Jensen as a person that was a friend of yours? Yes. Yes, more than a name, but I will say a friend. And um, after you built that house across the street, at some point you then apparently built a house next door to them. Yes, there was, uh, I think so during the construction of the house across the street, uh, I uh, noticed there was a sign next to Mark and Julie's house for sale, and I called the number, and actually there was uh, Mark's telephone number. It was uh, there a lot. And we start talking, and they sold me the lot, and then I built a house there. Now, is that the first time you ever spoken to Mark Jensen? Is when you were no, no, I did spoke to him before. So you you'd also come to know Mark Jensen before you built your house there. Yes. And in the years that uh, followed, as you lived there, did you um, occasionally socialize with Mark and Julie Jensen? Yes, we did. Yes. Tell us uh, some of the circumstances under which you'd socialize with them. Well. The basic stuff was just, I like the neighborhood, that's why we moved there. There, there was very like family-oriented neighborhood. They had the kids, we had the kids. So when you, uh, on the weekends or when you come home early or something, always there was somebody out there. You could talk to Mark, Julie, on a daily basis. They were very friendly people, very nice people. Did your children play with their children? Yes, they did. We had. A couple of times dinners together. We went, I think, so a few times to Shawnee's restaurant, the Harvey 50. And, uh, no, I just uh, nice people. You enjoyed their company? Yes. Very. Now, did there come a time in 1998 when um, Julie started to describe to you some problems that she was having in, in the household? Uh, there was a few weeks. You know, I think so. It was about I was six weeks or five weeks before Julie died. I I noticed the difference. Noticed in her behave. So, what was the first time, if you can tell the jury, uh, what was the first time that you noticed that there was a change in Julie's behavior? Well, the, you know, the biggest thing was I was leaving to work, I remember the morning, and I was, you know, just getting ready, getting the stuff in my car, and I noticed that Julie was sitting in the front of the house on the bench, and she was, like, leaning down with her, with her hands out on the railings, and she was crying. So, you know, I just, because we've been friends, we talked a lot before, so I didn't hesitate, I just come up and I talked to her. Now, this occurred approximately how long before she died? I would say five, six weeks. I cannot tell you exactly, but that was about the time. It was fall already. So when you were talking to her, did you approach her or did she come over by you? I did approach her. I was very concerned I did approach her because I, she, I don't think so she didn't even see me. And when you approached her, as you got closer to her, um, what did you see? Well, when I approached her, I said she, she had her head down, the hands kind of spread out, and she was, you can hear her cry. And then she pulled her head up, 
she had tears on her face, you know, she was all red. And uh, we started talking, I started asking her what's going on with this, and she didn't want to say uh, what was the problem. She didn't want to just, you know, in the first thing. And uh, after uh, probably, I think a minute or two minutes of discussion, I asked her, she started uh, kind of waving her hands and saying the, the they had another big argument this morning. She had it with it. The situation in the house has got very intense. They will have a daily, daily arguments, a few, few times a day. You know, and, uh, and one of the biggest things she said, contribution to those arguments, is this started when Mark got his new job. I feel like kind of change. <coughs> And uh, and one of the things which she she said at that time at that moment, she said uh, she thinks Mark has got another woman, and that's why this thing is going on like this. That's why she's getting so much pressure from him. Did she describe to you, if you can recall, what kind of pressure Mark was putting on her? Well, one of this pressure was. Uh, uh, go get a job. He tell her to go get a job. This is one of the things. Uh, he thinks of uh, Douglas, the youngest son, put him in the daycare, which she really didn't want to do this. Because understanding they had in the house, which she told me, that uh, she was contributing to the, to the house by uh, babysitting, by uh, taking care of the kids. She was, you know, daily basis. I mean, she was really the kiss was the major thing for her. Did you ever, did you ever see Julie interacting with her children up until that point? Mm -hmm. Did you ever see what kind of a parent she was with her children? Oh, she was a great parent. She was really. The, I mean, you saw her every day with the kids, playing in the front, playing in the back, spending time in her garden. The kids will be there. The dog was there. You know. They're, Great picture. If you were to describe Julie as a parent, how would you describe her? Was she a good parent or a bad very, parent, a great very, parent? Very loving mother, very great parent. So how long did this, this, this conversation that occurred between you and Julie last uh, this morning, five or six weeks before she died? Yeah, it's probably less, around 45 minutes, half hour to 45 minutes even. And um, was she tearful during this entire thing, or was she just giving you no, her she side? Was, she was tearful in the very beginning, then she got really upset about it. That's why I said she was waving her hands. She, she didn't know what he wanted from her, because every time was always something. He will come up, and then by the time he gets from work, there were another argument and another argument. And, you know, it was a long time ago, I cannot remember everything that she told me, you know, but uh, one of the things, that's what she suspect, that he has someone, because he will go to O'Hare Airport for a business meeting, and he will stay there overnight for two days or three days period. And how long is O'Hara from uh, your residence? Well, depends how you drive, but I would say 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. I even I remember I had a discussion with Mark about it too. I said, you're going there and you're staying? I'm driving every day to Chicago and I'm coming back. And he said, well, that was it. What did he say? No. Okay. So um, after that conversation that you'd had with Julie that morning, uh, that lasted a half hour, 45 minutes, when was the next time that you saw or spoke with Julie Jensen? Uh, I would say probably the same, you know, afternoon, uh, around 3 or 4 o'clock the same day. You saw her again? Yes. And um, did you have occasion to talk with her at that time? Yeah, we, we did. We did. It just, like I said, we had talks on a daily basis. Sometimes, sometimes we didn't talk, you know, even before the six weeks. There was nothing new that we talked in the front of the house or something. or But just, just discuss different things. It was common for you to talk with Julie Jensen? on an almost daily basis? Yes. Now, in the 
weeks before you had this first conversation with her, this one you just described, yes. had you noticed any change in Julie's behavior or any change in the way she appeared? No. She was, uh, she did the, her things, which she always used to do. She had her uh, stuff to do every day. I would meet her on the back when she cut the grass or she worked on by the swimming pool or her garden. And it was, you know, she discussed about this, she discussed about different stuff. But it was, uh, you know, what they're going to do or, you know, or on the weekends. Because usually Mark was still sleeping and Julie and the kids were up in the front playing 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. So when you talked with her that afternoon, you said you'd had another conversation with her that afternoon. Did Julie appear to be in better spirits or about the same when you talked to her? Oh, she was down. That's why I noticed, I mean, there was that six weeks or five weeks, I mean, her behavior, she wasn't herself. I mean, she, you could feel she was under a lot of pressure. She seemed to be sad, more sad than you yeah, had seen her in the was, past? She was sad. I mean, she will, like I said, she will, like, look for a chance, an opportunity to talk to me just to get her, you know, just to talk to someone about her problems. And what would she say to you uh, when she talked to you uh, about those problems? What, did she amplify in the problems she described before? We had a foundation to time. Uh, <laughs> I should uh, put a time frame on the Well, question. let's talk about the conversation you had with her that afternoon. Uh, you said you, you'd spoken with her in the morning and yeah. she was crying. Uh, tell us what you can remember about the conversation that you had with her that afternoon. Well, I don't remember that much, but uh, she, mostly she repeated the stuff that uh, we were talking about that morning. Uh, her, uh, that she was suspicious that Mark was seeing somebody for sure. Now, and in the weeks that followed, did Julie continue to confide in you? Yes. Was there, was there any change in the things that she was telling you? What the chance was she was telling me, she's start noticing uh, changes in the house. Uh, one of the biggest uh, thing was, I mean, there was still they had their daily argument, but she was start suspecting Mark. Uh, one of the things was uh, the computer stuff, what he was doing on the computer, his research. What did she tell you about what uh, she suspected about Mark and the computer? Well. I remember the one of the conversation was that uh, I think so Mark went to work in the morning and then she noticed on his desk by the computer there was a uh, little notes like this little stick down two by two notes with a different size that's like three of them sticking in each other and there was a uh, sides uh, when Mark was going to work uh, for uh, different poisoning sites about the poison. So these were written on post-it notes? Yes. And they were just stick on the top of the, that's how she described it to me. As you're sitting here today, do you remember what the poisons were that she mentioned? No, no, I do not remember. I do not remember. And when, do, can you remember um, in relation to <coughs> that this conversation when she was describing these poisons, how much time had passed between the point where you'd first seen her crying like that in the front, that conversation as you described, and the point where she had this conversation with you about the poison sites? Oh, it could be a week, maybe less. I mean, she really got very suspicious. It's like she will do like her daily thing just to confront me, what she find out knew what he was doing on a daily basis. And she will just come out uh, the same afternoon or, or, or next morning. I remember sometimes I, I will go the same time I will leave to Chicago in the morning at 9, 15, 9, 30, and she will wait for me just to tell me what happened last night or she, what she found it. Like she will tell me that uh, the last night she was sitting, uh, I mean, she was vacuuming the house and, uh, and as she was vacuuming through the hallways and everything, she noticed that Mark was on the computer and doing the research. I mean, he was looking on the, on the screen about the poisoning and everything. And 
at the point, Mark got really suspicious because she was staring at the screen. He took his foot, and he just slammed the door, closed the door in front of her face. Yeah. And then there was now, when, they, when she described that conversation, yes. um, or when she was describing that <laughs> incident, do, uh, do you remember when that incident occurred in relation to the other uh, conversations you've described and in relation to her death? Uh, the time, the point, point, not really, but I would say there was probably in a week or, or so, in a week after the first conversation I saw her in, in the front. Okay, well, how much, if, if you remember when she was talking to you about um, how Mark closed the door with his foot yeah. when she'd seen that on the computer, how, do you, if you remember how much time elapsed between that conversation and the point where you discovered that Julie had died? I would say around four weeks, four weeks. And there was another occasion that, that she was very, she was very confused and scared because there was some times that Mark left to work and he left his computer on. And on the, on the screen of the computer, there was the, the website or uh, about the poisoning and everything. So then she will come out to me and talk to me about it, and she's like, I don't know what he's trying to do to me, if he's like, trying to scare me, he's playing with my mind, or he just forgot to turn it off. He will just leave it on all day long. For her to see it, or she, she couldn't figure out what was going on. Well, did she um, discuss with you what her various suspicions were? Yes. What, did she, what were the various suspicions that she had? Well, her very suspicious was if he that he's trying to uh, poison her, or he's trying to drive her nuts to take to to take away the kiss from her, because that's what one of the arguments they had that he was scaring her that he that she's she, she was an unfit mother, he will take the kiss away from her. And was that, um, how did Julie feel about the prospect of Mark taking the children away oh, from she her? Was, she was furious. She was really, she was really, I mean, she was really upset about it. And then one of the things was that, that Mark was pushing her, he said, pushing her to go get a job, go see a doctor, uh, put uh, doctors in the school. I mean, there was like daily talks between me and her about she was, telling me those things on a daily basis because that's the things they were arguing. She, uh, Mark, she said that Mark was pushing her to go see a doctor? Yes. How many times did she tell you about that, if you can uh, recall? I'll say it's got to be at least 5, 10, 15 times, a lot of times. Were, how would you respond when she would at, when she would voice these suspicions that um, either Mark was trying to poison her or Mark was trying to drive her crazy? Did you offer an opinion on what he was trying to do, or did you? Well, yeah, we, we had a discussion. I told her to contact the police, and uh, she actually, I think she did at the time, did contact the police. I think so. It was uh, Mr. Cosman or somebody, and uh, but uh, she wasn't sure what really is going on. She didn't want to come out on the top like she's losing her mind or she's really going to get killed and she's going to get poisoned. She just she, didn't know which it she was. She didn't know which one is. She was thinking that, well, what happened if he's just playing with me just to take the kids away? And at the same time, she was fear about her life. If this is true, what he's doing. Because of, like, he will leave that screen on or some other things. Yeah. In the weeks, uh, as, she got, uh, as these discussions continued, in the weeks that got closer and closer to the day, her, day of her death, did any of these, did she have additional things that she offered you or not? Uh, well, what the daily, like I said, daily discussion, she, there was, I remember one morning, she came up to me and she was really upset. Uh, I think so, Mark was out of town. And she said, you know what happened? He, we had an argument like three or four in the morning. He will call me three in the morning. And uh, and then finally you know, I realized that somebody's calling, so I picked up the phone and, and he started arguing with me. 
you know, where, where you been? What have you been doing? Why are you didn't answer the phone? And, you know, and he's, Sorry, my disc player is struggling. Expect me something. I'm just going to pause it for a moment. Hopefully, that'll let it catch up. Okay, I'm going to try playing it and see what happens. Oh, and he will check on her this way. So that was a time when he was out of town? Out of town. This, this was a... Oh, I was... A, so, Judge, I'm going to try to take it back and see if it can catch up on the disc player. <laughs> Douglas in the school. I mean, there was like daily talks between me and her about it. She was telling me those things on a daily basis because that's the things they were arguing. She, uh, Mark, she said that Mark was pushing her to go see a doctor? Yes. How many times did she tell you about that, if you can uh, recall? I'll say it's got to be at least 5, 10, 15 times, a lot of times. Were, how would you respond when she would at, when she would voice these suspicions that um, either Mark was trying to poison her or Mark was trying to drive her crazy? Did you offer an opinion on what he was trying to do, or did you? Well, yeah, we, we had a discussion. I told her to contact the police, and uh, she actually, I think she did at the time, did contact the police. I think so. It was uh, Mr. Kosman from somebody, and uh, but uh, she wasn't sure what really is going on. She didn't want to come out on the top like she's losing her mind or she's really going to get killed and she's going to get poisoned. She just she, didn't know which it she was. She didn't know which one is. She was thinking, that, well, what happened if he's just playing with me just to take the kids away? And at the same time, she was fear about her life, if this is true, what he's doing. Because of, like, he will leave that screen on or some other things. Yeah. In the weeks, uh, as she got, uh, as these discussions continued, in the weeks that got closer and closer to the day her, day of her death, did any of these did she have additional things that she offered you or not? Uh, well, what the daily, like I said, daily discussion. She there was I remember one morning, she came up to me and she was really upset. Yeah, I think so. Mark was out of town, and she said, "You know what happened? He." We had an argument like three or four in the morning. He will call me three in the morning, and uh, and then finally you know, I realized that somebody's calling. So I picked up the phone and and he started arguing with me. You know, where, where you been? What you been doing? Why you didn't answer the phone? And, you know. So, Judge, there appears to be something that starts skipping at 23 minutes and 37 seconds, so I think I'm going to have to try another copy of this. Can we take a short break? All right, let's take a short break to see what happens.
All right, we're back on the record on the Jensen matter. The appearances are the same. The jury is back in the courtroom. We had some technical difficulties with exhibit number nine. With that, Ms. McNeil, are we ready to proceed again? Um, yes, we are, Your Honor. I apologize for the delay, and we are restarting at 23 minutes and 31 seconds. All right, go ahead. Start arguing with me. You know, where, where you been? What have you been doing? Why are you been answering the phone? You know, and he's like, he's suspecting me of something, or, or, you know, and he will check on her this way. So that was a time when he was out of town? Out of town. This, this was a fall, I would say, two and a half, three weeks before her death. That's when this, the pressure, you can start seeing the pressure and the worry on her face. Um, did she ever describe to you any circumstances under which Mark would try to get her to eat or drink anything? Yes, I think so. There was a, <clears throat> it's about two weeks before her death, there were, she was really, really worried to eat anything in the house or drink in the house. Uh, one of the things was that uh, Mark came home from work and he was offering her drink, uh, I don't know what was it, but he was after her to with the drink and, uh, and she wouldn't take it. And it was very suspicious to her, that's what she told me, that uh, I never got anything from Mark. Every time Mark walks into the door, I have to serve him, I gotta give him, you know, it was a daily basis, routine. Mark walks in, I handle him and his drink, but it never was opposite. So that's why she, with this other stuff, that she was finding out with the poison size, and him offering him her that drink was very, very difficult. Or, you know, and I said two weeks before her death, she, she had some uh, problems because she was telling me she was throwing up. She, she, she was really upset and shaking and everything. So she told you at some point before Mark, before she died, yeah. that she had been ill, that she'd been vomiting. Yes, yes. And you, and how you have an estimate as to how much time that was I before would say she about died? Two weeks, because I remember I, I, I told her to maybe just go to a local store down the street, <coughs> and get a sandwich or some other stuff. You know. You so suggested that she go somewhere else yes. to get something to eat. Yes. And do you know whether she took you up on that advice? I really don't know. I think so. One of the times she did. I think so. That was one of the times she said she just went and got a jelly, peanut jelly sandwich or something. Yeah. How many times, if you can recall, did Julie tell you that Mark was trying to pressure her to go to see a doctor? Or that means you can answer the question, okay. sir. Do you remember uh, how many times? Uh, was that more than once, or how many oh, times? Yes, it was more than once. There's more than once. That's, that's one of the dis discussions, the arguments they had on a daily basis. They will argue, that's what she will tell me. There was a lot of pressure from Mark to go see a doctor, put the Douglas in the, in, in, in the daycare, and uh, go get a job. And I think so she was talking about even looking in a school or some other place putting application, you know, and she really didn't want to do it. She wanted to stay with the kids. That's what she wanted to do. Did she ever indicate to you what Mark was telling her as to why he wanted her to go see a doctor? No, no, she never, he was just pressing her to go to the doctor. Did she ever indicate to you why she was reluctant to go see a doctor? No. Um, well, were there, can you tell us uh, if there were any additional conversations that you had with Julie Jensen in the weeks or two before she died? Well, like I said there was a lot of conversation, but I think there was like a one about a week. week or, it's got to be two weeks. I two, it was like that two weeks before she died. And I mean, she was really, she was really scared. She, she, <coughs> I think it was in the morning, on Saturday or Sunday morning, she, she got up 
and uh, and she told me what happened last night. What did she tell you? That uh, Mark that that night he was like chasing her with a glass of wine. He brought her a, a glass of wine and asked her to drink. It. And uh, at the same time that night, uh, one of uh, in her bedroom, one of the drawers, a nightstand, one on the side of the bed. I don't remember which side. She said it was like cracked open, like three inches or four inches open, so she could see what was inside. There was a couple of syringes laying there in the nightstand, and she was really, really upset about it. And and the Mark was following her with this wine. Whatever she made him move, she didn't want it. Then he will like come to the bedroom, put it next to her, will drink it, have a this, and then he brought the bottle of wine. And they, she said, they finally she didn't want to drink it. I think that this was like going on to three in the morning. They had a huge fight, and she wouldn't drink it. But she was afraid that he put something in the wine, and then he's going to inject her with something else. That's why those syringes were there. In the <coughs> was there ever a time uh, in, before Julie died where she gave you something to hold? Uh, there was, I think, so that that... that what happened now, that was, I think, on Saturday morning or something. And she kind of knew she's not going to, she wasn't even sure she's going to make it over the weekend. That, what, did, what did she say to you? Well, she was scared she's going to die. She's going to poison her. Somehow something happened. He, she, she's not going to make it to Monday. And what did she say, what did she do then? Well, I, th I think so it was like 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock, I don't remember, it was afternoon. We had one of those talks in the front of the uh, house, kind of the side of the house with their bedroom. They, they, they got little bushes there, and uh, we were talking. It was a little fence, and and I had a coat, and she was just standing crying. I, I didn't believe something's going to happen. I knew there was something going on, but, you know, You know, you cannot imagine somebody's going to die. Did you ever offer Julie any type of assistance? Yes, I did offer her assistance. I, I, I think so. One of her first of assistance, I think so, was that I was talking to her on a daily basis, and she could, you know, she could spill her gut. <coughs> she could relax a little bit. She has someone to talk. The stuff they were bothering her, eating inside, you know, all night or all day. She could tell them someone, you know, about it. And I think that was really big thing for her because what I know is it's like she will like wait. She will wait for me sometimes in the I had a little shop in the back of my house. And she will wait there. See if I'm gonna come out or I gonna do anything so she could just approach me. Just, just talk to someone. What's going on? Did you ever um, offer uh, to allow her to use uh, any of your other properties to yes, stay? Yes, I did. I did. I think it was uh, like a, a week before her dad. I really stuff really got intense. I mean, sorry, I didn't realize when you said sir. this stuff gets very intense, very heavy, and uh, and that was on the both sides behave, marks and her because. I think so. I wouldn't even, Mark wouldn't talk to me or I wouldn't talk to him at least two, three weeks before her death. He was like even ignoring when he passed me or something. He wouldn't even say hi, just walk. He didn't hear, he didn't see anything. So it's like both sides knew what was going on, but nobody was talking to each other. They when um, you offered to allow Julie to stay at one of your property. Which property was it? It was you... a property in Lily Lake. I had a, uh, we just purchased this property. It was a summer house, cottage. I offered Julie, I think so, a few thousand dollars at that time. I said, I give you the money if you feel so bad because she was really scared. She was scared. 
she's so special on her face. She was, she didn't know where to go, where to turn. Now, Mr. And Boyd, she, Mr. Boyd, when um, you offered her, so you offered her a couple thousand dollars and yes. you said she could stay at your yes. lake, lake home. And when did this conversation occur in relation to her death? I think so. It's got to be a week before her death. And when you made that offer to uh, Julie, how did she reply to that? Well, well, how she replied? She still wasn't sure all the way if whatever is happening is really the truth, or Mark is just playing with her mentally, just to tr trying to get take away the kids. I mean, she wasn't sure all the way. She was still hoping. That it's just the, the mind play. That he's just, you know, she had, it, you know, but she was uh, afraid about her life. There's no question. What was the last conversation that you can recall ever having with Julie Jensen? I think so it was uh, Sunday. I think so it was Sunday before Julie J died. It was in the morning. Uh, me and my wife, we were in the front, you know, we, we spent a lot of time in the front of the house with the kids playing. And we know this, uh, Julie and Mark was with, with their kids. And uh, we look at them, they were, I think so they were getting ready to go for a walk. Um, you know, I can picture the, 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 the whole event, how they were standing. Mark, they were very close to each other, like nothing happened. Everything was fine. Mark had his hand around her, and they went for a walk. I think so. Douglas was with them. They went for a walk, and I remember my wife said, it, and she says, "Well, you see, everything is fine. Everything turning okay. It's just, you know." You, you, and your wife had talked about what was going on in the Jensen household. Yes, I think so. Uh, the first time when it, it happened, that the first thing in the six weeks or five weeks when I, uh, I. I talked to Julie, and I, at the same time, I went to tell my wife what was going on. She, kind of, my wife advised me, and she was kind of upset. There's no factual assertion so far, Your Honor. Well, um, as of this point, but why don't you ask another question? Well, because I wanted to hear what Margaret, I happen to know what she said, and it's not a factual assertion, and it's not being offered for the truth ask of the matter. Ask another question to get him talking again. Okay. Um, so tell us, uh, let's get back to the Sunday morning, the, yes. the last time you saw Julie, uh, spoke to Julie alive. Um, uh, the last time you saw her, the last time I you spoke that to her. That was actually not the last time. I still talked to her on Monday very briefly. But that Sunday we had, a, I would say, 45 minutes to an hour conversation. So you and your wife had seen Julie and Mark and the children together? Yes. And what was your impression when you saw them together? It was like... You wipe out this 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 six weeks part of their life like everything was normal, like it was before we know them. They were just going for daily walk as a whole family. He was, I mean, Mark was just you know normal. So, your, what were your hopes at that point when you saw yeah, the everything family? Everything's fine. Everything got kind of worked out between them. Maybe this was really the whole thing was her uh, just worry. What's, what's going on? Well, what happened then later that after you'd seen them go off on this walk? Well, they went to the, for their walk, and I don't know, maybe half hour later or something, they came back. They, 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 and Mark was playing with the kids in the driveway. To, they were shooting hoops. And, oh yeah, they went, their dog was with them too. They had a yellow. Dog. And uh, Julie turned kind of around. She, I would say she was 50 feet from Mark, at least 50 feet. And, uh, and, and, and I asked her a question, so everything is fine, everything is okay. And she just started crying. She was just started crying and shaking and everything. And, and at the same time, she will play a game, I mean, she, did nothing happen. She will throw a, a fake toy, a bone, I remember, to the dog. 
So he will fetch and bring it back and forth. And so Mark wouldn't know this, what was really going on. And I, I, I remember I used to just say, Julie, stop, stop. He's going to know this. Don't, don't do this. He's looking this way. And, you know, and she was just on and on. And she says, nothing. No, I ask her, so everything's fine. She says, no, it's opposite. We're still having, you know, the same problems, even more. Not the same stuff, nothing changed. Did you make any offers of assistance at that time? Oh, I told her, you know, get the hell out of the house. Leave. And what did she say? No, she, she wouldn't leave because of the kids. She wouldn't leave, she wouldn't leave the kids. There's no way. You said you spoke to Julie on Monday? Yes, I think so. I did talk to her on Monday. I'm sure I did talk to her. Do you remember her. anything about that conversation? No, it was just a brief, very short conversation. I know she was telling me that that day or next day, I think so, she was going to the doctor. She finally she, that she agreed to go to the doctor. You don't remember anything beyond that, though? Oh, well, no, there was things that the, uh, one of the things was that uh, Douglas was going to daycare or babysit. I think so, daycare. She still didn't like it, but she did it anyway. She, she, no. She's, and then she was looking for a job. Yeah. Can you tell me what you remember about December 3rd? Uh, December 3rd. I know on December 2nd, Julie talked to my wife, that I know. On December 3rd, I remember in the morning, uh, I think so, met Mark in the front of the house, was going on the side door to the front main door to the house. He didn't even look up to me. He was from me, I would say, 40 feet. He didn't, like, you know, he was very cold, very just, just, it said, I don't know you, I don't want anything to do with you, you don't even exist, you're not there. <coughs> That's the way I, I felt. And then, and then I went to Chicago, I think so we talked to my wife on the phone a couple of times, okay? and I think so on my way back home, it's got to be one thirty or 2 o'clock, I seen Mark driving our neighborhood by the stop sign. He was sitting in his SUV. I think at so the time he had a black SUV, Yukon or something. He had a white shirt on it. He was very spread inside the car. He was very <coughs> relaxed. His hand was... He was spread in the car. He was very relaxed, sitting, like, laying in the back. His hand was like this on the other seat. He had his white shirt. He didn't even see me. He didn't wave. And we just missed past each other. He just turned left, and he just went someplace else. And then I think so, and I came home, I talked to my wife, and, uh, and we really had a discussion because one of the things was that uh, it was suspicious to me that Mark stay home because as long as I know Mark and Julie, <coughs> that's one of, one of the things that Julie would say. Mark was very cold about stuff. He will never miss a day of work. Even if she was sick or she had some problems, well, or her dad died or something, he wouldn't take a day off to go to the funeral or wake or something with her. It just, you know, you deal with it, you know. And, uh, and one of the things I really remember to today, that it was the middle of the day, and there are lights, outdoor lights, on the side of the house, in the front of the house, they had a little door on. And I was really telling my wife, is something wrong? It's like a signal or something. Why don't you call her? Find out what's going on. She said, "No, I, you know, we just had a discussion." And then I said, <coughs> "Again, I don't know. It's got to be after two or three o'clock." Pulling out of his driveway again and turning south on the Lakeshore Drive, going with his SUV. What's the next thing you remember seeing or or hearing on December third? Um, on the temperature, okay, we, I can't, I want to pick it up my daughter from school, and by, when we pull in our neighborhood, the stop sign, 
we just know this from far away is the flashes of lights, emergency vehicle, uh, police, people standing on uh, across the street, people standing in the front of the street. It was, it was quite a bit, it was, you know, kind of darkish, quite a bit of people out there. And uh, I went home and and I went to the and I kind of know what to happen. And I was standing with uh, Jim Ashley, my neighbor across the street, and uh, one of the officer at that time came out and he started asking a question, are we the neighbors this or that? And I asked him, is she there? He didn't want to answer to me. And then Jim looked at me and finally said, is she there? She said, and finally he admitted, yes, she said. And he started asking me my name. I just walked away. I couldn't take it anymore. Just went home. <clears throat> Do you remember um, making any observations concerning any activities in that house the next day, around that house the next day? One of the things really struck me that I think it was the next day. I don't remember what time it was. It was afternoon or evening. I just don't remember. You know, we, we was you know we was very suspicious what was going on because I think so. We did me and my wife because Julie asked us even not to tell like a, a neighbors across the street what was going on in their personal life that they had a problem. Just to, you know, so actually me and my wife was mostly involved with her problems and my problems. We knew about it. And we were just watching the house from, uh, there was a police there, and Mark father. And uh, Mark came out of the house, I think so the police was leaving the house, giving him uh, free and clear house so he could move back to the house. And Mark was walking down the driveway and his father was approaching him and they give each other high five. It was to us it was like, you know, it's like, you know, you happy? You know, what are you celebrating? Did you notice um, any different vehicles coming and going from the Jensen house um, in the weeks following Julie's death? Uh, there was a lot of cars. I would say i seen different cars. One of the cars, I think there was a babysitter. She was about 17, 18 years old, uh, young. She had a red hairdo and she was driving a light blue car. I saw her in the beginning, I don't know how soon was that, but I seen it a lot there. Then another car was actually pulling into the garage. That's what we know is Julie guys were sitting like uh, on the outside. They had a little side driveway on the side of the garage. The little Toyota was sitting there. And uh, there was, a, I think so, midnight blue Honda Accord or something. Was being put in the dry, in the garage. Yeah, it was just like somebody uh, had a garage opener because the door went up, the car went inside, and I didn't know who was in, who was. Uh, you know. And this is a car that's being parked in the space where Julie's car had been parked. Yes, I think so. I think and so. Um, how much time elapsed between the point where Julie died and the point where you saw this car being parked in the space where Julie's car was usually parked? It's got to be in a week to two weeks. It's got to be in it. I mean, it was too long, too far. I cannot remember. But that's what uh, I noticed. And, and the one, in, one of the point even, we kind of, because we know he has somebody, we talk about it, and he came up to me, he said, that was the babysitter. And we kind of laughed about it because I didn't see any babysitter. We discussed the stay overnight. So. Um, 
This person you described or referred to as Mark Jensen, do you see him anywhere in this courtroom today? Mark Jensen? Yes. Yes. Could you point to him and describe what he's wearing? Okay. Thank you. Um, did, did Julie ever tell you where she found these notes that you made reference to? Yeah, she found them on his desk. And um, did you ever give any advice as to what she should do about those notes? Uh, one of the things was that she should uh, take the pictures of those things, the screen, the notes, and uh, give it to the police. And to your knowledge, did she do that? Yes, she did. Well, how do you know that she took those photographs? Uh, because she told me. What did she tell you? Uh, I took the picture of the photographs and I tried to contact the police to give it to them. And um, what did she tell you what happened when she tried to call the police? Uh, she, she said that she called the police. I remember very clearly. She said, I called the police and uh, they wouldn't want to talk to me because I did have a sign uh, policeman, uh, Officer Cosman, to me. And at the time, he wasn't present. He went for a, that's what she said. She, he went for a, they told her that she, he went for a fishing trip. He's going to be back on Monday. <coughs> And to them, did they want to talk to her or, or you know, did he come back? Did she tell you what, or did you suggest her what she should do with the, with the photographs then? I really didn't. Do you know what she ever did with the film that she had? I, she she uh, gave it to my wife. Um, did you ever see... Uh, or know of Julie discussing these photographs with the officer? Yes, I did. Tell us what you know about that, what you know personally, what personally, you saw. Well, I was uh, from the back of my uh, little art studio going to the front of the house. <clears throat> we had a little side driveway between, I mean, a walkway between our house and their house. When I noticed that Julie was, there was a police car parked in the front of their house, and she was talking to the policeman. Did and you know who the policeman was? Had you ever seen him before? Yes. Who was it? Mr. Cosman. It was Officer Cosman. Okay. Yes. What did you see then? Uh, she talked to him, and uh, he was kind of upset, you can see, by, because they had a like, kind of loud talk or aggravation or something. It wasn't one. And the same time they were like finishing their talk and she was leaving the car and walking towards me and she was really upset and she makes a mark like this. He thinks I'm crazy because he, he what do you want me to see on this picture? What do you want me to do this, this? Because of, I think there was a reflection of the flash. He couldn't see, he, he, he couldn't tell anything or was, on those pictures. So she was really upset about it. And Your Honor, just to complete the record, request the record show that when the witness was saying she was d doing like this, he was taking his right hand and moving his index finger in a circular fashion around his ear as though uh, the common usage is that uh, he thinks that she's crazy. Any no. dispute to that characterization? No. All right. <clears throat> Did Julie, in the years preceding her death, ever talk to you about any harassing activity that uh, she was experiencing at her house? Well, she wouldn't talk to directly about it, but there was, a, I would say, a couple of accidents that happened at the house, that's what we noticed, and after we talked to Julie, and I think so on one occasion I did talk to Mark, and one occasion I talked to one of the officers that was present on my yard in the middle of the night that, that it happened. It's not being offered so much for the truth. Okay. What did Julie tell you about this activity? Uh, actually, I did approach to her and said, well, what happened? Why the police was in your, in your house? And what did she say? And she said, well, we went shopping. By the time we came back, it was like middle of the day. 
I think so it was a weekend, and that when I come back, there was a bunch of furniture knocked all over the house, broken things, like somebody entered the house, and it was, that was it. And um, did she ask you if you'd seen anybody around the house? No, she did not. Okay. Had you seen anybody around the house? Yes, Who? I think so. Uh, I'm going to object to the relevance of, of the testimony. Overall. Well, Who did you see? I saw uh, Mark Jensen's father, cars in the front of the house. After they went shopping, his car showed up in the front of the driveway. The engine was running. He went to the house. Uh, two minutes. Then he will leave the house, and you can hear this this one of because they had a, like a kind of gravel. I remember on the half of the driver, the wheel was spinning, and he was really like taking off out of the house. And then, how much time elapsed between the point where you'd seen him leave the house in that fashion and the point where the Jensens came home? And the Jensen came maybe an hour or so later, and uh, and then the police show up. <coughs> And one of the nights, uh, me and my wife were sitting home, watching a movie. We had a kind of nice room on the back of the house, sun room, we were watching the movie, and then uh, it was 11 o'clock or so. Uh, we see somebody walking all over our yard. We've been with the fence. We had a fence going between two properties, but I think so one section, we didn't do it in the back because of the kids still passing, seeing each other. And I came out, I said, what's going on? And there was a one, it was a policeman there. And that's what he told me that uh, there was, they reported that somebody was in the backyard throwing things into the swimming pool. And you hadn't observed anything? No, it was fine. We were sitting, we didn't hear, we didn't notice nothing. There was some noises or something. And then I talked to Mark next day. Mark told me that somebody took one of the Kids tricycle, bicycle, and throw into a into a swimming pool, and that was it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Voigt. I don't have any further questions. You want to stop now, yeah, Mr. Voigt? Start. Stop. It starts. This will be a good time to take our lunch break. One fifteen, folks. Have a good lunch. Thank you. He's holding a jury, so let's take the defendant back. So take care of that issue. Again, 115. Have him brought back. I will give you a call when the jury's back.
kick. Bring them out. We're uh, back on the record then. Mark Jensen, the appearances are the same. We're continuing at exhibit number nine, watching the video. With that, Ms. McNeil, we can start it up again. You lived next door to the Jensens uh, prior to Julie's death for about six years, is that right? Even more. So I'll say six years. Yes. Okay. I I wasn't clear whether you moved in, and I, I had understood you to say 1992. Was it earlier? Well, I think so. I don't remember. I'll have to look. You know, you know when did they move in there? But uh, I'll say 92. During that time, you had lots of contacts with both Mr. Jensen and Mrs. Jensen. Yes, I did. You did things like go fishing. With Mark Jensen, right? Yes, we went, I'll say, two, three times fishing. And uh, your families, uh, especially in the summer, might cook out together? There was a couple of times that we had dinners together. Spent some time in, in his backyard by the pool. You'd speak, speak with him on a regular basis? Yes. Right. Uh, talked with him hundreds, if not thousands of times yes. over those years? Yes. Right. Uh, <clears throat> got along with him fine as a neighbor? Yes. You had a chance to observe him with his children, correct? Yes, I did. And uh, fair to say that he was a good father? I'll say yes. He was a good father. He was a loving father? I'll say yes. He, they see him always playing with the kids, spending a lot of time with them. You'd see them. You were aware that he'd take his son David fishing? Right? Yes. You'd see him outside swimming in the pool, right? Well, we hear them swimming in the pool, laughing and, you know, screaming. It was, you know, yes. They'd walk the dog together, right? Yep. Good thing. And uh, prior to the fall of 1998, uh, you really didn't observe much in the way of problems in the Jens in the Jensen family, right? Major problems or just problems? No, you didn't see any major problems, no, right? I didn't. The, uh, in terms of, and you had, on a number of occasions, you saw Mark's interactions with Julie Jensen, right? Yes. You never saw Mark be physical with Julie, right? Never, never did see. And in her conversations with you, she never, she never made any such claim like that, right? She never did. During the six or more years that you lived next door to the Jensen's, uh, you never even really saw Mark angry, did you? Uh, there was I saw a couple of times he was upset. We had an argument. Maybe two times? 
Yeah, I mean, at times that I remember, that I recall it, he was uh, very angry. I remember when I was buying the lot next door from them that he had to sell it because he lost a job and uh, Julie wasn't working at the time. And she could have been working. So he was, he was upset in 1991 about the, <clears throat> during some time of financial distress. Yes. Is that right? And even then, you didn't hear him yelling or screaming about that, right? No. And uh, did you say there was some other time in those six years when you saw him? Yeah, I Perhaps think so. there was a, one of the times I was uh, going into his house. I, went, I was coming into his garage inside the house. And at the same time, Mark came out, and he was... They had an argument. He was really upset. He was really, you know, pissed. And and what is it that made you decide that he was he was angry? Well, he told me about it. He did, there was something about a uh, uh, trip, family trip. They uh, supposed to go together, and Julie didn't want to go. So he he was uh, he was upset that. Uh, he and he and Julie could not go out on a family trip together. Yeah, the, the, he blamed her that uh, she wouldn't, she wasn't like um, his friend's wife. That they would go together places, and she didn't want to go with him. And he he thought that was important that they go on a trip together. Yes. And so those are the two times that you saw Mark Jensen angry in the That's sixth. That's the times so I just would say yes, I remember. In the, six, in the six plus years that you lived next door to him. On December 4th, 1999, uh, Mr. Boyd, you spoke with Detective Ratzberg here? Yes, I did. Detective Ratzberg wrote a written statement for you, right? Yes, he did. And have you also seen a police report that he prepared summarizing your conversations? I mean, before? At, <clears throat> let's see. He took a statement that he put in writing yes. and you signed it, correct? Yes, I did. And I'll tell you, I have a police report that summarizes things that you told him on that date. Okay. That's not signed by you. It's just it's a police report. Have you seen that police report? I think so, I did. And let me just hold it, hold it up to it. It looks something like this. Does that ring a bell? No, not really. It looks like any other page. Okay. It, but I mean, do you remember it being typed like, typed like this no. or not? Okay. All right. Um, did, you ever, did you ever tell uh, Detective Ratzberg that uh, Mark would not speak with you and he always kept to himself? Uh, yes. Uh, I told Mr. Ratzberg that for about, I'll say, four weeks to, I'll say four weeks or five weeks to Julie's dad, Mark separated himself from me, and I mean, he wouldn't talk to me. He he would just ignore it. He will just like didn't exist, even passing me, seeing me. That was the month of November, basically. Is that right? Yes. But during your seven years, six or seven years you were there, he didn't keep to himself, right? No, no. We had a regular conversation with, I would say, pretty good neighbors, friends. We talked about different stuff. During November, it's fair to say that people aren't outside as often as they are in July? No, I did stay, still see him. You know, because he always was in the front washing the car and doing some other thing, but it just, he wasn't there. He, I mean, I, like I described it before, I could pass him, you know, 10, 20 feet from him. He was still ignore, like, I'm not there, it doesn't exist. Well, Mr. Jensen's driveway was not right next to your driveway, correct? And I would say I, his driveway's got to be probably 35 feet away. Right. I mean, they're not right next to each other is what I'm saying, Mr. Boyd. Right? I mean, it's not like you have shared driveways or driveways that parallel right next yeah. to each other. True? 
And in, in November, Mark Jensen would work during weekdays, right? Yes. Um, and in November, on weekends, it would be much colder than it would be other times of the year, right? Not yes. And so you'd see him less frequently, fair to say? Yeah, I did see him frequently, but like I'm saying. Right, Mr. Voigt, yeah. did you see him less frequently in November than other times of the year? I'll see him on a daily basis. On a daily basis? Yes, I see him coming into the house. I see him uh, walking around the yard. So in November, Mr. Jensen would come home at when it was dark in November, wouldn't he, Mr. Voigt? Yes. And it would be dark out, and you'd be in your house, right? No, always. <coughs> so in the month of November, you're standing outside when it's dark out, uh, waiting for Mr. Jensen to come home to see if he'll no, talk to I you? No, I wasn't married to him. I didn't wait for him. I just see him there. I saw him uh, pulling his truck. I see him uh, just walking around. It just, to me, was different that we always did have the contact. And there's, like you said, six, seven years before, and we had some falls before, too. And I always see Mark. We always talk. We always have a good relationship. And then suddenly, it's like everything got cut off. Okay. Now, one thing that could be the case is you were suspicious based on what Julie had to say to you, right? Yes, I was suspicious. And that could have affected your perceptions of Mark Jensen, right? I really don't I'm sure there are times during those previous six years in which Mr. Jensen was in a hurry or something like that, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't be as friendly as he was normally, right? I don't know. I, he always was friendly. I cannot say he wasn't, even if he was sitting, he, like I said, it was dark, he will be sitting in his garage, we will have a chat, he will uh, work on his fishing rods or some other stuff. That was normal thing. Or he will come up uh, to my garage in the back, he will talk to me, I would different stuff. So your claim is every day when Mr. Jensen would come home, you had a conversation with him? Not every day, but I'll say sometimes we'll have a, a twice a day, sometimes we can have the two days. Here's my question, Mr. Voigt. In the evening, when Mr. Jensen comes home from work during the yes. month of November, you're claiming that you'd have a conversation with him no, for some I reason? No, I did not have a conversation with him that, that November. I did not. What? But the months before and the years before, yes, I did. Every single night? Not every single night, night like I said. Ever other? Why would you, especially on the weekends? Why would you be outside in the month of November, 1998, Mr. Voigt, at night? Uh, I had my garage in the back of my house. I used to. Uh, my hobby is uh, rebuild uh, antique cars. I used to walk all the time back and forth from the house to the garage in the back. And I meet a lot of times, Mark passing by, by the side of the house and the side of the pool, we met each other a lot. Mr. Boyd, let me just skip to a different subject for a moment. The Sunday before Julie Jensen passed away, you said you saw her on that day, right? Yes, I did. And you saw her Going for a walk with Mark? Yes. And David and Douglas? I think so, Douglas and a dog. I, I wasn't sure about the David. Maybe David was going to. They went for a walk. They went for a walk with the dog and their youngest boy. Yeah, and I maybe think the so. other boy. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know if all of them, but I know they went for a walk. Yes. And they returned to the house, right? Yes. You saw Mark? Outside playing basketball with his kids? Yes, he did. Julie was outside? Yes, she was. You thought everything was okay? Yes, I did. And Julie walked up to you and your wife, right? Yes. And she had her back to Mr. Jensen? Yes, she did. You said she was crying. Yes. She was turning around and I asked her a question if everything was okay. It's all right. Back to normal. And you and your wife pleaded with her 
not to cry because Mark might see her, right? Yes. Because you were afraid that Mark was going to find out that you knew about it, right? Yes. So Mark didn't know about it at that time, did he? About what? He didn't know that you had had conversations with Mrs. Jensen. He, he saw me talking to her. That's why he was afraid. You, that's why you were afraid he'd find out, is because he didn't know, right? About what? About the conversations. Well, I had a conversation every day with her, and I had <laughs> so was, he knew we were talking to each other because when he even passed, he gives me you know such a cold, dirty look that we were talking to each other. That was your perception, was that he was giving. No, it wasn't the perception. You can see in somebody's eyes, in the faces, expression. If Mr. Jensen knew, then you wouldn't be afraid that he'd find out, right? I, I'm telling, what Julie was telling me, and she was, she didn't want to Mark to find out about it that she knew what was going on. <clears throat> you were afraid that Mark was going to find out that you knew, right? Yes. And that's why you were pleading with her not to cry. Yes. Right. And. You knew, you had no information in living next door to this man for six or seven years. You had no information whatsoever from personal observation or from what Julie told you that he'd ever been a violent man, right? Yes. You had, you'd only seen him angry once or twice, right? Yes. In six or seven years? Yes. So, what did you think Mr. Jensen would do if he found out that, that you knew Julie was upset? Objection. Uh, how relevant? Unrelevant. How would I know what he's going to do? Well, I was going to direct the overall. I didn't hear your answer. I'm sorry. How would I know what he's going to do? Well, what were you afraid of? What? Well, I don't know. I was just afraid. I was just afraid. She, Julie didn't want nobody to know what was going on. She, she didn't. She when she approached me, she talked to me on this thing. She even told me, "Don't tell the neighbors across the street or somebody," because she just don't want to find out. Nobody else find out. Mark had been a reasonable man during those six or seven years, right? Yeah, but not for the past eight or seven weeks before that happened. Well, you were just saying it was four weeks. What's the difference? Four or five or six weeks? Well, I just. I was I, just before that day. His. The way he act, the way he walk, when he got this new job, he was well, like I'm a gonna, different man. This message. is beyond the scope of the question, Judge. I objection. I disagree. The answer was responsive. Uh, the answer may stand. Go ahead. First of all, you testified to four weeks, right? I don't remember that. If it's in it, yes. Well, that's what you test, just told Mr. Jamboys when he asked you, right? And yes. Because you said Julie began talking to you maybe five or six weeks before she died, right? About that matter, about the problem they had in the family problem between Mark and her. Right. Yes. Five she did talk to me before, normally, on a regular basis. Five or six weeks before she died is when she had that conversation, right? Yes. And in that conversation, she did not say she was concerned about poisoning, right? Yes, she was. In the very first conversation? Not in the very first conversation, but well, between five, six weeks in that time. Yeah, I think so. it was on the fourth week, week or third week before uh, her death. <laughs> yes. Mr. Boyd, I'm trying to find out what happened at various times, OK? So on. The first conversation you had, there was no talk about poisoning. No, it wasn't talk. It wasn't uh, talk about Mark uh, acting very. Uh, they had a lot of arguments that he had. That he, she sus suspected. She was sure that he was cheating on her. That he had another woman. Right. She was very upset and angry about his, uh, her belief that he had an affair. Right. Yes. And going back to this Sunday, Mr. Boyd, the yes. Sunday before she died, you've never seen Mark angry, 
violent or yelling at Julie Jensen, right? Yes. You'd never seen him get that way with you, right? Yes. He had been a good neighbor and friend for six or seven years, right? Yes. And when Julie Jensen told you about, I mean, you at first you thought these allegations were crazy, right? No. When she first I never told said you? That. No. Oh, so when, it, when she said, I'm fearful about my husband uh, <clears throat> killing me, your first reaction was, well, I can understand that. Oh, she never said that. She never said she was fearful about him killing her? Yes, she never said that in the beginning. Which time you want me to say it? Three weeks, four weeks? I think in the third week before her death, she said that. But in the beginning, no, she never did. So, why didn't you go to Mark Jensen and say, what's going on? Your wife is saying some very strange things. I don't know. I wish I did. I, I, I was. I didn't want to interview with their life. I didn't know what because, she, like I told, you, said before to everyone, that uh, Julie didn't believe herself what what is going on. This is really a, he trying to do something to her, or she wants to drive her nuts. That's what she she didn't she didn't know what's going on herself. She, she never. Told you, she told you. Yeah. That she didn't want you to talk to Mark, right? No, she didn't tell me that. But she told you not to talk to anybody, right? Yes. She told you not to talk to the neighbors, right? Uh, I think so. One of the neighbors, which she specifies, was uh, uh, Carrie Ashley across the street. <clears throat> you just told me she didn't want you to tell the neighbors, right? Yes. <clears throat> you offered her thousands of dollars? I offered her money. You testified on direct of thousands of dollars, didn't yes, you? Yes, I did. Is that true? Yes, it's true. You testified that she could go stay at your lake house, right? Yes. You offered her to go to the lake house, right? Yes, I did. You were willing to have her take her kids to your lake house, right? Yes. She said, what you testified to is that she was worried about the kids, right? Yes. And you said, you, of course, can take the kids to the lake house, right? No. What I said <coughs> that I offer Mrs. Jensen the money and the lake house. We never talk about the kids at that time. I told her, get the hell out of the house. That's what I did. But what was the reason she said no? The reason she said no, because she was afraid that if she's going to leave the house, Mark is going to take away the kids. From her, I thought she will had, never see the kids. Again. I thought Wait. when we had this conversation, she didn't say anything about the kids. No, no, no. The conversation was if she will take the kids to the house, lake house. So, during those six or seven years you lived next door, Julie Jensen had a car, right? She did. She could come and go as she pleased, right? Yes. You saw her come and go every day, all day, right? Yes, I did. You were aware that she had a checkbook, right? No, I wasn't aware of that. She seemed to go handle the, she handled the household affairs from what you observed, right? I seen her going shopping, bringing the grocery home. That's what I did. She never seemed to be wanting for money, right? No. Did you tell Detective Ratsberg on December 4th that uh, you believed Mark was controlling? Yes. But you can't identify one controlling thing he did during the relationship, can you? Why not? Mr. Boyd, what did you ever see Mark Jensen do that was controlling? Uh, I remember one of the things, uh, Julie was on the front uh, doing some gardening work and she had a big phone hooked up to on the side of her pants right here and and I, I asked her, what do you do with it? Well, Mark bought this thing for me 
So he can call me every five minutes, ten minutes. So he wants to know where I was, what I was doing. That's what Julie Jensen told you, right? Yes. Did you hear the phone going off every five or ten minutes? Yes, I did. Oh, you did, and, and Julie was talking. Not being to Mark? five ten, but it was half hour. Julie was talking on the phone, and again, Mark will call. Her. And you think there's something wrong with the husband calling his wife on the phone? Well, she made, she made, she was uh, upset about it. She was very upset about it. When because was if if she, if she went too far by the road, and she, the phone the reception wouldn't reach. He will get upset. Will worry. When was this? It was about two years before her death. Okay. What, a, her death. what else? What else did he ever do that? They, one there, of the one of the on. things. Mr. Boyd, hold on. Yeah. Let me clarify my question. What did you ever see? Not what Julie told you. What did you ever see Mark Jensen do that was controlling? Controlling. What I ever seen. That every time when Mark come home. The whole family always used to be outside. They were playing, they were doing stuff. When my Mark pulled to the driveway, it's like everybody disappeared out of the driveway and they went inside the house and we didn't see them again. Could that have been dinner time? No. It wasn't dinner time? I talked to Julie about it and Julie told me that uh, Mark uh, wants to have his uh, time with the family, it's his time after coming you know, from work, and uh, a lot of times we ask, uh, are you, what are you guys doing tonight, or what, what's happening later? She said, well, I don't know, nothing to Mark. She wouldn't make a decision, a statement, until she first talked to the Mark. And that's what made me that he is a controller. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sir, were you asked the following question, and did you give the following answer when you testified on July 5th, 2007, page 54, Line seven, question. My question is, did you ever hear or see him, him meaning Mr. Jensen, do anything controlling with Julie? Answer, no. Obje objection, this is not inconsistent with the witness's testimony, Your Honor. Overall. Did you give that answer? Yes. Question, and that was before September 1, 1998, and that was after September 1, 1998, correct? Answer, yes. Yes. <clears throat> this information you have all came from Julie, right? Yes. You didn't know if what she was telling you about Mark's wants and desires was true, correct? I believe her. I didn't ask you that. You didn't know whether it was true. I didn't know. She frequently was complaining about the marriage. Yes, she did. Did you hear Mark bad-mouthing the marriage? Uh, a few times. A few times over six or seven years? Uh, I guess just that summer we had a few conversations about it. I mean, they had normal things, normal, you know, nothing crazy. <coughs> they always complain about the cooking and some other stuff. The only time you really saw him upset was the one time in the garage, correct? Yeah, that's the time I remember in the moment. <clears throat> you never heard, for example, Mark Jensen demanding that Julie get a job, right? Well, he told me once. That he would like Julie to work? Yes. Did you ever hear him demanding that? No. You never heard him talking to Julie about that, right? Correct. You never heard him insisting that Douglas be in daycare all day, right? Right.
Did you understand Julie Jensen's family to live in Kenosha, that she had family there? Yes, she did mention. She had a brother that lived in town? Yes. You never met him at it prior to Julie's death, did you? Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I don't remember. You have no memory of ever meeting her brother who lived in Kenosha prior to her death, true? Sure. You have no memory of ever seeing her brother at her home during those years, right? Yes. That's correct? Correct. You did see Mr. Jensen's sister at the house from time to time, correct? Yes, I did. You saw his parents at the house from time to time? Yes. In this very first conversation that you had, with Mrs. Jensen, she said she believed her husband was having an affair. Yes. Did she say uh, anything other than the trips to Chicago as to the reason why she believed that? No. She said his his behave. She said that that they do have they argue and they uh, they argue like a normal family, but for the past few weeks, those <coughs> arguments will be three, four times, very tense argument in the morning and the evening, every time. And that's what she mentioned that was uh, started when he's got his new job. Fair to say during this first conversation with you, she was miserable? I don't know how to describe miserable, but she was crying. She was uh, upset. She was uh, disappointed. She was, you know, she didn't look good. You disagree with miserable? Maybe she was. Maybe. You recall testifying to that at the preliminary hearing? Page nine, line yeah. four? Yeah. Maybe she yeah, said, maybe she was miserable. Well, that's what you saw as somebody who was miserable, right? Yeah. Julie told you that she suspected Mark was doing something on the computer. Yes, she did. She said she was uh, vacuuming one day. Yes. Right? And that's the time that she said she saw something on the computer, right? Yeah, she, she well, described it to me. Let me <clears throat> I'm sorry, I inter interrupted. Maybe you weren't. Go on. That's the time she described seeing the computer, right? Yes. And what she said to you was that Mark was, Mark was in the room that had the computer in it, right? Yes. And you've been in you've been in the Jensen home. You knew which room that was, right? Yes. And that the door was three quarters of the way closed, right? Yes, that's what she described. And as she was vacuuming with the door three quarters of the way closed, she said she could see the screen of the computer, yes. right? And so she was standing there to see what he was looking at, right? Yes. And is this when she described seeing websites yeah. about poisoning? Yes. And she claimed he was looking at sites on poisoning and she looked through the door. Yeah, that's what she said. And then. He was, as he was sitting there and noticed her, he reached over with his foot and shut the door. Exactly correct. That's how she described it to me. She also told you that Mark Jensen left the computer on? Yes. Right? With what kind of, with what kind of information on the There's some poison sites or something she was telling me. And she saw it then? Yes.
two. Do you recognize that as the office in which the Jensen computer was? That's not his what he's saying. I don't think so. Maybe the bedroom right desk used to be sitting on this side. That what I remember when I went there with him. Excuse me, I, I didn't see where he's playing. Yeah. Well, I couldn't either. <laughs> <laughs> well, let well, me. I'm sorry. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Mr. Boyd. Yes. You do not recognize this as the office where the computer was? Uh, no. If the police took this photograph on the day of Julie Jensen's death, this still, this isn't what you remembered ever seeing? I don't seen. remember. I remember actually the office, I think so, after Julie's death because I went to Mark's house because he was some, doing some uh, training for me on the computer. And I remember uh, when I was sitting, what was his desk? That I remember. <clears throat> that was after Julie that this I do not remember. I know where the room is. Hold on. Okay. You don't recognize, you don't recognize this photograph. I don't. You don't know what this is. I only thing I recognize from this room is uh, the doors, the shades in his rooms. But, uh, and I know which room is it. The first room when you can walk into his house and the left side, first door. You go through the hallway. Is it, is it your claim there was no computer in this room? No, there is a computer in the picture, but I never seen in this room computer before. I, I wasn't going to their house like every day, but I don't remember. I'm oh. telling you what Julie described it to me how she was doing, what she was doing, and how the event happened. I just, I can't, I'm just trying to find out if you recognize this picture. I, it sounds like no. you Okay. Hello? Hunter, would you give us on the card? Sure. Thanks. Julie indicated to you that she was concerned that if she left Mark, she wouldn't get the kids? Yes. She was concerned that she would be viewed as unstable? Uh, she, what she told me, she would be viewed as an unfit mother. That's what he repeated her a lot of times. Did she, say, did she say why she was worried that other people would view her as an unfit mother? No, she never said that the other people, she said the Mark. During the conversation, did you press Julie on that? Did you did you say anything? No, I never Not pressed Julie. Really. You have to let me finish my question. During these conversations, did you say anything to Ju to Julie Jensen about other people would make the decision, not Mark, about what happened with the kids? Never did. She was worried that other people uh, might believe that she was losing her mind. She expressed that. I, I don't remember that. For what period of time did Julie, <laughs> there was a period of time in which Julie was expressing to you that she wasn't eating anything, right? Yes. When did she say that? I think so. She got like sick about two weeks to two to three weeks before the death. Mr. Boyd, <clears throat> you indicated on direct, and, and you were just suggesting it now, that two weeks before her death, she said she got sick. Is it two weeks? Two or three weeks? What is it? I will take a pick between two and three. I just want to know what the truth is, Mr. Boyd. It's not. Remember, this was nine years ago. I'm telling the best of my knowledge. That's what I remember. 
And that's what I remember. It was two to three weeks. Okay. And it is, I, nine, it is nine years ago. It's a long yeah. time, right? You gave statements to Mr. Ratz, Detective Ratzberg, the day after, on December 4th, right? Yes. And things were much fresher in your mind then, right? Yes. And you were suspicious when you talked to Detective Ratzberg on December 4th, right? You're suspicious about Mark Jensen? I wasn't suspicious. I, I just said it that Mark did it. Mark poisoned her. You were suspicious on December 4th, right? Objection. The question has been asked and answered. He volunteered something that wasn't directly answered. The objection is overruled. You were suspicious, right, on December 4th, yes or no? Yes. And, and so you knew it was an important <coughs> statement you were giving to Detective Ratsburg. Yes. And you told him everything you could remember that was important, right? Yes, I did. And he wrote down the information, right? Yes, he did. And you signed a statement, correct? Yes. You testified at a preliminary hearing in this case, correct? Yes. That was back in 2002? Yes. You testified to everything you could remember that you were asked about, right? Yes. After the preliminary hearing in July of 2002, a typewritten statement was prepared for you that you signed, correct? Yes. You signed that statement, true? Yes, I signed whatever they gave me. Yes, I did. And that also was as complete as you could make it in July 2002, right? Well, I don't know if I can answer that, but, you know, on the first statement... Well, I'm not asking about the first okay. statement right now, sir. Did you try to give as much information as you could in that July 2002 statement? To the I was Texas saying Expert? everything what I knew at the time, what, and what they asked me. And then you testified in July... 2007, right? Yes, sir. And prior to that testimony, you spoke with Mr. Jamboys, right? Yes, I did. You went over everything you knew, right? I don't know everything, but uh, whatever they asked me. They asked me the question, I answered the question. My best knowledge. And at no time during that statement to Detective Ratsford, December 4th, 1998, during the written statement that you gave in July 2002, during your preliminary hearing testimony in 2002, or during your testimony in July 2007, did you ever say anything about Julie telling you that she got sick and vomited two or three weeks before her death, right? I did say that. In I did say, on the, I think, so on the first uh, statement. <coughs> in the first statement, I did say a lot of things. Mr. Ratzberg was in our house for over two hours. Julie ever tell you that she had been treated for depression? No, she never did. Did she tell you why she went to the doctor on December 1st? Uh, no, she never did. Did she tell you why Mark wanted her to go to the doctor? No, she just was telling that Mark wanted her to go to the doctor for the past few weeks. You told, you told Julie Jensen at some point that maybe she should call police, right? I think so, I did. And her answer was that she's been already talking to the police. 
She told you she called Officer Cosman and left a voicemail, right? Yes, I think she called the police department and he wasn't there. Mr. Boyce? Yeah. Did she tell you that she called and left a voicemail for Officer Cosman? Yes. She said that Officer Cosman wouldn't be back for several days, right? He'd be back like on Monday or something. She said that she left a message for Mr. Cosman even though she feared not living through the weekend, right? Yes, I think so. And around the same time she gave this film to your wife, right? Yes. Undeveloped film, right? That you have to talk to my wife. Were you home when Julie came over and retrieved the film? No. But Julie told you that at some point she came over to your house and got that film from your wife and brought it back to Officer Cosman, right? No, she didn't. Julie never told you about that? No. My wife did, but she didn't. And you say that Officer Cosman came back with the developed photos. That's what Julie told you, right? Yes. So he came back a second time, right? Yes. So Julie told you he'd been there a first time when she gave him the photos and then came back the second time when they were already developed, right? Yes. Officer Cosman, you saw him talking to Julie Jensen. Yes, I did. When he came back with those developed photos, right? Yes. It's your testimony that you saw him do the twirl around the, the ear to suggest... No, was, she did it. She did that. She did it as she was approaching me. To suggest that Officer yeah. Cosman was... Saying yeah, she was crazy. Yeah, she she was crazy. What do you want me to see? That's what was exactly what she said. What do you want me to see? It? I didn't see anything, you know. And then she said he thinks I'm crazy. He. That's you what she said, told me. You said it was because the photos were blurry. No, she didn't say it because he. Well, he told her I couldn't see anything on the photo. What do you want me to see? Didn't you say something on direct examination about being a problem with the photos, that they're overexposed or that there's some problem with Yeah, the there movie? was something, there was, uh, uh, she mentioned one that, that she took, I don't know how many films, there was about the, the flash or something, when she was taking the uh, screen, computer screen or something. So. Did you ever see any such photo? No, I never did. You have no personal knowledge whether she ever took such a photo, right? Only I did see in those rolls of films in my house. But you have no specific information as to what she took photos of, right? No. Did you ever go to Julie Jensen's house to look at the computer? No, didn't. Did she ever show you the computer? No. Did she ever try to show you any of these syringes that supposedly exist? No. Did she ever try to show you any of Mark's notes? No. All the information about the marital problems and everything else, that all came from Julie, right? And some of it came from Mark. Well, you weren't talking to Mark in the fall of 1998, right? I think so. I did once when I told you they had a big argument about going that vacation trip. And Julie didn't want to go. And she gave her me why she didn't want to go. And he was upset that she didn't want to go. And it's Julie that was giving you the information about the marriage, right? She talked to you dozens of times about the marriage, right? Yes, she did. Dozens of times, right? Yes. Mark maybe talked to you once, right? Yes, I would say yes. And, and Mark's concern was that they didn't go on some trip that he wanted to go on with his wife, right? Yes. She rejected, she rejected all of your offers of assistance, true? Yes, she did. That first day when you saw Julie Jensen outside, she was, she was outside, right? Yes. She was on her porch. On right? the front porch, yes. By herself. By herself. In the month of uh, October, right? Yep. She knew what time you left for work each day, right? Yeah. 
you'd either leave before rush hour or right after what you considered rush hour, right? Uh, I used to leave around 9, 9.15, no later than 9.30. She was aware of that from being your neighbor for six or I seven I really years. don't know if she was aware of that. And I know one thing that me and Mark, Mark used to leave like whether to nine yeah, or eight. Yeah, the scope of the question. Yeah, ask another question. Are you saying she wasn't aware of what time you left each day? Because I used to go different, uh, different times every day. Sometimes I will go this time, sometimes I will leave 5 in the morning, sometimes I will leave at 11. Depends on which location I used to do uh, work. Julie, was there any particular reason that you could ascertain as to why Julie would be crying outside, or did she tell you why she was crying outside? That uh, Mark just left to work. They had a, a big argument, and she was just sitting out there. I don't know why she was sitting out there. I didn't see the argument. I just saw Julie sit spread in the front of the railing and crying. But <clears throat> guess what I'm inquiring Mr. Boy is, she could have been doing this crying inside, right? Objection calls for speculation. Um, overall. I don't know. How could they know? Well, Mark wasn't inside, right? I really don't know. I'm telling you what I seen. Well, you just told yeah, you just told me that you saw that Mark had just left. No, I never said that. You said that they had well, an argument. Well, Julie told me. I didn't see Mark leave. Julie told you Mark had gone to work, correct? Yes, correct. She wasn't lying. She didn't say she was locked out of that house, right? No, she never mentioned a word about it. She no. seemed to want to get your attention. Would that be fair to say? No. You don't believe that was the case? I don't believe it because when I approached her, she didn't want to even talk to me. Well, she protested for a little while and then she did talk to you, correct? Yes, she did. Later. You had you talked to her almost daily after that, right? Yes, I did talk to her daily, sometimes twice. Yes. Sometimes she seemed, more. She seemed to be outside quite often when you were either going to work or coming home from work, fair to say? Well, that's what I said before that I kind of noticed the, sometimes I felt like she was waiting for me to say something. And she seemed to be waiting outside for you. I'll right? say yes. And she seemed to know when would be a good time to try to wait for you outside, right? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for speculation on the part of this witness. And right. how long is this going to go on? This is. Oh. I object to the speaker. And this is. Uh, 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 just, I object to uh, the just, speaker. just please. <clears throat> the objections overruled. Do you remember the question? Yeah, repeat the question, please. Can I have that read back, please? Question, and she, she seemed to know when would be a good time to try to wait for you outside, right? No. Julie, did Julie express any anger about this affair to you? Did she suspect the market having? Well, she was upset about it. Yes, she was. Did she express anger? No, she didn't. I don't know how you express it, but she never swear or call him names or anything. No, she was just, she was very upset about it. She wasn't that much upset that he's having of her that uh, she just suspect him that there's, there's, he's having a affair. I, I mean, she never said bad thing about Mark at that time, at that moment. <clears throat> she just was suspecting him. Well, she was saying bad things about him wanting her to work and things like that, right? No, it wasn't a bad thing. She's like, he's pushing me. He forcing me to go get a job. He forcing me to leave uh, the Douglas. And uh, the Douglas was her life. The kids, she loved to stay home with the kids, and uh, they had a, a 
some kind of agreement that she do this and she can stay home. During this first uh, <coughs> statement to Detective Rasberg, you had nothing to say about any high five, true? No, I don't think so. I don't remember. You don't think what? I don't remember. Objection, Your Honor. It's improper cross-examination. Anyway, the, the, the absence of an entry in a prior statement does not constitute a prior well, inconsistent statement. That, that a statement which um, yeah, ought, one would think would be stated uh, in a prior statement and is not stated can be of benefit uh, to the finder of fact. The objections are wrong. Mr. Boyd, let me show you Defendant's Exhibit 133. Excuse me, Counsel, what is that? That's the that handwritten statement from December 4th. Mr. Boyd, is yes. that, in fact, what that is, is the statement that Detective Bradsford wrote out for you based on your yes, interview? Yes, that's just. Based on your interview on December 4th, 1998? That's the statement, yes. That was the day after Julie Jensen's death? Yes. Nowhere in that statement do you say anything about Julie Jensen getting sick and vomiting two to three weeks before her death, true? The statement, yes. No, there's nothing on the heap with it. There's no, there, and there's no statement in which you ever said anything about vomiting, right? Like I said, I made this testimony. It was over two hours testimony. There's a lot of stuff where I talked about it. It's not in it. If this is two hours what I was saying in my life, it's, it's, it's wrong. There's more stuff, more detail. But uh, at that point, I know Mr. Raspberry pointed to us that uh, Julie Jensen was in poison. So it's like there's no suspicious or nothing. That he, you know, this happened. We were, we were all surprised with what what happened? We didn't know it was going to happen that soon. Mr. Boyd, is the answer that, is the answer you did not put, it's correct, that you did not put anything about vomiting and her getting sick in that statement, correct? There's nothing in it. And there's nothing in any statement you've given prior to today, right? It's possible. And there's nothing in any testimony you've given prior to today, right? Right. And now it's nine years later. And this is the first time in any court or any law enforcement statement that you've said anything about her vomiting and being sick, true? Well, there was one statement, I talked to someone that uh, Julie was sick and she was afraid to eat anything in the house. And she went to the local store advice to go get the food. And she actually, I think she did. There was one previous testimony, I don't know which one, but I did talk to her about. Well, you've tested, you've, you've stated that Julie uh, did not want to eat any food in the house, right? At some point, yes. Right. I mean, that's your, and that's what you're testifying to today. Julie did not want to eat any food in the house. There was, Mr. She, Boyce, it was about two weeks before her death. Is that correct? Julie told you she did not want to eat any food in the house. At that time, correct. At that time. In late November of 1998. I, like I said, it was like two weeks before her death. Which would be late November of 1998, right? It would be the mid. She t and she told you she was refusing to eat any food that was in the house, right? She was refusing to eat any stuff that Mark will give it to her. And you told her, if you're scared to eat anything in the house, go to White Hand? Yes. And so that's what she did. She went to White Hand to get food. I think she did, because she says she went and got a sandwich or something. Because she, I remember she was shaking and crying, and she said, I need nothing for two days. 
which was scary than anything in the house. Right. And I'm sure this is in one of my statements. Thank right. you, sir. I, and, and what she said is she was scared to eat anything in the house, yes. right? That's why she went to White Hen, true? At that time, like I said, that two weeks before her death. And that's why she went to White Hen, right? Yeah, that's why she went to White Hen. Thank you. And that statement, you also don't say anything about a high five, true? Yes. That is true? It's true. And you didn't say that in your statement in 2002, correct? I mentioned that stuff before in in uh, in in the meeting with Mr. Jamboy. I mentioned with Mr. Ransford. Is there any written statement anywhere? No, it isn't. That wasn't something that, that you ever testified to until this year, right? No, like I repeated myself again, it's not in the statement, but I did say it before. I don't know why it isn't in it, but I did say it. It's not in any statement or testimony until this year. Testimony this year, yes. Right. That's when you first. Yes, that's where it first got recorded. And that was nine years after the fact. Yes. True. True. Did Julie ever tell you about her affair? No, she never did. That's all I have. Um, any redirect? Oh, yes. Um, did Julie tell you why? She didn't want to go on the trip that Mark was upset that she wouldn't go on? Oh, yes, she did. What did she tell you? Her side of the story was, well, when she finds out how Mark plans on this trip, that he made the plans, I think, with a couple other uh, uh, people from his work and his wife, that he already arranged to uh, put Douglas someplace in the hotel with the, with the uh, babysitter, some strange person. She was really upset about it, and that's what she said. And that's what they go from bar to bar. They go to the strip clubs, all this other thing to three in the morning. I'm not into it. I'm not gonna do it. This is not my type of vacation with the kids. Um, you had been in the Jensen residence, or had you been in the Jensen residence uh, in the say three or four or five months before Julie died? Yes, I've been. Had, do you recall, as you're sitting here today, ever seeing the computer in the Jensen residence before in the months preceding? Yeah, I think so we did, because we did some work for Jensen. So the whole play was kind of mess and everything. But now, now, did you know which room the computer was in? Yes. Which room was the computer in? It was the first room on the left when you walk into the front door. So I'm directing your attention to Defense Exhibit 132, the photograph here. Um, can you uh, tell us whether or not that is the room that is depicted in that photograph? I'm not really not positive if this is the room. If this is the room, I know that I remember the carpet in this room because they changed uh, the rest of the house was blue. The green ones in Mark room, his office when we did the work for him. So that color, that carpet is the same yes. color. Um, what was it about the room that caused you to believe that it was Mark's room? And I, I object to his knowledge about the subject. What room? So tell us what you know about the room that, at least insofar as it caused you to believe it was Mark's room. Well, first of all, it's a green carpet. I remember when Mark and Julie asked me about the carpet guy to install a uh, carpet in their house, and I suggested uh, somebody from Chicago, one of my installers. They came out and they, they they picked the carpet, they did it for them. And one of the things was very, when they were installing the carpet, the mark room was green. The middle of the room, the their den was blue. And uh, Julie looked at the carpet and she wasn't sure if that was the color was marijuana. 
and she was really kind of scared, afraid, you know. And she called Mark, and Mark would like show up, and I would say in a half hour to determine. And that's what kind of stuck with me. That that green carpet, I'm sure that's the first room on the left is his office. So the first room on the left, uh, as you're going down the hallway? Or? Yeah, going to the hallway. You go to the front door, you turn to the left. There's a, the first room on the left side, that's his uh, office. Yes. And when you saw a computer in that house, which room was it in? This was in this room. I'm, now, I'm sorry, what was the answer? It was in this room. Yeah. The room in the photograph? Yeah. Looking at exhibit G132 again, um, do you recognize anything in that photograph? Uh, wood sheets, that's the only thing I recognize. I do not recognize how the furniture was set it up. I do recognize the later setup of the room, but at that, no. Do you I, say that you recognize the later setup in the room? Yeah, because I was there later after Julie Judd death. Oh, and so it was a ring. So you remember what we got after Julie's death? Yes. And did it look like this room, or was it a different room, or something you remember? No, it was the same room, but different layout, because the computer was sitting right on the left. If I remember correctly, there was a desk, and the computer was sitting uh, right here on this side. Was the computer sitting in a place where it was closer to the door or in about the same distance from the door? This one was the same. A little bit closer. closer. Do you recognize the furniture at <coughs> all? No, I don't. Because as I said, when we worked there, when I was there, it was, you know, quite a bit chaos when they, you know, they we're putting hardwood floors, the, you replace the carpet, so everything was mess. Now, um, and to get back to your impressions or possible or alleged impressions about who or who was not controlling in that relationship, um, do, you remember, do you remember seeing some episodes where Julie was apparently trying to do something that she was supposed to do in order to please Mark, or because Mark expected her to do it. Oh yeah. Okay. There was, there was... Give us some examples of that. Oh, Julie used to always complain because you know when Mark would leave to work, kind of laugh about it. It was a daily thing that she would have a list of chores to do, and he will expect her to do it. She will, she, she will have to take a, a go to his work. Pick up his car, take for oil change, uh, bring it back. In the meantime, do all her other chores, cut the grass. Uh, one of the times I remember when she was sitting in the back and she couldn't start her lawnmower, and she was crying. And, and I came out and I helped her. And he's, she was like, you know, all upset and everything. I have to do this because Mark expected me to do by the time he gets home. Uh, one day, I remember she was backing up the boat. She blocked yeah, the boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you ask another question? Okay, well, tell me about the time that she was backing up the boat. The yeah, same thing. It's like she was very upset. Why I'm doing this? A stupid boat. Why I have to go take it to the Jelinski for service? Why he cannot do it himself? Because he he wants this boat ready by he by the time he gets home. White, uh, I think the question on the table related to a time when there was a deck being constructed in the backyard of the Jensen residence. Can you tell the jury about your recollection of that episode? Yeah, it was, uh, <clears throat> it was during the construction. I think so as soon as we finished construction of the house, uh, we were building and my crew on the back of the house, the garage. And the same time, uh, Julie Jensen was working on her side of a yard in the backyard, uh, taking apart existing, I think so, patio around the uh, swimming pool. And what condition was she in at the time? At, well, that was the fine thing. She was pregnant, and, uh, and the, the workers, I remember, they, they were just kind of laughing about it, because she was, uh, she was sitting in the backyard with a hammer, pulling out nails from a usable lumber that they, she took apart, and she was flipping. She didn't have enough power. She was falling down. She was upset. She was nervous. She cried. And did she indicate to you why she was doing this at this time? Yes, she did. What did she tell you? She said that uh, 
That's what Marx want her to do. That's what he she have to contribute to the house. That was one of the things she have to do. It. He made. It, he told her to do it. And your recollection is she was how far along in her pregnancy at that time? Well, she was. I don't know how far was she, but you will notice that she was pregnant, and uh, and her struggle, what she was doing, and she was very upset about. It. Now, tell me about the episode insofar as you can remember it, when Julie's father came to visit the Jensen household. Yeah, I think so. It was fall. The year before, I think so. Same year, or Julie died, or a year before she died. It was in the fall, I remember. That uh, he was in the front with, they had a dog, I think a Nikki or Mickey, and uh, her father was taking for a while, and then Julie introduced me, him, uh, that says her father, and then she told me later that he's got the cancer, he's gonna uh, die in, like in weeks, and, uh, and that was, uh, I think so, one of the days, and the second day, we had another conversation, and she told me that Mark wants her father move out of the house because he cannot take this anymore, have him stay there. And he's supposed to stay with her a week, and this was like the second day he told her to uh, tell the father, take him someplace to a hotel. He didn't want him in the house. And did you have any further, did you have any conversation with Mark Jensen about that? Did Mark Jensen ever say anything to you about that? No. So that's the conversation was between you and Julie. Yeah. And did the father stay in the house or did he leave? He leave. And how much time after was that second conversation with Julie that Mark's father, or that Julie's father had to leave? I think it was like next day or something. Thank you. No further questions. Mr. Boyd, uh, this thing about the deck, when was that? I know my house was constructed at the time. I don't think so. I was. I know she was pregnant with uh, Douglas, with the younger son, at the time. I don't know what year was it, and I was building the garage in the back. There was a, uh, oh, four or five different people carpenters. When when were you building the garage in the back? That's why I said it, it was ninety two or ninety three. I don't, you know. You built that right after you finished your house. Yes. Ninety two or ninety three. Yes. And uh, what time of year was this? I don't remember. I really don't remember. I know, I know it's got to be summer or, or fall because everything was green at that time. Because I remember her house, uh, you know, just falling, you know, sitting there, and especially these guys at the lunch, they were just making joke about it. Do so you think maybe it was like August or something like that? It's possible. I really cannot tell you what that was, what meant to was. Was this a patio or a deck? It was a deck around the swimming pool area where they have. She was, uh, like, if I remember correct, she was doing all these railings all the way around, all around the patio. She was pulling the nails for the old pickers. And she, was, she was pretty far along in this pregnancy? She was clean, at that moment she was cleaning up uh, all old nails from, so, um, from, so from the usable material. I said she was pretty far along in this pregnancy? Uh, well, I told you, I'm not an expert, but you, I see her pregnant. She was pregnant pretty far. This is, this is just a couple months before she gave birth to Douglas? I really don't know. So your best guess is August of 1992 or 1993. Is it if it was late summer? Does that help you determine? If no, it was I said is no. I cannot commit to the date or month. I know was uh, if I can go back to my uh, 
maybe my, my statements or my workers when I pay them or something, I can probably dig it out about what time and when we build this garage and I can be positive. But uh, it was summer for sure because I remember she was in the back, it was everything green, she was on the lawn, she was, you know. They were using the pool? I don't remember. But did you I don't think so. No, they did not use the pool at the time. We didn't see it. It's, uh, and then again, at that time, we we didn't live there. I don't think so. We lived there. Pardon I know. I, what did you say? I don't think so at the time that we lived there, you know, like full time. That you weren't living there full yeah. time? Yeah. When did you begin living there full time? I think so it was 92 or I, I just... <coughs> Because I don't recall my wife being there at the time. Okay, so you think it was before you moved in yeah. full time in '92? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I know she was pregnant. I know. I, and then we, uh, some of the workers, they went and helped her doing some work. Uh, remember, we let her use a uh, pestle uh, a nail gun. We teach her how to use it. So she could kind of surprise Mark how much she done that day more than he expect her. And was she showing a lot? I mean, when you're talking about yeah. pregnant, I mean, yeah. she was big. Yeah, because I remember when she was sitting on the board trying to pull the nail, she was just flipping over because she was pretty because, excited. Because her stomach was so yeah. big? Yeah. It's, Do you know what her son Douglas's date of birth is? No, I don't. Do you know whether it's March 12, 1995? I really don't know. I know she was pregnant at the time. I wanted to ask you, you the last time you spoke with Julie was Sunday or Monday? I think so. I did briefly talk to her on Monday. And on Tuesday, Tuesday is the day that you, uh, that your wife spoke with Julie? I think so she did. I'm, I'm sorry, which, which I think so she did. You have to which ask day? her. I'm sorry. I think so she did. I, I, I know, I'm, I'm asking which day she spoke with Julie. I really don't know. Well, you, your wife had told you about one day that week. Where you, where she had spoken to Julie, right? Yes, she did. She told me there was a, I think so. One time she told me Julie came to the house, uh, pick up this uh, drop of the movies. The second time, pick up the movies. <coughs> then uh, one time, I think so, was Wednesday she called her. She, okay. she. Is the telephone call is Wednesday? I think so, it's Wednesday. Was. All right. Yeah. And. The same day, the same day as the telephone call, is the day that you saw Mr. Jensen leaving around nine or nine fifteen. I think so. It was the next day. I, I saw. I didn't see him leaving. I saw him walking from his cars to his house. That was the day Julie died. I did see him walking. I can describe how he was dressed. And that's what kind of was a surprise to me that he, he wouldn't even hire nothing. Well, was that, was that uh, sometime when he was coming in or sometime when he was leaving, Mr. Boyd? I think so he was coming in. I think so. I don't know. I just, like I said, I saw him going from the car to the house. I don't know what he was doing, but he was coming. It was about 9, 9.15 when I was getting ready to go to Chicago. And he was going from his truck to his house. And your best guess is for which day that was? Uh, I think so it was Thursday that Julie died. Is, uh, and this is the nine years ago. Yes. 
Yes, I, I, I remember that. I remember when I passed him. I remember especially well, the lights Mr. on the house. There's no question before you. That's all I have. Nothing further, Your Honor. Uh, you may stay. Okay, I think we deserve a break, folks. <laughs> so go in the back, relax for a little bit, okay? Thank you.
All right, we're back on the record on Mr. Jensen's case. The uh, appearances are the same. Who's the next witness for the state? Dr. Michael Shambliss, Your Honor. All right. Your Honor, I wish to um, advise the jury that um, there are going to be some autopsy photos presented during the course of this testimony. I want them to be prepared for that. Um, well, before I put an autopsy photo up, it would be my intention to warn them of that fact. Um, I know that something this is something lawyers and judges see on a regular basis, but I know that a lot of uh, citizens <coughs> and persons are not accustomed to seeing that. There are going to be some pretty graphic and disturbing photos because that's what happens at an autopsy. All right. Thank you for that information. Come on up here, doctor, all the way to the front. Oh, Your Honor, the state uh, also moved Exhibit 9 into evidence. That was the video of, uh, of Ted is, Teddy S. Voigt's testimony. Any objection to 9 coming in? All right, 9 is received. Come on up closer, Doctor. I'm going to swear you in. You could raise your right hand and remain standing. You solemnly swear the testimony in this matter be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Get as close as you can to the smaller microphone. <clears throat> And can you spell your first and last name for the court reporter? Uh, my first name is Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, and last name is Chambliss, C-H-A-M-B-L-I-S-S. -S. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Jamboy. May I get some water? Yeah. Oh, sure. If I had a bail, if I could get you stuff. You need some water. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> And Dr. Shambliss, would you like to take off your jacket? We can put it, your overcoat somewhere because it is getting kind of warm in this courtroom and I'm afraid you'll get overheated with it. I can take your coat if you'd like. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> okay. Do you have some water now, Doctor? Yes. Okay. So, Dr. Shambliss, can you um, tell the jury um, what it is that you do for a living? I'm a forensic pathologist. And how long have you been uh, a forensic pathologist? Uh, 38 years. Can you tell the jury what a forensic pathologist does? A uh, forensic pathologist is a doctor trained in all branches of medicine who uh, goes into the field of pathology, uh, which is the performance of autopsies or the examination of specimens that come uh, in the hospital. Uh, once you go into the residency, uh, you can go into a subspecialty in which you only do autopsies. And that subspecialty is forensic pathology. Uh, the autopsies are off, often unnatural deaths. Uh, they could be suicidal deaths. They could be homicidal deaths. They could be motor vehicle accidents. But uh, they could be natural. Uh, so uh, we do strictly autopsies to determine the cause of death and the manner of death. Now, Doctor, could you move that small microphone closer to you? Although I can hear you quite well. Um, I just The smaller microphone, could you move it closer to your mouth so that when you're talking? Um, I'm concerned about the court reporter because she's got her back turned to you, and so she's got to be able to hear everything that you're saying. So um, now, Doctor, uh, I'm going to direct your attention to uh, the screen. There's one up there, and there's another one over there. And... Um, this is your curriculum vitae, is that correct? Yes, it is. And you just provided that to me this afternoon? Yes, so, I did. And this is a current uh, version of your curriculum vitae? Uh, yes, it is. So it says Diplomat American Board of Pathology. Can you tell the jury what that means to be a diplomat of the American Board of Pathology? Uh, that means I'm board certified. Uh, and board certification means the... American Board of Pathology gives a um, uh, requirements uh, to be certified, and the requirements is include uh, the uh, going through a program 
of residency uh, that's accredited by the American Board of Pathology. Once you go through the accredited uh, program, then you sit for an examination. Uh, the examination is both a written examination and a practical examination. Uh, once you complete those, uh, you get board certified. Now the uh, both if you if you pass the test, you're board certified, right? Yes. And you pass the test. I pass the test. Yes. So well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, sir. Go on. Uh, the only thing is, there are separate uh, branches of pathology that you can do. You can do clinical pathology. You can do uh, anatomic pathology, and you can do forensic pathology. Each one of those has a residency uh, portion uh, followed by an examination, which if you complete it uh, appropriately, you become board certified. And according to this, you were board certif you were certified uh, by the American Board of Pathology in clinical pathology in 1984? Yes and the American Board of Pathology in Anatomic Pathology in 1985? Yes. And in Forensic Pathology in 1988? Yes. Now, what's the difference between clinical pathology and anatomic pathology? Uh, clinical pathology is uh, the laboratory branches of medicine, essentially hematology, microbiology, uh, chemistry. All of those fall under the category of clinical pathology, so any laboratory aspects of uh, medicine. And then what about anatomic pathology? What does that consist of? Uh, anatomic pathology uh, is the performance of autopsies, the examination of surgical specimens. We call that surgical pathology. And another branch would be cytopathology, in which you do examination of cells essentially to make a diagnosis. That's all under anatomic pathology. And then finally is forensic pathology, and can you tell the jury what forensic pathology is and how that's distinguished from anatomic or clinical pathology? Well, forensic pathology would be a subspecialty under anatomic pathology. Uh, once you uh, do anatomic pathology, uh, you can take the subspecialty of forensic uh, and the forensic is the performance of autopsies uh, and determine the cause of death and the manner of death. So you're doing just autopsies at the time you do your forensic pathology uh, residency. And doctor, um, after you um, finished your residency and you became a, a forensic pathologist, where did you first, um, where did you first become employed? Uh, at the uh, Cook County Medical Examiner's Office where I became a, that's where I did my training and stayed on as a Deputy Medical Examiner. And that's from 1985 through November of 91? That's correct. And then in November of 91, uh, what did you do? Uh, November of 91, I uh, went to Fresno, California for the first time and joined a uh, private pathology group called Community Pathology Associates. Uh, they did both hospital pathology and forensic pathology, and they needed another forensic pathologist to uh, cover uh, their forensic pathology practice, so I went out to take a position there. And that was in, from November 91 through July of 93? That's correct. And then uh, what happened in July of 93? Uh, in July of 93, essentially the pathology group, Community Pathology Associates, lost its uh, contract with the county, and um, I decided to stay on as a coroner's forensic pathologist for the coroner's office. So that's when I started in July of 1993 through December of 1993. And then in 1994, where did you go? Uh, in 1994, I came to Wisconsin, uh, to Waukesha, Wisconsin, uh, and took a position as a medical examiner for Waukesha County uh, Medical Examiner's Office. And that was from 1994 through 1998? That's correct. And then from 1998 uh, onward, what did you do? From 1998 up to 2003, actually June of 2003, I became an independent uh, forensic pathologist, which means I uh, contracted with multiple uh, 
counties in uh, Wisconsin to do their autopsies. That would, it would be considered a coroner's pathologist. So I would do their autopsies, give them the cause of death and the manner of death. So I did that from 1998 to 2003. And then from 2003 until March of 2020, what did you do? Uh, from 2003 to March of 2020, I became an employee of Fresno County Sheriff Coroner's Office in uh, Fresno, California. I was a coroner's pathologist that entire time from June 2003 up through March 2020 when I retired. And then I see in June from June 2020, I'm, yeah, from June 2020 through June 2022, you became a part-time forensic pathologist? Uh, yes, the, the caseload in uh, Fres Fresno, California is very significant uh, for forensic pathology, and we only had one forensic pathologist at that time. And my position was not filled yet because of the shortage of forensic pathologist, so I stayed around an additional two years to uh, do forensic cases. Now, according to this, according to your curriculum vitae, you've investigated and certified over 7,000 deaths as a deputy medical examiner, a coroner's pathologist, and chief medical examiner? Uh, at least. Uh, there, it's probably more at this time, but at least, yes. And the number of autopsies at that time uh, had been over 6,000 in mm -hmm. homicides, suicides, traffic fatalities, natural deaths, child abuse deaths, alco alcohol abuse deaths, drug-related deaths, ex exhumations, SIDS deaths, etc. Yes. <clears throat> And you've testified, you said, over 11,000 times in criminal and civil litigations? Yes, and depositions, but over 11,000, yes. So this isn't your first rodeo, doctor? Uh, no, it's not. Now, while you were working as the um, medical examiner for Waukesha County in 1998, um, did you have occasion to be contacted to conduct an autopsy on one Julie Jensen? Uh, yes, I was. And do you remember, well, what date did you perform that autopsy? On December 4th of 1998. Now, doctor, at the time that you performed that autopsy, did you undertake to ensure that you may kept notes and maintained uh, as you were as you were conducting the autopsy, uh, yes, I did. And were those report were those records or those uh, your notes that you were taking were they converted in then to a final autopsy or a private case autopsy report? Uh, yes, they were. And directing your attention to the screen is this the private case autopsy, a private case for Kenosha County autopsy report of Julie Jensen? Yes, it is. Now this date this autopsy was performed on December fourth, nineteen ninety eight. That's correct. Now, at the time that you performed that autopsy, um, had you had you had an opportunity to view the crime scene? No, there were no crime scene photos at the time. And sometimes, as an as a forensic pathologist, you get called to the crime scene. Is that true? And that's true. But in this instance, you were not. I was not called uh, to the scene. And at the time you did the autopsy, you did not have the benefit of crime scene photos, correct? No, I did not. And at the time you did the autopsy, you didn't have the benefit of having the toxicology test results back, did you? They were not back yet. Um, so walk us through this autopsy. It indicates the photographs were taken by Sergeant Ratsburg of the Pleasant Prairie Police Department. Is that true? Uh, that's correct. I'm sorry, and, is, is, this, is this marked as an exhibit? It's exhibit 10, okay. and it's, it's on a thumb drive, so it's on that exhibit 10. So this well, it be, is Exhibit 10 for the record for this case. Yes, it is, Your Honor. It's Exhibit 10. And just to be clear, the first part of the exhibit was the uh, curriculum vitae. And now the next item is this. Okay. <clears throat> now, so, Doctor, where, where did you perform the autopsy? Uh, at St. Catherine's Hospital there in Kenosha, here in Kenosha. And... 
Tell the jury what you can remember about this autopsy subject of Julie Jensen at the time you performed the at the time you first saw her body. Uh, when I first saw her, she was clothed in uh, a T-shirt, uh, white panties, and white socks. Uh, she had some jewelry on both hands. Uh, she also had a necklace on. Uh, she was about 110 pounds, of about 65 inches tall. And she did appear uh, to be uh, actually slightly older than the stated age of 40 to 41 years. Um, there was well-developed rigor mortis there. Uh, the only signs that uh, there were, was of possible hospital treatment or medical treatment were some EKG pads on her body. There actually were no needle puncture marks or no tubes or anything else on the body whatsoever. Um, there were uh, bruises uh, present on her right buttock area and also on her right shin. She had a, uh, a bruise in that area. On the right side of her neck, she had an abrasion that was a superficial abrasion, uh, which uh, I said rem uh, resembled a fingernail mark. But that, that's my description of it at the time. Uh, no other uh, external injuries were noted at that time. So at the time that you first examined the body of Julie Jensen, there was, could you state whether or not there was any exterior indication of what was the cause of death or manner of death? And externally, there was nothing that I could uh, look at to say that was the cause of death. So, and oftentimes there is. I mean, you've got a, a homicide, there's a gunshot wound to the head or a knife sticking out of the back, and there's ev clear evidence of what caused the homicide in this case. However, there was no clear indication in the exterior of the body as to what could have caused the death of Julie Jensen. Uh, nothing externally. Um, so tell us about your observations concerning the head and the scalp and the eyes. Uh, the head showed no uh, signs of trauma whatsoever. Uh, there was uh, some medium length hair with a few gray strands uh, noted. Uh, the eyes uh, had no petechiae eye or noticeable hemorrhage. There's some drying artifact, which is, uh, you see a dark line that is present in the white portion of the eye. Uh, that was present on the right side more so than the left side. Uh, the eyelids and the face uh, show uh, no uh, petechiae, eye, which are small uh, pinpoint hemorrhages. So uh, that was not present whatsoever. Um, and the mouth, uh, both on the outside and inside, uh, show uh, no injuries whatsoever. Uh, and the neck area I described previously as uh, the small abrasion on the right side. <clears throat> and you'd indicated the nose is midline and the cartilages are intact. So can you explain to the jury what that means? Uh, that is the usual appearance that we see at the time when a case comes to uh, autopsy, is that the nose uh, shows no trauma, shows that it's uh, properly positioned, and that's the way it was at the time. Now, looking at the chest area, can you tell us what you observed about the chest area? Uh, the uh, chest area uh, showed uh, some EKG pads, but otherwise there's nothing significant in the chest region. The breasts were symmetrical, show no injuries uh, or masses. Uh, there's no surgical scars whatsoever. There was no discernible evidence of trauma to the exterior of the chest. Is that, is that true? That's true. What are EKG pads? EKG pads are uh, essentially, they're naming what they're used for. They're adhesive type pads uh, that are placed on uh, the chest region uh, to detect the presence of heart activity. Uh, it would show up in what we call an EKG, an electrocardiogram. 
Uh, so we call them EKG pets. And who would place EKG pads on, um, on a person? The EKG pads are placed by uh, emergency personnel at the time when they first come in contact with uh, an individual to check for heart activity. <coughs> and in this case, you'd, no, you'd receive no history and there was no indication of resuscitative efforts. Is that true? Yes, there's no indication of resuscitative efforts. Now, I'm going to switch away from the autopsy report for a moment, and I'm going to direct your attention. Now, you indicated at the time that you conducted the autopsy you had not seen the crime scene photos. Is that true? That's correct. But approximately uh, nine years later, in January of 2008, you were shown the crime scene photos at a previous hearing. Is that true? Uh, that's true. And I'm going to show them to you again. I'm directing your attention to this first photo and um, that, can you tell the jury what that photo reflects? Uh, this is a photo of Julie Jensen uh, at her residence. Uh, she's in bed. Uh, when we're looking at the back side of Julie Jensen, her head's on a pillow. Uh, the rest of her uh, body is positioned on the bed itself. And doctor, had you observed this uh, bruise or injury to the um, right rear buttock? Uh, at the autopsy, I observed the bruise and documented it, yes. And um, that was a, w would you describe that as a nonspecific injury? Uh, I described it as a bruise uh, of nonspecific uh, nature. I couldn't determine what produced it, so it's nonspecific. But it didn't appear to be paramortem. It appeared to be prior to death, is that It's true? prior to death, but it, it's just something I can't, uh, determine exactly what it's associated with. And that's a close-up of the same bruise, is that true? Uh, that's true. Now, directing your attention here to the photograph uh, depicting Julie Jensen's face, um, it, can you just compare the nose as depicted in this photograph, uh, and for that matter, the way the mouth is kind of pushed off to one side, compare that to the way it, Julie's face at the time that you saw her at the time you performed the autopsy. Uh, at the time of the autopsy, I did not see a, a distorted nose or mouth. They're, they weren't present there at that time. Now, Doctor, most people, if they take their nose and they push it off to one side or the other, as soon as they release the nose, it goes right back to midline. Is that true? Yes. But in this instance, it appears that Julie Jensen's nose is pushed off to one side. For that matter, it looks like her mouth is off to one side as well. Can you explain to the jury what would cause something like that? Uh, actually, uh, positioning into something uh, long enough that uh, beginning rigor mortis will start and you will get the shifting of the uh, nose uh, corresponding to the position in which the face is located. So um, explain to the jury what rigor mortis is and how it works, doctor, if you would. Uh, rigor mortis is a sign that we look for after death, uh, which uh, is a rough measure of time of death. It's not a very accurate type of uh, instrument that we can use because it changes according to temperature. Um, but it, it really represents uh, the changes in the muscles that take place in the body. Uh, at the time of death, uh, the muscles will first become real loose, and then gradually in the first uh, one to two hours, you can see some stiffening in the smaller muscles in the body, particularly the facial muscles, the eyelids. So within one to two hours, it will start up, and you can notice it. Uh, the larger muscles in the body uh, start to get stiffer around 10 to 12 hours. So that's a gradual progression from smaller muscles to larger muscles. And then after 12 hours, it stays there uh, again up, uh, I'd say, for another six hours, and then eventually goes away. So we would sometimes see uh, a body at the time of autopsy uh, that was completely loose at the scene, 
But by the time we do the autopsy, uh, the muscles are real strong because the rigor mortis has come over hours and hours, and it's well developed within that period of time. So rigor mortis will cause a body to sort of fix or body portions to fix in the condition the body was at the time, the point of death, and um, if the body's not moved immediately after death. But then at some point later on, rigor mortis recedes and the, the limbs will, the, the body will return to its normal It starts state. off loose, as I mentioned, gradually gets real tight muscles where you can actually really lift the entire body if you wanted to. And then over a number of additional hours, it goes back to loose state. It becomes real relaxed again. So looking at this photo that's depicted here on the screen of Julie Jensen's face, um, it would appear to that is rigor mortis is causing her nose to remain off to one side and her face to remain off to one side. What we, we don't have any underlying injuries uh, to the nose, which is the important part here. There's nasal cartilage and there are nasal bones uh, that would be present uh, in the nose itself. Uh, those are not damaged. Uh, we don't see any injury on the inside where the skull is, where the nasal bones would be. Uh, we don't see any cartilage injury. Uh, what we do see is uh, the muscle soft tissue part of the nose, which is the tip, uh, is distorted to one side. And I'm placing that in uh, the category of rigor. And this is a photo that depicts her face as she was found in the pillow, is that? Yes, that's correct. That? Now, um, can you tell the jury anything about uh, this photo in, in terms of what it tells you about Julie Jensen uh, at the time of her death? Um, this photo actually shows uh, three things. Uh, her head is in the pillow. Uh, with her nose pressed against the pillow. Uh, the second thing is looking at her chest area. We see her left arm coming under the chest, uh, going uh, towards her right side, so it's below her right elbow. Uh, the other part is she's on her side, so part her hips down is to the side, uh, the upper part is kind of angled, as I mentioned, the torso, nose in the pillow, arm under the body towards her uh, right side under her elbow. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're going to autopsy photos at this point, so I'm just preparing you for this. Um, I'm going to direct your attention to the screen, doctor, and ask if you can tell the jury what they're looking at here. Uh, the screen shows a photograph uh, which uh, essentially is once we make the Y incision, uh, which allows us to go inside and examine the structures inside the body. Uh, this is what we first see once we take the uh, underlying fat, the skin, underlying fat, and the muscles off the rib cage. Uh, and that's what we're looking at. This is what uh, the rib cage looks like. So doctor, this is the result of the classic, what they call the classic Y incision. You go down here and then down to here and then from here down to here, is that correct? And then you reflect the skin back, is that what you did? Yes, except the vertical part continues all the way down, completely down, and then we take all the muscle back off the rib cage so we can see the ribs. Now, what can you tell us about the rib, the rib cage uh, of Julie Jensen based on this autopsy photo, doctor? From this autopsy photograph, uh, I'll direct your attention to the left front of the chest. 
uh, and the ribs on the left front of the chest. But below the skin fold would be the clavicle, and then right below that would be the first rib. This is the clavicle, and this is the this first rib. First rib, and then this is the second rib, and we'll go downward. Third rib, fourth, fifth, six ribs as I'm uh, as you move the pointer on the photograph. Seventh rib as you move the pointer. Uh, so that's what we're looking at on the left front of the chest, the rib cage. Now, doctor, when you reflected the skin back, what did you see on the rib cage of Julie Jensen? Uh, what did you see on the rib cage of Julie Jensen? Uh, on the rib cage, uh, on the second, third, and fourth rib, uh, we see some small amount of hemorrhage involving the soft tissue over the rib portion. The white portion is a cartilage, the gray portion is a rib. Um, and, and you can see a darker area, darker purple area over the second rib, over the third rib, and over the fourth rib. And these are small areas of hemorrhage uh, involving all three ribs. So doctor, I'm gonna use the pointer. This is the hemorrhage on the second rib, is that correct? That's correct. And this is the hemorrhage on the third rib, is that correct? That's correct. And this is the hemorrhage on the fourth rib, is that correct? That's correct. Now, when you, before you'd reflected the skin back, you had not seen any injury to the external part of the skin, is that correct? That's also correct, yes. So you only see the subcutaneous injury along, it's actually on the, it's on the rib, ribs themselves, is that correct? That's also correct, yes. Now, at the time that you performed this autopsy, oh, once again, you did not have the crime scene photo at your disposal. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, directing your attention to the screen, doctor, um, now that we have these two photos lined up, the crime scene photo down here and the autopsy photo up here, um, is there any um, opinion or any professional opinion you can form based upon comparing the body at the crime scene to the con injuries you'd seen at the, uh, at the time of autopsy? Well, the internal examination or the autopsy shows, uh, as I mentioned, hemorrhage over the second, third, and fourth ribs. Uh, there is no external injury of the left anterior chest. Uh, these areas of hemorrhage have to be explained. Um, and we refer to other items in the case, such as the scene photographs, to help us come up with an explanation for uh, the way hemorrhage could occur over these ribs. Uh, with her positioning uh, in the bed, face down, her arm, her left arm, uh, coming across her chest wall. Uh, this would uh, be uh, in a position that could consistently produce some hemorrhage to the left uh, anterior chest wall. Uh, that would be one explanation for uh, how this can happen. So the positioning of the body we see in the lower part of the photograph uh, and we're corresponding how the arm is coming across the chest wall uh, with the injury I see at the time of the autopsy. Now, doctor, at the time of the autopsy, you did not have any toxicology test results, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Um, and you hadn't seen the, um, the, the slides that were done of the kidney tissue samples, is that correct? Uh, that's correct, that was done elsewhere. Uh, since that time, you have seen lab reports from the St. Uh, Louis Forensic Toxicology Lab? Yes, I have. And in, in the course of your duties as a forensic pathologist, have you worked with the St. Louis Forensic Toxicology Lab? I'm sorry, St. Louis? St. Louis Forensic Toxicology Lab. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll try to speak more clearly. Um, so have you worked with the, have you, have you referred matters or t items to be tested to the St. Louis Forensic Toxicology Lab in the past? Yes, I have. Have you worked with them in the past and found their rep reports to be reliable? 
Yes, I have. Are those the kind of reports you routinely rely upon as a uh, forensic pathologist? Uh, yes, they are. And you also independently examined the uh, the lab, the slides that were done um, of Julie Jensen's kidneys. Is that correct? Yes, I have. And um, based upon your examination of the St. Louis Forensic Toxicology lab test results and your observations of the uh, la of the uh, slides that were done of Julie Jensen's kidneys. Uh, do you have an opinion as to whether or not ethylene glycol was a factor in this case? Uh, ethylene glycol was uh, a factor in this case. Uh, the uh, kidney slides uh, show calcium oxalate uh, crystals in the tubules, uh, which are consistent with uh, ingestion of ethylene glycol, uh, plus the detection of ethylene glycol in the blood, uh, urine, and gastric contents. So we have uh, specimens containing ethylene glycol, and we have slides uh, that were examined uh, under the microscope showing the products of the breakdown of ethylene glycol, calcium oxalate. So, Dr. Shamless, at the time that you conducted the autopsy in this matter, who was the person that, uh, for example, obtained the gastric contents? Uh, I obtained the gastric contents during the process of the autopsy. And who obtained the blood sample from Julie Jensen? Uh, I took the blood samples from two locations at the time of the autopsy, the right atrium and I think the right femoral. And who took the um, urine sample from Julie Jensen? Uh, I took the urine sample during the time of the autopsy. And who collected the tissue samples from the uh, from the lungs and the and the kidneys of Julie Jensen? Uh, I collected the tissue samples also during the autopsy. And you did that all in the manner in which you've been trained to do that as a forensic pathologist. That's correct. Now, doctor, at the time you concluded your autopsy, you did, did you had you developed an opinion as to the cause and manner of death in this case? No, the the cause. It, the case was a pending cause at that time. Um, did you see any information, did you see any physical evidence in this case uh, in, in your autopsy of Julie Jensen that was indicative of the possibility of asphyxiation as a cause or as a cause of death in this case? Yes, there were some findings that uh, could be seen in cases of asphyxia. Uh, what they included were the petite eye on the sack around the heart. Uh, again, these petechiae are pinpoint size hemorrhages that you can see anywhere in the body. Uh, there are also petechiae on the front and back of the heart. Um, and there were the presence of petechiae on the outer surface of the left lung and the right leaflet of the diaphragm. So they're all petechiae and uh, separate locations in the chest cavity. So, doctor, when you're looking at petechiae like that, is that um, is that diagnostic for asphyxiation, or is it simple, simply a possible indication of asphyxiation? Uh, it's a possible indication of asphyxia. It has to be uh, matched up with the particular scenario of the case itself uh, and be explained. So, doctor, have you ever heard of something called positional asphyxia? Uh, yes, I have. Can you tell the jury what positional asphyxia is? Positional asphyxia is essentially just what it means. Your body is in a position where it compromises your ability to breathe. Uh, the compromise of your breathing is what leads to asphyxia or lack of being able to get enough oxygen in. So your body gets in a position you're unable to breathe properly, you can't move your chest wall or your diaphragm, and you essentially don't get enough oxygen. So that's called positional asphyxia. So doctor, when you look at this crime scene photo of Julie Jensen, and you see that her face is in the pillow, um, could, that, could that possibly be a case of positional asphyxia? Uh, in some situations, it could be a case of positional asphyxia uh, without other findings. Uh, I've seen cases, and, and I've called them positional asphyxia, 
uh, but you have to, again, look at the entire case. But so when you look at the entire case here, um, is the entire as you knew it at the time you conducted the autopsy, but without let's say at the time you the, the, uh, you did the autopsy and you'd had this photo uh, of the of the crime scene. Um, do you think you would have been able to render an opinion at that time as to whether or not positional asphyxia was a factor in this case? I would say this is not positional asphyxia. What would you have said at the time if you, if you had seen this photo at the time you conducted the autopsy in this matter? I would say the hemorrhage that's on the rib cage would uh, need to be explained uh, to uh, put that in the category of positional asphyxia. Uh, and to produce that type of hemorrhage, you look at the uh, evidence around how she's found. Uh, she's in a soft mattress, uh, which uh, should not produce uh, hemorrhage of the rib cage. Um, the other components, as I mentioned, the nose and pillow uh, could be seen in cases of positional asphyxia. So we have something that's uh, not explained and something that is not produced by a mattress, hemorrhage of the muscles of the rib cage. Now, then when you take this crime scene photo and add it to what you observed at the autopsy, and then you add it to ethylene glycol poisoning, uh, there was the clear evidence of ethylene glycol poisoning, um, does that, uh, would you then be able to come to an opinion as to the cause and manner of death in this case? Well, you have two sets of uh, findings. You have autopsy findings from an anatomic uh, way of looking at things, where I described the petechiae, the nose being shifted to the right, uh, the hemorrhage over the left anterior rib cage, and then you have toxicology findings. Uh, the toxicology findings are the significant toxicology findings include the ethylene glycol, and you have some other uh, drugs present in the toxicology exam. Uh, zolpidine, which is Ambien, uh, paroxetine, uh, which is Paxil, and you have one additional drug present in her system. So looking at the case in total uh, with presence of hemorrhage over a rib cage, that needs to be explained plus the uh, petechiae or asphyxial changes inside the chest cavity. I feel that is the more important findings is the petechial uh, changes in the chest region, plus the hemorrhage over the uh, chest wall, plus the nose. Now, again, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to an autopsy photo, so be prepared. Um, and I'm showing, um, can you tell the jury what this is that I'm depicting that I'm showing here? Uh, actually, we've uh, taken the rib cage off. We're looking directly at the back portion of the heart. Uh, we're looking at the chambers, the lower chambers called the ventricles. Uh, so we're looking very close at the back portion of the heart. Uh, we see red uh, marks that look essentially like a large group of red marks on the back of the left ventricle. Um, it, they occupy over a half the back portion of the left ventricle. We also see similar red marks at the top portion of the heart uh, be at the junction between the top chamber and the, again the left ventricle. So there are numerous petechiae over the back of the heart. So these petechiae, you're referring to these red, these like red dots that are depicted, that are seen here on the heart? Yes. Uh, pinpoint size or red dots, circular dots present on the outside of the heart. Now, you indicated those are consistent with what? With asphyxia. So you've seen those kind of injuries in asphyxia deaths? Uh, yes, I have. And in addition to the petechiae about the heart, you also saw petechiae where else in this body? Uh, also on the outside of the, uh, the sac surrounding the heart. So we have them both on the sack on the outside, on the heart itself. We see them on the right diaphragm, 
And we also see them in the lower lobe of the left lung. And all of those are consistent with asphyxia? Yes, they are. But they're not diagnostic for asphyxia? They're not diagnostic, uh, but the more you see throughout the body, then you have to explain the entirety of the case. Um, it's not something that's uh, an isolated post-mortem change thing if you see it uh, in multiple locations in the chest area. So, Doctor, when you add up your findings of what you saw at the autopsy, uh, what you now know about the, uh, the um, ethylene glycol poisoning and the presence of paroxetine and zolpidem in her system and the, um, and the injuries to the rib cage, uh, combining that with the crime scene photo, have you come to an opinion, Doctor, as to the cause and manner of death in this case? Uh, yes, I have. And what is your opinion as to the manner of death in this case? Uh, the manner of death is a homicide. And what is your opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to the cause of death in this matter? In this case? Um, the cause of death would depend upon the explanation for how these petechiae have come about. Uh, for sure, there is traumatic asphyxia due to the hemorrhage on the left front of the chest. So it's uh, at a minimum traumatic asphyxia but it's an asphyxial death. Now, doctor, if um, you had heard that Mark Jensen had confessed to a fellow inmate that Mark Jensen told this fellow inmate that he rolled Julie Jensen from her back onto her side, sat on her back, pushed on her legs, on her lungs, and her head until she stopped breathing. Um, looking at the physical findings that you saw at the, at the time of autopsy in this manner, are your findings consistent or inconsistent with that description of the, of the manner of, and cause of Julie's death? Uh, it's consistent with that particular scenario that uh, you explained there. That explains the petechiae of the heart. Yes, it does. And most particularly, it explains the injuries to the rib cage, the second, third, and fourth rib. Is that true? Yes, it can explain that injury. What role did the ethylene glycol have in the cause of death in this manner? Uh, it's ethylene glycol, I would say, uh, alone uh, could be a possible cause of death. Uh, it could be a contributing factor in this particular case uh, because I feel that the traumatic asphyxia is the primary or most proximate cause. So the sequence would that she been that she was drugged with zolpidem, poisoned with antifreeze, and then ultimately asphyxiated. That's correct. And these are opinions you hold to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Yes, they are. After performing a little over seven thousand autopsies. Uh, yes. No further questions. Thank you, Doctor. All right. It's my understanding uh, Attorney Perry is going to do the cross, correct? That's right. Go ahead. Anytime you're ready, Counsel. Thanks. Doctor, do you have any independent recollection of this autopsy? Uh, not specifically, no. You said you've done over 6,000 autopsies? Uh, yes. Testified over 11,000 times? Yes. Uh, there's, when you were testifying about this autopsy, you were reading it, right, the report? Uh, not here at the time. You mean, uh, explain for a second. Just earlier, just right now. You were, as you were describing what the autopsy findings were, you were reading it off the screen. Yes, I was. 
not, was any of that from, from memory? Uh, it was from some of the findings, but I can't say all of it is something I could recall. Do you recall uh, December 4th, 1998, doing this autopsy? Yes, I recall doing it just before I left um, Waukesha County. So I knew it was in December, but I wasn't sure it was December 4th. There's, um, it's probably obvious there's a real need for accuracy in your reports. Yes. Uh, testifying over 11,000 times, you would need to rely on those reports. As closely as we can, yes. I you need to rely on photos? Yes. And you have standards in terms of how you do reports? Yes. How you take photos? Yes, we do. And accuracy, I assume, is, is one of those standards? Yes, it is. Um, the standards for photography, uh, did you take any of those autopsy photos yourself? Not, no, I did not. At that time, it was uh, another county, and I let their particular uh, people do the photographs because they stay with that county. Oh. Uh, was it your equipment? Uh, no, it was uh, the sergeant who actually took the photographs. Was it your camera? Uh, no. Okay, and this is a film camera? I, I can't recall that part. Uh, okay. Do you recall when uh, you started using digital cameras, if ever? Um, not at that particular time. I, what I recall is using digital in Fresno County. That's the only time I remember using. Okay, so this is probably a film camera? Yes, it's and, a film camera. You don't even think it was your camera? I'm sure it wasn't my camera. That's why I said the sergeant had used it. The external pictures, the external uh, description of Julie Jensen, did you have any autopsy photos of her externally? Uh, I, I don't have the, all of the autopsy photographs here, so I can't tell you. Okay. Did you review your file in this case? As I reviewed the autopsy report. I did not have autopsy photographs at the time. Okay. If, if, do you recall ever seeing external autopsy photos? I don't recall seeing any whatsoever. Okay. Is it is it typically a standard that you would document with photos what your findings were as you did them? Yes, that's a standard that we try to keep. Yes. So I would say yes. When you were in Waukesha, uh, did you take your own pictures? Yes, we did. I did. Did you do that? Actually, so? actually, may I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Actually, we had our uh, investigators take photographs while I was doing the autopsies. So that individual would take it. Uh, one of our investigators would take it while I was doing the autopsy. The medical examiner investigator? Yes, that's correct, the medical examiner investigator. And that's somebody who worked for the medical examiner's office? They work directly with me. They help me do the autopsy. They'll take photographs. It's a combination investigator autopsy technician. I see. So whenever you were in Waukesha doing this job, you were working with the same person for an autopsy? There would be um, four or five uh, medical examiner investigator autopsy Text. They were combination job, and so uh, whatever whoever was assigned on a particular day when I was doing autopsies would come in and help me do the autopsies. Okay. Do you ever so they were all trained the same way. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, now your report indicates that uh, Sergeant Ratsburg of the Pleasant Prairie Police Department took photos in this case. That's correct. Had you ever worked with him before? No, this was the first time. And was he trained, to your knowledge, to take autopsy photos? Uh, I would say no. Okay. I'd say no in this particular case. Okay. I was. And your typical experience uh, with the medical examiner, photographer, investigator, I forget the exact term, uh, would they take external photos at an autopsy? Yes. And that's, again, to document all findings? That's correct. Okay, so this description of 
uh, what Julie Jensen's face looked like at the autopsy, you would expect to have a photo of her face at the autopsy? Yes, I would. Okay, and you, don't, you haven't seen that in this case? I have not seen photographs uh, from the autopsy. So you have to rely on your report? I'm relying strictly on my report. Did you use, um, was, was everything at this autopsy uh, Kenosha's equipment? Yes. Well, no, at the time when I was working in Waukesha, I had my own equipment that I brought down uh, to use. So I would use only the collection specimen containers. I uh, would use those. I uh, would use... Uh, different, uh, what's the word I want, disposable items that would be part of the uh, autopsy area, but I would bring my own separate uh, instruments that I would use. And you said you, I think you said you had an agreement with Kenosha County? There is an agreement since uh, uh, Kenosha and, and myself, we were individual uh, medical examiners that uh, work together to provide coverage if one of us would want to take a weekend or go on a vacation, so we cover for each other. Do you know who the medical examiner in Kenosha County was in 1998? Uh, uh, Maureen Lavin was uh, the person there. And do you know why you were called down this day to do this? She was gone for the weekend. This was on a weekend? Um, I'm assuming because I know I was covering for her uh, at that time, and I had a, thought it was the weekend. Okay. I think December 4th was a Friday. Does that sound? I, I have no way of knowing this, what day it is. It, I have no way of knowing if it's the time frame. But she was gone, and she needed coverage. How long did this autopsy take? Um, I can't tell you specifically how long it took. Okay, the report at this on page one. Do you have it? Do you have the report in front of you? Yes. The report indicates date of autopsy, twelve four ninety eight two twenty five p.m. Correct. That's correct. Is that when you would have started the autopsy? Yes. Okay, not when you would have completed it. No. How long did uh, do autopsies typically take? Uh, Depends on the case, but uh, a non-trauma type case uh, generally takes an hour and a half or so, up to two hours at the most. Okay, so on the outside, you would have been done with this by 4.30-ish? 4.30 or a little after 4.30, yes. Okay, on Friday, the uh, on December 4th? Yes. <clears throat> the report says that... Uh, Roger Johnson, who is the Chief Deputy Medical Examiner for Kenosha County, was, uh, was present. Yes. Chris Hernandez says pathology assistant. He would be my autopsy tech. Yes, Chris Hernandez. Okay. Chris Hernandez traveled with you? Yes, he travels with me to do autopsies. At, at that time, that's, uh, that was his function. Okay. Barbara Rossman. What was Barbara Rossman's function? Uh, she was a deputy medical examiner there in Kenosha County. Did she do autopsies? Uh, not, I'm not aware of how uh, Maureen Lavin did her uh, work with her investigators, so I can't answer that one. And then uh, Sergeant Ratsburg? Yes. Okay, anyone else? No, that's all that I recorded as being there at the autopsy. Okay. Is that pretty typical number of people in an autopsy? Uh, generally, yes. We have the law enforcement person there. We have the autopsy tech. Um, and we have someone from the uh, representative uh, coroner or medical examiner office. And when you would make a finding, would you say that out loud? Uh, it depends on the type of case it is. Sometimes I would, uh, if if it was a very complicated case, I'd have the uh, deputy medical examiner write something as I said it out loud. Or other times, I would take the diagram, stop for a minute, take the diagram, and write the notes myself. Okay. 
In, uh, in a case where you were um, not familiar with the crime scene, would you have been speaking with, uh, with those at the autopsy about what you were finding? Yes. I would tell uh, the uh, law enforcement individual what I'm finding is significant in the case. Okay. So each of these findings that you testified to on direct, um, you would have been discussing with, uh, with Mr. Ratzberg, for instance. I wouldn't necessarily say uh, I would discuss each characteristic because sometimes the findings aren't um, something I can explain clearly to the law enforcement person, such as petechiae are hard to explain if the individual has never been to an autopsy. So I may not explain petechiae to them because uh, that's something I document in my report and look for further information later. Okay. Well, you, you had him, uh, was it just luck that he took photos of the heart? Yes. I tell him to take significant photos. Uh, I would say take a picture of this because it's something medically I need to document. Okay, so if there was an injury you noted, you would have a you would you would direct a photo to be taken. Yes. <clears throat> you explained the role of a forensic pathologist, and that includes an investigative aspect to the case, correct? Yes, it should include an investigative aspect, yes. It includes um, considering toxicology reports? Yes. It includes witness statements? Yes. A scene description? Yes. Scene photos? Yes. At the time you did this autopsy, you weren't getting any of those, correct? I, I didn't have them at the time of the completion of the autopsy. That's why I signed the report as pending further information. So I didn't have them. You, at, at the time you did this report, you didn't consider any witness statements? I, I didn't have any witness statements at the time. So, yes, I'd have to agree with that. Yeah, you, you, there probably weren't any expert reports to consider? Not at that time. <clears throat> no toxicology was returned yet? None returned at that point. And no. when it was returned, it wasn't returned to you, correct? That's correct. It was, went to another doctor. I think it went to Dr. Labin. Okay. Uh, so in this case, although you did the autopsy, You weren't really acting as a forensic pathologist, correct? No, I was acting as a forensic pathologist to do the autopsy and the chain of custody to give the specimens. And once the specimens are given over to Dr. Lavin and her office, they completed the pending portion of the autopsy report. So we worked in conjunction. I guess what I meant by that is your role was done on December 4th? Yes, it was done at that particular point. And you never had any intention of uh, following through the investigative aspect of being a forensic pathologist in this case? Well, it, it became a, a case that Dr. Lavin wanted to take over. So I so, gave her the rest of the case. So that, that would be, that'd be yes then? Yes, at that particular point, yes. Okay. <clears throat> now you did, you were privy to some, um, I guess, outside information at the time of the autopsy. Can you explain that for me? I'm not sure what you're. Well, sure. Uh, you understand that, um, it was your understanding that Roger Johnson and uh, Detective Ratsburg were present at the crime scene, correct? Yes. Okay. And they would have told you what uh, what they had seen? 
Uh, I can't recall at this particular point what they mentioned to me. They, so I can't answer that question. Would it have been, um, would it be surprising to show up to a different county with people who are at the crime scene and have no discussion about any context? I would say uh, sometimes it's not surprising. Sometimes I don't get any information. Okay. Do you think that that happened in this case? Uh, I would say no. That you I'd say it. I got information from these individuals. I just don't know the specifics. You testified uh, about this case in January of 2008. That's correct. Yeah, and I think that's that's what um, Mr. Jamboys was referring to when he said something like nine years later, uh, you saw the toxicology reports and and other and, and other photos. Correct? Uh, yes. Uh, when I came in 2008, uh, I didn't know all the additional aspects of the case. And it was then that you saw, for the first time, those um, those photos. Yes. Okay. And it was it was at that uh, in 2008, first time that you saw the toxicology report. Yes, that's also correct. Findings that um, that Julie Jensen had ethylene glycol in her system. Yes. <clears throat> I want to be sure I understand. Um, what's a, uh, well, I guess I should say it this way, a, a post-mortem artifact, is that a finding that occurs as a result of something that happens after death? Yes. Could be an injury? Uh, I'm sorry? It, it could be uh, an injury? It, it would depend on what the particular finding is. It, it might appear to be an injury that you'd see when the person is alive, but actually occurs after they die. Um, I don't know what you're reading, so I, I'm not. It depends on the context of what what I'm looking at. I'm just is is that consistent with what a postmortem artifact is? Is that sometimes it is something that might appear to be an injury, but actually um, was something that occurred after the person had died? Yes, that's that would be an explanation. Yes. I said that a little clearer that time. Well, yeah, because yeah. there are certain things that we find uh, that are actually around the time of death that we call perimortem, perimortem injuries okay. instead of postmortem artifact. Some bruising can be postmortem. Some bruising can. You testified about petechiae on direct. Yes. And I think you said that petechiae are pinpoint-sized hemorrhages that you can see anywhere in the body. That's correct. And they, petechiae represent the rupture of small blood vessels, correct? That's correct. All right. It can be caused by uh, simple injuries. Explain that again. Go ahead. Petechiae I'm sorry. Be, I didn't understand your question. Oh, sure. Petechiae could be caused by simple injuries such as straining. Uh, they can be. It's just something that would break a blood vessel under the skin. Yes. They can be, yes. Medications can cause petechiae? Um, it would depend on what we're talking about. Uh, not florid petechiae like we're seeing in this case. A heart attack can cause petechiae? Yes, you can see petechiae in a heart attack. Due to pressure, the pressure passes up to a location it, it's sufficient enough to rupture smaller blood vessels, correct? Yes. That would cause petechiae? Yes, that causes petechiae. Not getting enough oxygen? Yes. Difficulty breathing? Um, explain difficulty breathing because it that depends upon the, the mechanism or the pattern in which they have difficulty breathing. Well, somebody was having... Um, I guess uh, 
for instance, if somebody had a lot of fluid in their lungs and they're having a tough time getting any oxygen, could that cause petechiae? Not generally, no. No. Um, you talked about uh, any type of asphyxia would cause petechiae. Yes. Okay. Um, just kind of respiratory distress, could that cause petechiae? Uh, it can. In some situations, you may be able to see some petechiae. It's not an uncommon finding at autopsies. Uh, it depends on the amount of petechiae that you see and the distribution of petechiae that you see. So when you say it's not uncommon, it depends upon the uh, pattern that you see and the distribution that you see. Sure. I imagine, I mean, if you saw a body completely covered in petechiae, that wouldn't be common. Uh, it's not common, but then you look towards an explanation of how you would get florid petechiae all over. Now, your report indicates that uh, externally there were very few findings, correct? That's correct. Um, there was a small bruise on the front of Julie Jensen's right shin or her right lower leg? Yes. That could be consistent with bumping into any number of things? Yes. Uh, the bruises that we saw on her uh, right buttock area? Yes. That could be consistent with bumping into any number of things? Yes. Bumping into a table? That's one way, yes. You noted a very superficial yellow brown type abrasion on the right side of the front of her neck? Yes. That could be, um, that could potentially even be post-mortem. It has the potential. It's hard to know what goes along with that. The color change is, is very difficult to link post-mortem. If someone touched her neck handling the body after her death, that might have caused it? No. Not with that color change. <clears throat> when you testified in 2008, you of course had your report, right? Yes, I did. That was nine years after the autopsy. Yes. Today is, I have to do math, but that's 20-some um, years after the autopsy. 20 years, that I can that's recall. That's quite a bit closer. Yes, um, 20, 22. 24 years. I'm going to direct uh, Council, your attention to page 31 of January 7th, 2008. Thank you, Council. Page 31? Page 31. Okay. Lines 4 through 18. Dr. Chambliss, you were asked, and so it could have been somebody moving her or that was tending to her at the scene, correct? And the answer was, I can't, I have no idea. Question, it could have been, right? Answer, I'm not going to say it could be or not. They may not handle her neck area, so I can't say one way or the other. Objection, Your Honor. I object. This is hearsay, and it's not inconsistent with his current testimony. Well, the part I'm about to read is. Oh, okay. Well, let's start then with that part. It would be helpful. Go ahead. I mean, Doctor, you just said that... Um, that this would be inconsistent with that, that I asked you if somebody touched her neck handling the body after her death, that could cause that kind of mark, and you said no, correct? Yes, that's what I said. Okay. Uh, question. I guess what I'm getting at is, is it could be somebody handling her after death? I'm not asking you to say that's, that was the situation. But if somebody, if somebody touched her neck who was handling the body after her death, that could cause that kind of mark. True? Answer. That may be a scenario that could possibly produce it. 
uh, what are we are we talking about the abrasion or the coloration change? About the mark on her neck. The mark is a fingernail mark, is what I'm describing. The coloration, no. Well, the coloration would just be however a mark is changing colors, correct? Yes, but that's over time. And what we're talking about generally on postmortem or injuries right around the time when someone's moved, they're quite often purple. Or the, tes the testimony purple. I just read to you, is that incorrect? That Can you repeat back what you just said? If somebody touched her neck who is handling the body after her death, that could cause that kind of mark. True? Answer, that may be a scenario that could possibly produce it. Yes, specifically, as I said, the fingernail abrasion could be something that could take place. That could happen after death? Yes. Okay. Autopsy on page three notes the injury that you testified to with the pictures of uh, Julie Jensen's ribs. It notes that there's a small amount of hemorrhage involving the soft tissues and muscles attached to the left, second, third, and fourth ribs anteriorly, correct? Yes. You were asked on direct uh, if it was consistent with that picture, correct? Uh, 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 the picture of her of laying across her arm. I'm sorry, the, the scenario, or I'm, I'm just a little bit confused about your question. Can you explain your question a little bit? Sure. You were asked about that injury in combination with the photo of how uh, Julie Jensen was laying in bed, correct? That's correct. Okay. And you said that could be one explanation. Yes. And you don't know, um, you of course weren't at the, at the scene. That's correct. Okay. And you don't know if that's actually how Julie Jensen was found? Uh, I don't know. Okay. And you don't know if when she was found she was moved? I don't know that either. Okay. And you don't know if that's how she just normally slept? Um, no, I don't know that either. Um, that's an injury that could be post-mortem artifact. No. Which, which injury is counsel talking about? About the hemorrhage to the ribs. Oh. No. You can rule out that it's, that it's not post-mortem artifact? Yes. And how can you do that? Uh, it's, I've done enough autopsies to know uh, post-mortem artifact from an actual injury, and that's an actual injury. At the same hearing that I just asked you about on January 7th, 2008, and Council, I'm going to uh, direct your attention to page 37. Um, okay, I'm going to have to give me a minute. I got to open that back up. Then. Lines nine through 22. Page 27. 37. <coughs> 37. This is page 32. <coughs> Question. Under internal examination at page three of your report, about halfway down that page, it says, upon reflecting the skin and underlying soft tissues, 
Excuse there's a small me. amount of hemorrhage involving the soft tissues. Excuse me, counsel. I can't find which, which page are you on? Page? Page 37, January 7th, 2008. Oh, January, we got the wrong date up there. January 7th. Okay, page 37. Council, is it page 37? Yes. I'm sorry for the delay. I'm using two different screens here. Some what line? I started reading at line nine. Page thirty seven, line nine. Let's see. Okay. okay. Thank you, Council, for giving me time to get to that point. I appreciate it. Quite all right. Uh, I'll start again. Question Under internal examination at page three of your report, about halfway down that page, it says, upon reflecting the skin and underlying soft tissues, there's a small amount of hemorrhage involving the soft tissues and muscles attached to the second, the left second, third, and fourth ribs anteriorly. Answer, that's hemorrhage, not petechiae. That's hemorrhage. Right. Oh, oh, okay. oh, now, oh I'm, I'm sorry. Wanna, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll no, listen. I'll listen. I'm sorry. Yep, and that was your answer in uh, 2008, too, correcting yes. it, that that that's was correct. hemorrhage. Yes. Okay, now, uh, same page, counsel, pay, uh, line 21. Actually, uh, line 18. Um, I'll just change that for the fourth time. Line 16. Okay, my mistake. And those would be consistent with postmortem artifacts. Answer. I can't say that's postmortem artifact. Question. Can you rule that out? Answer. I can't say because I didn't examine the muscle microscopically. You need to do that. Question, right, so you can't rule out that this is just postmortem artifact, right? Because you didn't do all the work. Answer, that's, I agree with that, yes. I was agreeing with the fact of doing microscopic on it. That's essentially what I was saying, yes. Okay, okay thank you. Yes. You don't know when that hemorrhage happened. The time frame, I don't. That's something. Well, when you were shown the photo of uh, Miss Jensen in her bed, you said that could be one explanation, correct? And that's what I said, yes. Another explanation could have been from bumping into a doorway? Um, depends on how it takes place, but I can say yes, depends on the circumstances. You said this was not a situation of positional asphyxia. You said you could say it is not because the hemorrhage on the rib cage would need to be explained. In most cases of positional asphyxia, uh, that you even see hemorrhage, uh, those that I've had in adults have been motor vehicle accidents. And that can be explained uh, inside of a vehicle. Uh, what you look at is the scenario here, and the scenario uh, on a mattress doesn't explain how you would get this hemorrhage on the front. Sure. And, and from this injury, you can't say when the injury even occurred? Uh, no, because I didn't look at it microscopically. And as you testified in 2008, you can't even rule out postmortem artifact? I would say it's not postmortem artifact. It, but I can't tell you the age of this injury. There's a difference. Did you ever examine after 2008 the muscle microscopically? No, I did not. Okay. And was the Dr. Chambliss then um, incorrect? I, I, what I said is I can't 
give a specific timing, actually, unless I did it microscopically. I believe that's how I answered that. No, the, the answer to that was um, whether you could rule, you can't rule out that this is just postmortem artifact because you would need to examine the muscle microscopically, and you didn't do that work. Well, that's a different answer for me now. It, I think that it's it's an injury. The petechiae around the uh, cardio area. Yes. You testified to on direct, and it's it's yes. listed in the report. Um, you called them on direct. You called them asphyxial findings, correct? Yes. And then you explained that it was consistent but not diagnostic of asphyxia. That's correct. Okay. And that's because the lack of oxygen makes those blood vessels more fragile and they can rupture. That's how it happens, yes. Do you agree that that's a common finding in autopsies? No, it's not a common finding. Is it an uncommon finding? It's an uncommon finding. And I talked about the different ways that petechiae could be caused. Yes. Including a heart attack. Yes, as I mentioned, the pattern and distribution of petechiae is important, which is not seen like this in a heart attack. Stress to the uh, respiratory area. That wouldn't produce this distribution of petechiae. On direct, you testified about all the things that you um, gathered and uh, sent off for testing. Uh, I gathered them for uh, Dr. Lavin. She sent them off for testing. Okay. And that's listed on page five of your autopsy report? Uh, that would not be, let's see. I'm sorry, just one second. Just look. At the bottom. Yes. The materials that I saved for toxicology were turned over to Dr. Lavin. Yes, I agree. Yep. Okay. And what you noted in your report is that you saved uh, blood from the heart. Can I, can I say one thing at this point? Can I interrupt? Uh, what's missing from that is gastric contents. Gastric contents is not is not uh, mentioned in this report, is it? It's not mentioned in the materials saved for toxicology. On direct, you testified that you obtained the gastric contents and you preserved them, uh, correct? I don't know if I said that on direct. I can't. I know it's taken and examined, but I don't know if that's what I said on direct. Uh, Mr. Jamboys asked you if you had collected the gastric contents and that it was to your very high, you know, to your standards of uh, your medical standards. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, you don't remember doing that, though, do you? Not independently, no. Yeah, and it's not in your report? It's not recorded in my report, no. And these reports, as you explained, are essential to be complete and accurate? Uh, yes, but there are times where we don't have everything written in our reports. Okay. Do you have any, you don't have any, in, and it's important for chain of custody purposes, right? That's correct. Yeah, to note how things were collected? Uh, yes. Yeah, where they were sent? Uh, not necessarily where they're sent. Uh, if I do the entire case, yes. In this case, I'd say no. The only reason you think gastric contents were collected in this case is because you've later seen a report about the gastric contents. That's a fair statement, yes. Okay. If you testified on direct that, um, that you did that, that you collected it, and it was to your um, medical standards, uh, that's a guess, correct? No, it's not a guess. It's uh, something that's shown up as a report once I've given the items over to Dr. Lavin. So it's documented by Dr. Lavin. So it's it's not essential that you 
put all these things in a report? I didn't say it wasn't essential. I said sometimes I make a mistake in a report. Okay, and that's that's a mistake in the report. There is a mistake in my report. Okay. Um, your report also doesn't indicate collecting any vitreous humor fluid, does it? Uh, no. Yeah. Are you aware that um, vitreous humor fluid was indeed collected and tested? Uh, vitreous humor may be collected either at the time I do the autopsy or at another time. So um, at the time it's collected depends on whether I did it or someone else did it. When would the other time have been that um, samples were taken from Julie Jensen's body? Um, I can't tell you in their uh, situations here, here in Kenosha County, so I can't tell you. But you can take uh, vitreous before or after an autopsy. The report indicates that there are at least 660 milliliters of gastric contents. Yes. Okay. And at least, I think, is the word, correct? Yes. Okay. Would that be because that's closest to the mark of 660? The containers that we use to collect um, gastric contents aren't specific to smaller gradations. So you try to, uh, you give what is the mark that you see on the container above that. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to do some basic conversions. A liter is 33.8 fluid ounces, correct? Yes. One liter has 1,000 milliliters. Yes. So 1,000 milliliters is 33 fluid ounces, correct? Uh, yes. A liter is 33.8 yes. fluid ounces, 1,000 milliliters to a liter. Yes. Okay. Um, 660 milliliters is 21.78 ounces. Uh, if you say so, I'll, I'll just go, go right. along with the your calculation. The state will stipulate that 660 milliliters is approximately 22 ounces. Thank you, Mr. Jim. But <laughs> there are about 22 ounces of stuff in her stomach. Uh, yes. you agree that that's a substantial amount? Uh, that's the amount is... Uh, Substantial in her stomach, yes. And the report indicates that you could identify food fragments in her stomach. Yes. I think it, in fa it, it uh, specifically notes um, potato and pepper. And that's correct. You're unable to tell from this when the last time Julie Jensen would have eaten prior to death. That's correct. I can't tell. Unable to tell how long those 22 ounces might have been sitting in her stomach. That's also correct. A stomach not emptying properly for any number of reasons can be called gastroparesis, correct? That is uh, the, what the word means, yes. It could be that particular situation. Okay. Properly functioning kidneys one of the purposes is that they eliminate nitrogen wastes from somebody's system, correct? That's one of the functions, yes. And if that doesn't happen, then something called uremia can develop? Yes. You've seen that? Yes. And that's the buildup of nitrogen wastes in the body? Yes. That's something that can cause gastroparesis? Um, I don't know if that causes gastroparesis. I'll just put it that way. I'm not a clinician to know that. Okay. Are you familiar with that? Uh, do you know that renal dysfunction would affect somebody's electrolyte levels? Yes. The acid base uh, levels in, in her system? Yes. Okay. An electrolyte acid base, something affecting her electrolyte status can also affect GI motility, correct? And that's correct. Okay. And that's GI motility is another, another way of saying, um, well, it could affect, it could cause gastroparesis. Yes.
It depends also on what is in those gastric contents. Yes, that's also important. Because yeah, what's in the gastric contents can slow down metabolism or the breakdown of tissues, correct? That's correct. And you didn't have, you don't have a, or have you seen, I'll just ask it this way, have you seen a report identifying everything that was in those gastric contents? Um, explain what you mean, everything that's in the gastric contents. Well, you visually identified potato and pepper. Yes. I didn't see anything uh, that I would venture to clearly point out in the gastric contents, so I guess you're correct. I didn't see a report of that. And you have seen a report that said that there was um, – uh, some amount of ethylene glycol. Yes. Um, and I'm asking if uh, if you're able to, from the reports you've seen, account for all 22 ounces of what's in her stomach. No. Okay. And you would need to know that in order to opine whether or not her metabolism was slowed down by the contents of her stomach. Uh, yes. Because if there's a toxin, it would depend on the toxin. It depends on the toxin and also depends on how the toxin binds to the material in the stomach. There are multiple particular ways that the toxin binds. Some things get absorbed through the um, intestinal lining, correct? Well, in the stomach, it can be in the liquid. It can be in the mucus. It can bind to the hydrochloride. It can bind the protein. So you can have four different ways that it could be, at least. Could you say that again? I'm, I didn't really understand. It can bind? The drug, when it goes into your stomach, mm -hmm. it's taken up in different ways as it's in your stomach. And that's why you can't inject gastric contents right into a uh, a, spec a gas chromatography, you got to extract the drug. So the way something might get absorbed in a body from the gastric contents would depend on really what those gastric contents were. It depends on the gastric contents and the type of drug that it is, if it's the type that can be absorbed readily or uh, is not absorbed readily. And, of course, it would depend on what's happening with GI motility in general. That's true. And something would, of course, have to come in contact with a stomach lining to be absorbed that way. Yes. Yes. You're familiar with the phases of ethylene glycol poisoning? No, I'm not. Not at all? Not at all. Were you at one time? Uh, no, I'm not. I wasn't at one time either. Wouldn't be able to testify at all about... Um... No, I would not. Okay, so... Not about ethylene glycol. I'm not uh, an expert or even... Um, very comfortable going through the different pharmacokinetics of ethylene glycol. So if you testified in, in 2008 about the phases of ethylene glycol, do you wish you hadn't? I wish I hadn't. You noted that her urinary bladder was distended with 150, feet, 150 cc's of urine. Yes. Are you able to tell from that when the last time it was that uh, Julie Jensen urinated? 
No, I cannot tell. Do you have any idea of when the last time she would have urinated? No, I could not tell. No. Could it have been more than a day? Uh, there's no way for me to know when she last urinated, so I can't speculate on it. You are aware, you testified that there were oxalic acid crystals in the kidneys, correct? Yes. And that in her kidneys would affect her kidney functions? That's correct. One of the things that can happen with oxalic acid crystals in the kidney is that you can go into acute renal failure. That's correct. You didn't receive any information about urine in the bed? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Did you receive any information in this case about there being urine in the bed? No, I did not. Any on her clothes? Uh, no, not when I saw them, but I didn't receive any information about it. Either. Weren't on the clothes that you saw? No. And no one told you anything otherwise? No one told me anything otherwise. Do you remember sending uh, or directing Detective Ratsburg to go and collect or look for fluids at the scene? I don't recall any of that. That's too long ago. I just don't recall. Okay. So if that happened or didn't happen, you're just not aware of it? I just can't say. I mean, it's 20 years ago. I really can't say. I In terms of um, Julie Jensen's functions on the day that she died and what she was able to do, are you able to say at all? Uh, not clearly. I'd be speculating. Because so it no involves man. ethylene glycol poisoning? Uh, it's not only ethylene glycol. She also has multiple other drugs in her system, so it's hard to say. Okay. You don't know if she could get up and walk around? I have no way of knowing. And like you just said, you don't know if she could urinate? That's also true. We know she had food in her stomach? I know she has food in her stomach. You have no idea when that food got in her stomach? Don't know. And is, just so I'm clear, one of the reasons you can't say is because of kind of your limited knowledge about the effects ethylene glycol has on a human body? It, it's ethylene glycol primarily, but we also have other drugs in our system. So it's, it's a drug environment which is difficult to predict function. I would just put it that way in a general way. And after this case, you did no additional research? No, I did not. Have you done any other reports in this case? No, I have not. So in 1998, your autopsy concluded with, it says, cause of death, colon, and it says, pending further studies. Yes, that's a preliminary type autopsy report when you put pending there, yes. And then in 2008, while testifying, you were given basically the same hypothetical that Mr. Jamboys just gave you today, correct? Um, I can't remember specifically what you're describing there. Um, can you explain for me? Sure. You were given the hypothetical about if Mr. Jensen had uh, confessed and then the description of, um, of asphyxiation. Do you remember that? Yes, I recall that, that part about asphyxiation, yes. Okay. And based on that, you um, opined as to cause and manner of death, correct? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, Credibility of witnesses matters to a forensic pathologist, doesn't it? Yes. You don't know anything about the source of that information, do you? Um, explain what you mean. I, I 
I don't know what your question is referring to. You don't know anything about the credibility of, of whatever witness would have, have claimed uh, that Mark Jensen made that confession? No, I don't. And if you learned that that person was completely incredible, uh, you wouldn't be able to rely on that statement, would you? I, I rely upon the, um, I guess, the uh, investigators in the case and what they feel, how strongly they feel about the case, um, because I don't do that investigation. So, so I'd you, have to rely upon what they are and what their relationship has been with me as the investigator forensic pathologist. That's the best way I can describe it. So do you rely on the credibility of, of witnesses? Again, that goes back to the investigator. I don't personally do the investigation. So it's not me determining whether they're credible or not. I, see. I have so, to rely upon them. So whatever the investigator tells you the scenario is, that's credible? No, I, what I'm saying is I have to, when I'm discussing the case with them, feel that my autopsy findings are consistent with what the story is that they're telling me. I want to be clear I understand your testimony. If you assume that the person providing the information about Mark Jensen is a liar, does that affect your determination of cause of death? No, I'll, as I answered before, it goes to the investigator who presents the information to me and what that material he presents in association with my autopsy findings. I can't go back and determine credibility of their witnesses. That's up to the law enforcement person. Um, I can only do the autopsy findings. I'm sorry. I'm going to, uh, counsel, I'm going to direct your attention. I'm going to, um, I'm looking at, again, January 7th, 2008. Yes, counsel, which page are you looking at? Page uh, 74. <clears throat> Seventy-three to seventy-four. The bottom of seventy-three. Starting at line twenty-five on page seventy-three. Okay, I'm almost there, counsel. <clears throat> page seventy-three, line. Which line? Twenty-five. <clears throat> yes, okay, line 25. Yeah, you were asked, doctor, now if in that hypothetical you assume that the person providing the information about Mark Jensen is a liar, then do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Answer, yes. Question, and what is that? Answer, it's undetermined. Yes, at that particular point. You agree with that? It depends on what the whole context of what you just read in that little bit. It's hard for me to know what the whole context is. Sure. The person who reported that Mark Jensen confessed, if that person is a liar, then do you have a cause of death? Just the way you described that, nothing about the investigator, nothing about anything else, it would have to be undetermined because I don't have any additional findings to go along with the investigation. Do 
Do you recall meeting with uh, Detective Ratsburg and Dr. Lavin in March of 2000, uh, 1999? Um, I remember meeting with them. I don't know the particular date, though. Okay, that's fine. So you did the uh, autopsy on December 4th, 1998? Yes. Okay. And then some, maybe a few months after that, you remember meeting with them? I can't tell you, I, but I just remembered I met with them. You remember a subsequent meeting that yes. included Detective Ratsburg and Maureen Lavin? Yes. Do you have notes about what that meeting was? I'm sorry? Do you have notes or memory about what you discussed? No, I don't. Can you tell from your autopsy report what date you completed it? Uh, no. Would this report have been sent that same day? This report that I have produced, not the same day, no. Okay. How long would it have taken you to do? It uh, depends on my caseload uh, in conjunction with their caseload. Uh, it may have taken me months and months considering it's, it's not my particular jurisdiction. If there's information in the record that suggested it was faxed on February 4th, 1999, would that be consistent? I can't tell you that. There's no way for me to know. I need just a moment. Go ahead. I do have one more question, Doctor. Uh, when you were looking at the um, scene photo of Julie Jensen lying on her bed, and maybe I've already asked this and just forgot it, uh, you testified that um, that she was on a soft mattress. Yes. Uh, where did you get on a soft material, which is a mattress. Just on a mattress. On a mattress. further questions seeing the time of the day it is um, I've got about a three-minute redirect your honor maybe five minute, a five-minute redirect I'll be done by 5 p.m. how's that and then what about recross I don't know that'll take very long I, it's I it's going to be a very very brief redirect I'll give you five questions okay <laughs> that's generous of you your honor um, that one <clears throat> So why isn't it coming up on the screen? I've got this plugged in here. Are the TVs on? Are the TVs turned on? They are. Yes. Oh wait, it's gonna. There we go. Okay, good enough. Uh, can you see in the upper right-hand corner here? I'm gonna blow this up here a little bit. Uh, it says two twenty three ninety nine and two four ninety nine. Um, so certainly, this report was available as of February fourth, nineteen ninety nine, or February twenty third, nineteen ninety nine. One of those two dates. Doesn't that reflect that to you, sir? Yes. Okay. Now, um, Directing your attention to this, we're going to first of all look at the picture of Julie Jensen in this bed. Now, it's true you weren't at the crime scene, correct? That's correct. And um, 
I know that by virtue of being a forensic pathologist, you're not necessarily an expert on mattresses, but looking at the way Julie Jensen's arm is positioned and the way that the mattress is going in there, that would look like a relatively soft top mattress, wouldn't you say? Again, it's it's a mattress. It, it, I can't tell you soft, hard, whatever. It's but you can see from here down to here, it's going down with the arm, correct? So there's an impression in the mattress caused by Julie's body at that point? Um, I wasn't there. It's hard to, I can't answer that one. Now, directing your attention to this injury here and here and here, and then looking at the way the arm is going from the, from the shoulder down across the body in this fashion, so the shoulder here is bent over. Would the, does it appear that this injury and this injury and this injury would line up with that arm? Is that a pro, is that a reasonable explanation? Asked and answered. Is that a reasonable explanation for the injuries to to is there the an objection? Yeah, uh, asked and answered. On, this is covered on direct. Yes, and he that went exact, into it on, exact on exact cross. Thing. See, that's the problem when we start recrossing, redirecting. You got into it, so now he wants to clarify it. I think he has a right to do that. So, Doctor, can you answer the question? Would you? Okay, then I'm going to restate the question instead of having the reporter write it. Assuming that the, I'm going to ask you this, Doctor, assuming the shoulder was bent in a little bit, as it appears to be here, and then the arm was spread across here, would you indicate, does it appear to you as though the, that the arm lining up with the rib cage would be a reasonable explanation for these injuries? to the rib cage at this location? It is a reasonable explanation. And so quite aside from who's telling you about it, if, there, if you had heard that it was told to somebody that Mark Jensen confessed that he sat on Julie's back and shoved her face into the pillow until she stopped breathing, are these injuries consistent or inconsistent with that description? Uh, they're consistent, as I mentioned before. Now, based on the crime scene photos and based on the injuries to the rib cage and based on the, um, the injuries to the, to the heart, the, the petechiae about the heart and the lung, and based upon the, the toxicology reports that you've since received, do you now have an opinion, Doctor, as to the cause and manner of Julie Jensen's death? Yes, it's an asphyxial death. It's an asphyxia death, and was ethylene glycol a contributing factor? Yes. And what is the manner of death? It's a homicide. Nothing further. Pete Cross. Doctor, you have no idea when Julie Jensen was, sorry, you have no idea when Julie Jensen was uh, put in that position. Yes, I think I answered that as well, yes. You agree that, that yes. you don't have any idea? Yes. And that she may have been moved after uh, first responders got there? Uh, yes. Were there any bruises on Julie Jensen's back? No. Any marks consistent with being sat on her back? Um, that's not uncommon to see nothing uh, when someone's pressure, so there's no marks there at all. Uh, bruising on her arms in terms of uh, being rotated around and pushed down? There's no bruising on her arms that by that manner. That hypothetical that Mr. Jamboys gave you, gave you it, it, um, it assumes that that is precisely how Julie Jensen's body was um, at the time of her death, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Okay. And you have no idea how long she was in that position? No, I do not. That's all. Thank you. All right, folks, 8.30 tomorrow. One more thing before you leave so you can make your plans. We are not working on Monday. It's a federal state holiday, Martin Luther King Day. So you can keep that in mind when you come back tomorrow. Thank you for your work today, 8.30. Have a good evening.
Okay. I'm not planning on going into the 2016 case. Okay. Yeah. But we're good. We're good.